side 1, RC 54340. Time, Manifold Trilogy, Volume 1, by Stephen Baxter. Copyright 2000, by Stephen Baxter. Read by Gary Tipton. This book contains 440 pages on 13 sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player and fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the beginning of the book. Library of Congress Annotation 2010 Reed Malenfant sets up the Bootstrap Corporation to lure humans into space with the promise of limitless natural resources. Sheena 5, a genetically engineered smart squid, pilots the unmanned first mission. Malenfant plows ahead despite NASA's attempt to shut him down. Followed by Space, RC 54341. Strong Language, 2000. From the Book Jacket. Hailed by Arthur C. Clarke as a major new talent, Stephen Baxter is one of the most gifted writers to appear in the last decade. His stunning novels combine state-of-the-art scientific speculation with non-stop adventure on a cosmic scale, continuing the grand tradition of science fiction pioneered by such giants as Isaac Asimov and Robert E. Heinlein. Now the multi-award-winning author gives us his most ambitious and accomplished novel yet. Audaciously conceived, brilliantly executed, it is nothing less than a masterpiece an unforgettable race through and against time itself, with the fate of the universe and all mankind hanging in the balance. The year is 2010. More than a century of ecological damage, industrial and technological expansion, and unchecked population growth has left the earth on the brink of devastation. But as the world's governments turn inward, one man dares to gamble on a bolder, brighter future. That man, Reed Malenfant, has a very different solution to the problems plaguing the planet, the exploration and colonization of space. Battling national sabotage and international outcry, Malenfant's bootstrap company builds a spacecraft, plots its course, and trains the genetically enhanced Sheena 5 for her one-way journey. As apocalyptic riots sweep the globe, Malenfant launches the rocket. But Sheena has plans of her own. And even as she sets them in motion, the situation on Earth grows more desperate and violent. Now Malenfant, together with a brilliant but disturbed mathematician, a child prodigy, and his ex-wife, must gamble the very existence of time and space on a single desperate throw of the dice. The odds are a trillion to one against him. Or are they? About the author... Stephen Baxter is a trained engineer with degrees from Cambridge, Mathematics, and Southampton Universities, doctorate in aero-engineering research. He has worked with Rolls-Royce Limited and at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, UK. In his research, Baxter visited NASA launch centers, viewed a shuttle launch, and interviewed both a NASA mission controller and an astronaut. He also conducted extensive research into the history of NASA, scientific studies of Mars and astronauts and other key players. As an acclaimed author, Stephen Baxter is the winner of both the British Science Fiction Award and the Locus Awards, as well as being a nominee for an Arthur C. Clarke Award and a Hugo Award. His novel, Voyage, won the Sidewise Award for Best Alternate History Novel of the Year. He also won the John W. Campbell Award and the Philip K. Dick Award for his novel, The Time Ships. To Two Space Cadets My Nephew, James Baxter, Kent Justin, NASA Reed Malenfant You know me, and you know I'm a space cadet. You know I've campaigned for, among other things, private mining expeditions to the asteroids. In fact, in the past I've tried to get you to pay for such things. I've bored you with that often enough already, right? So tonight, I want to look a little farther out. Tonight, I want to tell you why I care so much about this issue that I devoted my life to it. The world isn't big enough anymore. You don't need me to stand here and tell you that. We could all choke to death, be extinct in a hundred years. Or we could be on our way to populating the galaxy. Yes, the galaxy. Want me to tell you how? 
Turns out it's all a question of economics. Let's say we set out to the stars. We might use ion rockets, solar sails, gravity assists. It doesn't matter. We'll probably start, as we have in the solar system, with automated probes. Humans may follow. One percent of the helium-3 fusion fuel available from the planet Uranus, for example, would be enough to send a giant interstellar arc, each arc containing a billion people, to every star in the galaxy. But it may be cheaper for the probes to manufacture humans in situ using cell synthesis and artificial womb technology. The first wave will be slow, or faster than we can afford. It doesn't matter, not in the long term. When the probe reaches a new system, it phones home and starts to build. Here is the heart of the strategy. A target system, we assume, is uninhabited. We can therefore anticipate massive exploitation of the system's resources without restraint by the probe. Such resources are useless for any other purpose and are therefore economically free to us. I thought you'd enjoy that line. There's nothing an entrepreneur likes more than the sound of the word free. More probes will be built and launched from each of the first wave of target stars. The probes will reach new targets, and again, more probes will be spawned and fired onward. The volume covered by the probes will grow rapidly, like the expansion of gas into a vacuum. Our ships will spread along the spiral arm, along lanes rich with stars, farming the galaxy for humankind. Once started, the process will be self-directing, self-financing. It would take, the double domes think, ten to a hundred million years for the colonization of the galaxy to be completed in this manner. But we must invest merely in the cost of the initial generation of probes. Thus the cost of colonizing the galaxy will be less in real terms than that of our Apollo program of fifty years ago. This vision isn't mine alone. It isn't original. The rocket pioneer Robert Goddard wrote an essay in 1918, 92 years ago, called The Ultimate Migration, in which he imagined space arcs built from asteroid materials carrying our far future descendants away from the death of the sun. The engineering detail has changed. The essence of the vision hasn't. We can do this. If we succeed, we will live forever. The alternative is extinction. And people, when we're gone, we're gone. As far as we can see, we're alone in an indifferent universe. We see no sign of intelligence anywhere away from Earth. We may be the first, perhaps we're the last. It took so long for the solar system to evolve intelligence, it seems unlikely there will be others ever. If we fail, then the failure is for all time. If we die, mind and consciousness and soul die with us. Hope and dreams and love, everything that makes us human. There will be nobody even to mourn us. To be the first is an awesome responsibility. It's a responsibility we must grasp. I am offering you a practical route to an infinite future for humankind. A future of unlimited potential. Someday, you know it, I'll come back to you again for money. Seed corn money, that's all so we can take a first step, self-financing even in the medium term, beyond the bounds of earth. But I want you to see why I'll be doing that, why I must. We can do this. We will do this. We're on our own. It's up to us. This is just the beginning. Join me. Thank you. Michael This is what I have learned, Valenfant. This is how it is, how it was, how it came to be. In the afterglow of the Big Bang, humans spread in waves across the universe, sprawling and brawling and breeding and dying and evolving. There were wars, there was love, there was life and death. Minds flowed together in great rivers of consciousness, or shattered in sparkling droplets. There was immortality to be had of a sort, a continuity of identity through replication and confluence across billions upon billions of years. Everywhere they found life. Nowhere did they find mind. Save what they brought with them or created, no other against which human advancement could be tested. With time, the stars died like candles. 
but humans fed on bloated gravitational fat and achieved a power undreamed of in earlier ages. They learned of other universes from which theirs had evolved. Those earlier, simpler realities, too, were empty of mind, a branching tree of emptiness reaching deep into the hyperpast. It is impossible to understand what minds of that age, the peak of humankind, a species hundreds of billions of times older than humankind, were like. They did not seek to acquire, not to breed, not even to learn. They had nothing in common with us, their ancestors of the afterglow. Nothing but the will to survive, and even that was to be denied them by time. The universe aged, indifferent, harsh, hostile, and ultimately lethal. There was despair and loneliness. There was an age of war, an obliteration of trillion-year memories, a bonfire of identity. There was an age of suicide, as the finest of humanity chose self-destruction against further purposeless time and struggle. The great rivers of mind guttered and dried, but some persisted. Just a tributary, the stubborn, still unwilling to yield to the darkness to accept the increasing confines of a universe growing inexorably old. And at last, they realized that this was wrong. It wasn't supposed to have been like this. Burning the last of the universe's resources, the final downstreamers, dogged, all but insane, reached to the deepest past. And, oh... Watch the moon, Malenfant. Watch the moon. It's starting. Part One Bootstrap What seest thou else in the dark backward and abysm of time? William Shakespeare Emma Stoney Of course Emma had known that Reed Malenfant, the old astronaut, her ex-husband, her current boss had been buying up space shuttle rocket engines and static firing them in the California desert. She thought it was all part of an elaborate waste disposal plan. She hadn't known he was planning to use the rockets to reach the asteroids. Not until Cornelius Tain told her about it. About that, and a lot more besides. Miss Tony. The voice was soft, dry, and it startled her. Emma straightened up from her soft screen. There was a man standing before her, here in the pastel light of her Las Vegas office. A thin Caucasian, 1980s pinstripe suit, neatly cropped hair. I surprised you. I'm sorry. My name's Cornelius, he said. Cornelius Tane. Neutral accent. Boston? He looked about forty. She saw no sign of cosmetic enhancement. High cheekbones, stress muscles around his eyes. How the hell had he gotten in here? She reached for the security touchpad under her desk. I didn't notice you come in. He smiled. He seemed calm, rational, businesslike. She lifted her finger off the button. He stretched out his hand, and she shook it. His palm was dry and soft, as if even his perspiration was under control. But she didn't enjoy the touch. Like handling a lizard, she thought. She let go of the hand quickly. She said... Have we met before? No, but I know of you. Your picture is in the company reports. Not to mention the gossip sides from time to time. Your complicated personal history with Reed Malenfant. He was making her uncomfortable. Malenfant is kind of high profile, she conceded. You call him Malenfant, he nodded, as if storing away the fact. You're with the corporation, Mr. Tane? Actually, it's Doctor... But please call me Cornelius. Medical doctor? The other sort. He waved a hand. Academic. Mathematics, actually. A long time ago. Yes, in a manner of speaking, I am with Bootstrap. I represent one of your major shareholder groups. That's what got me past your very conscientious secretary in the outer office. Shareholders? Which group? We work through a number of dummies. He looked at her desk. No doubt when you get back to your soft screen, you'll soon be able to determine which and the extent of our holdings. Ultimately, I work for Eschatology Incorporated. Oh, shit. 
Eschatology, as far as she knew, was one of those UFO-hunting nut groups that were attracted to Malenfant's enterprises like flies. He watched her, apparently knowing what she was thinking. Why are you here, Dr. Tane? Cornelius, please. Naturally, we wish to check on how your husband is using our money. Ex-husband. You can do that through the company reports or the press. He leaned forward. But I don't recall any news releases about this waste reduction enterprise in the Mojave. You're talking about the rocket plant. It's a new project, she said vaguely. Speculative. He smiled. Your loyalty is admirable, but you've no need to defend Malenfant, Miss Stoney. I'm not here to criticize or obstruct. Divert, perhaps. Divert what? The trajectory of Reed Malenfant's covert activities. I'm talking about his true purpose, beneath all the misdirection. True purpose? Come now, you don't think anyone believes an entrepreneur with Malenfant's track record is reconditioning man-rated rocket engines just to burn industrial waste, do you? He studied her. Or perhaps you truly don't know the truth. How remarkable. In that case, we both have much to learn. He smiled easily. We believe Malenfant's motives are sound. That's why we invest in him, although his objectives are too narrow. I saw his speech in Delaware the other night. Impressive stuff. Colonizing the galaxy. Immortality for humankind. Of course he hasn't thought it through. Would you believe me if I said I don't know what the hell you're talking about? Oh, yes. He eyed her. His eyes were a pale blue, the color of the skies of her California childhood, long gone. Yes, now that I've met you, I believe you. Perhaps we understand your ex-husband better than you do. And what is it you understand about him? That he's the only man who can save the human race from the coming catastrophe? He said it without inflection. She had absolutely no idea how to reply. The moment stretched. Once more she wondered if this man was dangerous. On impulse, she decided to cancel the rest of her day and drive out to Malenfant's desert operation. Maybe, all things considered, it was time to see it for herself, and she invited Cornelius along for the ride. She called ahead to let Malenfant know she was on the way, but working on the principle that she should never miss a chance to make Malenfant's life more difficult, she didn't warn him about Cornelius Tane. Out of Vegas, she took the I-15, the main route, to L.A., 300 miles away. Out of town, she was able to cut in the smart drive. The car's limiter, controlled by the invisible web of satellites far above, switched out as the automatic control took over, and her speed rose smoothly through 150 miles per hour. As the sun climbed, the air grew hotter. She rolled up her window, felt the air conditioning cool and moisten the air. Without warning, Cornelia said, as if resuming an interrupted conversation, Yes, the Delaware speech was interesting, but something of a throwback for Malenfant. He is usually much more discreet about his true ambitions. When Malenfant had first started making money as a small-scale aerospace consultant, he had spread himself over the media, arguing for an expansion of American effort in space. A new generation of heavy launchers, new manned vehicles, a return to the moon. He talked about the riches waiting in space, escape from Malthusian limits to growth, the ability to save the species from such calamities as an asteroid collision with the Earth, and so forth. The usual space buff propaganda. The image Malenfant built of himself was clear, Cornelius said. Here was a man who was rich and was destined to get richer, and who was clearly prepared to throw some of his money at the old dreams of space. But then his businesses started to struggle. Isn't that true? It was true. Investors had grown wary of this talk show visionary. Space was important for business, but business only cared about the constellations of utilitarian satellites in low Earth orbit for communications and weather and surveillance thus far and no farther and Malenfant attracted no support from serious agencies, particularly from NASA. 
NASA had long grown wary of frightening away its political backers by thinking too big and was focused on doing sexy science with small, cheap, unmanned probes while sustaining the careers and empires associated with the giant bureaucracy that ran the manned space program with its aging shuttle fleet and a half-built and much-delayed space station. In fact, Malenfant himself started to attract unwelcome personal attention. There were barroom psychoanalysts all over the media who found a common pattern in his failure to have kids, his frustrated ambition to fly in space, and his lofty ambitions for the future of humankind. And then there were the kooks, the conspiracy theorists, the UFO nuts, the post-New Age synthesists, the dreaming obsessives, none of whom had anything to offer Malenfant but bad PR. Then along had come the yellow babies in Florida, and even NASA's space launches were suspended, and that seemed to be that. As Cornelius talked, she discreetly booted up the car's soft screen and referenced Cornelius Tane. Thirty-eight years old, born in Texas, not that you'd know it from the accent. Once a professional mathematician and academic, brilliant was the word used in the brief bio she found. A full professor at Princeton at twenty-seven, washed out at thirty. She couldn't find out why or what he'd been doing since then. She set off a couple of data miners to answer those questions for her. After the yellow babies, Malenfant had regrouped. He disappeared from the TV screens. He continued to fund educational efforts, books, TV shows, movies. Emma, working within the Bootstrap Corporation, saw no harm in that, nothing but positive PR and tax-efficient besides. But in public, Malenfant largely withdrew from his propagandizing and withheld any investment from what he started to call the the pie-in-the-sky stuff. And quietly, he began to build a seriously large business empire. For instance, he had pioneered the mining of methane as a fuel source from the big high-pressure hydrate deposits on the seabed off North Carolina. He had leased the technology to other fields, off Norway and Indonesia and Japan and New Zealand, and bought up shares judiciously. Soon methane production was supplying a significant percentage of global energy output. The giant tents Malenfant's companies had erected over the seafloor to decompose the hydrates and trap the gases had become a symbol of his flair and ambition, and Malenfant was on his way to becoming remarkably rich. Space, it seemed, was the place Reed Malenfant had started from, not where he was going. Until, Emma thought, if Tane is right, this. Of course, Cornelia said, Malenfant's ambition is to be applauded. I mean, his real ambition, beyond this, um, diversionary froth. I hope you understand this is my basic position. What grander goal is there to work for than the destiny of the species? He spread thin fingers. Man is an expensive, exploring animal. We conquered Earth with Stone Age technology. Now we need new resources, new skills to fund our further growth, space to express our differing philosophies. He smiled. I have the feeling you don't necessarily share these views. She shrugged. This was an argument she'd rehearsed with Malenfant many times. It's such a gigantic, mechanistic, depressing vision... Maybe we should all just learn to get along with each other. Then we wouldn't have to go to all the trouble of conquering the galaxy. What do you think? He laughed. Your marriage must have been full of fire. And he continued to ask her questions, trying to draw her out. Enough. She wasn't prepared to be pumped by this faintly sinister man about her boss, let alone her ex-husband. She buried herself in emails, shutting him out. Cornelius sat in silence as still as a basking lizard. After an hour, they reached the California border. There was a border post here. An unsmiling guard scanned Emma's wrist barcode, her eyes hidden by insectile camera-laden sunglasses. Since Emma and Cornelius proved to be neither black nor Latino nor Asian and did not intend to take up permanent occupancy in the Golden State nor seek employment there, they were allowed through. California, Emma thought sourly, is not what it used to be. Highway 58, heading toward Mojave, took them through the desert. The sun climbed higher, and hard light fell from a hot ozone-leached sky. 
The ground was baked, bleached, flat and hard as a paving slab, with only gnarled and blackened Joshua trees to challenge the endless horizontals. Somewhere to her right was Death Valley, which had, in 2004, logged the world's all-time highest temperature at 139 degrees. They reached Edwards Air and Space Force Base, or rather they began to drive alongside its chain-link fence, forty miles of it running alongside the highway. Edwards, with its endless expanse of dry salt lakes, natural runways, was the legendary home of the test pilot. But from the highway she could see nothing at all. No planes or hangars or patrolling men in black guards. Nothing but miles of link fence. The accountant in her began involuntarily to compute the cost of all that wire. Still, the closeness of Edwards, with its connotation of 1960s astronaut glamour, was, she was sure, the reason Malenfant had chosen this area for his newest project. Malenfant's methods with people were coarse, but he knew the power of symbols. And it was, indeed, only a little way beyond Edwards that she came to the site of Malenfant's project. The main gate was little more than a hole in the fence, barred by a crash barrier that carried a small, almost unobtrusive, bootstrap corporate logo. The guard was a hefty woman with a small, dazzling bright pistol at her hip. Emma's company credentials, appended to the UV barcode ID she wore on her left wrist, were enough to get her and Cornelius through the gate. Inside the gate there was a porta cabin, once more displaying the corporate logo. Beyond that, there was more desert. There was no metaled road surface, just tracks snaking to the dusty horizon. Emma pulled the car over and climbed out. She blinked in the sudden light, felt perspiration start out of her flesh after a few seconds of the desert's dry, sucking warmth. The shade of the cabin, even badly air-conditioned, was a relief. She took in the cabin's contents with a glance. Malenfant's jokey company mission statement was repeated several times. Bootstrap. Making money in a closed economy until something better comes along. There were display stands showing the usual corporate PR, much of it approved by her, about the methane extraction fields and Bootstrap's cleanup activities at Hanford and the Ukraine nuke plants and Alaska and so forth. Bootstrap had tied up a recent youth-oriented sponsorship with Shit Cola, and so there was a lot of bright pink shit livery about the stands. Corny a gumbo, Emma thought, too cluttered and bright. But it defrayed the costs. And the shit audience, sub-age 25, generally sub-literate consumers of the planet's trendiest soft drink, were showing themselves amenable to subtle bootstrap persuasion mixed in with their diet of endless soft soaps and thongathons. No evidence here of giant rocket plants in the desert, of course. Cornelius was looking around in silence, an amused half-smile on his lips. She was finding his quiet, know-all attitude intensely irritating. His silence is disturbing. She heard the whine of an electric engine, a car of some kind, pulling up outside. With relief, she stepped out the door. The car was a late-model jeep, a bare frame mounted on big, fat tires with a giant solar cell carapace glistening like beetle chitin. It carried two people talking animatedly. The passenger was a woman unknown to Emma, sixty perhaps, slim and smart, wearing some kind of trouser suit. Practical, but a little hot, Emma thought. And the driver was, of course, Reed Malenfant. Malenfant got out of the car like a whip uncoiling. He bounded up to Emma, grabbed her arms, and kissed her cheek. His lips were rough, sun-cracked. He was ruinously tall, thin as a snake, bald as a coot. He was wearing a blue NASA-type jumpsuit and heavy black boots. As usual, he looked somehow larger than those around him, as if too big for the landscape. She could smell desert dust on him, hot and dry as a sauna. He said, "'What kept you?' she hissed. "'You've a hell of a nerve, Malenfant. What are you up to now?' Later, he whispered. The woman with him was climbing out of the car with caution, but she seemed limber enough. Malenfant said to Emma, "'Do you know Mara Della?' "'Representative Della? By reputation.' Mara Della stepped forward, a thin smile on her lips. "'Miss Tony, he's told me all about you.' "'I bet he has.' Emma shook her hand. Della's grip was surprisingly strong, stronger than Cornelia's chains, in fact. Malenfant said, 
I'm trying to win the representative support for the project here, but I suspect I've a little way to go yet. Damn right, Della said. Frankly, it seems incredible to me that you can attempt to build an eco-friendly project around rocket engines. Malenfant pulled a face at Emma. You can tell we're in the middle of an argument here. We sure are, Della said. Malenfant fetched plastic water bottles from the car and handed them out, while Mara Della kept on talking. Look, she said, the space shuttle actually dumps more exhaust products into the atmosphere than any other current launcher. Water, hydrogen, hydrogen chloride, and nitrogen oxides. The chloride can damage the ozone layer. If it got into the stratosphere, Malenfant said amiably, which it doesn't because it rains out first. Sixty-five percent of it does. The rest escapes. Anyhow, there are other effects. Ozone depletion because of the deposition of frozen water and aluminum oxide. Global warming contributions from carbon dioxide and particulates. Acid rain from the hydrogen chloride and the NOx products. Limited to a half mile around the launch site. But there... Anyhow, there are also the toxins associated with rocket launches, which only need to be present in small amounts. Nitrogen tet can cause acute pulmonary edemas. Hydrazine is carcinogenic, and there are old studies linking aluminum with Alzheimer's. Malenfant barked laughter. The aluminum in rocket motors is one hundredth of one percent of the total U.S. annual production. We'd have to be launching like Buck Rogers to do any real damage. Tell that to the mothers of the Florida Yellow Babies, Della said grimly. It had been a massive scandal. Medical studies had shown a series of birth abnormalities showing up in Daytona, Orlando, and other communities close to Cape Canaveral in Florida. Abnormal livers, faulty hearts, some external defects. A plague of jaundice, sometimes associated with serious neurological diseases. Yellow babies. Naturally, Malenfant was prepared for this. First of all, he said evenly, the medicos are split over whether the cluster exists at all. And even if it does, who the hell knows what the cause is? Della shook her head. Heptil has been detected in soil and plants. Along the east coast of Florida, it reaches as much as 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Emma asked, Heptil? Dimethylhydrazine, unburned rocket fuel. Highly toxic. Hydrazine compounds are notorious liver and central nervous system poisons. Furthermore, we know it can linger for years in bodies of water, rivers, and marshes. Della smiled thinly. I'm sorry. I guess we got a little worked up driving around out here. As you probably know, Malenfant has been kibitzing Congress for some time. Me, specifically. I thought I should come see if this rocket shop of his is just another hobby club tax write-off or something serious. Emma nodded. Right now, she didn't see why she should make life easy for Malenfant. He calls you Bill Proxmire in a skirt. Proxmire had been a notorious NASA opposing senator of the late twentieth century. Moradella smiled. Well, I don't wear skirts much, but I'll take it as a compliment. Damn right, Malenfant said easily, utterly unfazed. Proxmire was an unthinking opponent of progress. While I, Della said dryly to Emma, am a thinking opponent of progress. And therefore, Malenfant is calculating amenable to persuasion. I told you it was a compliment, Malenfant said. As the two of them fenced, Cornelius Tain had been all but invisible standing in the shadow of the porta cabin's doorway. Now he stepped forward as if materializing and smiled at Malenfant. Cornelius didn't blink in the harsh sunlight, Emma noticed. Maybe he was wearing image processing corneal implants. Malenfant frowned at him, startled. And who the hell are you? Cornelius introduced himself and his company. Malenfant growled. Eschatology. I thought I told the guards to keep you kooks out of the compound. Emma tugged his sleeve. I brought him in. She murmured about the shareholding Cornelius represented. Take him seriously, Malenfant. I'm here to support you, Colonel Malenfant, Cornelius said. Really, I don't represent any threat to you. Malenfant. Just call me Malenfant, he turned to Della. I apologize for this. I get these bullshit artists all the time. I suspect you only have yourself to blame for that, Della murmured. Cornelius Tain was holding up manicured hands. You have me wrong, Malenfant. We're not psychics. We are scientists, engineers, economists, statisticians, thinkers, not dreamers. 
I myself was formerly a mathematician, for instance. Eschatology has built on the pioneering work of thinkers like Freeman Dyson, who, in the 1970s, began to consider the future scientifically. Since then, we and others have worked hard to compile, um, a road map of the future. In fact, Colonel Malenfant, we already have proof that our studies of the future are generally successful. What proof? We've become rich out of them. Rich enough to invest in you, he smiled. Why have you come here today? To emphasize we support you. That is, we support your true objectives. We know about Key Largo, Cornelius said. Della looked confused. Key Largo in Florida? The name meant nothing to Emma, but she saw it had caught Malenfant off balance. This is too complicated for me, Malenfant said at last. Get in the jeep, please. We've got some hardware to see, now that I do understand. Meekly harboring their own thoughts, they obeyed. It was a three-mile drive to the test stand, farther than Emma had expected. Bootstrap owned a big piece of desert, it seemed. Malenfant's base here was like a miniaturized version of Edwards, miles of chain-link fence cutting out a hole in the desert, a hole within which exotic technology lurked, the scent of other worlds. But there was a lot of plant here, fuel tanks and hangar-like buildings and skeletal test stands. Malenfant just drove past it all without comment or explanation. Was there a secret purpose here, more equipment than could be explained away by the waste disposal cover story? Malenfant and Maradella continued to argue about space and rockets. Cornelius Tain was oddly detached. He sat, apparently relaxed, hands neatly folded before him, gaze sweeping over the desert as the babble of chemical names and statistics went on. There was something repellent about his surface of self-containment. Emma was financial controller of Bootstrap, not to mention Malenfant's ex-wife, but that meant little to Malenfant in terms of openness and sharing of information with her. She knew he did rely on her to keep the company within the fiscal regulations, though, and that meant that, in a bizarre way, he trusted her to break through his elaborate webs of deceit and concealment in time to comply with the reporting rules. It was a kind of dance between them, a game of mutual dependence played to unspoken conventions. In a way, she admitted to herself, she enjoyed it. But she did wonder, if Cornelius turned out to be right, if Malenfant had gone too far this time. Secret rocket ships in the desert? So 1950s, Malenfant. Still, here in this desert, just a few score miles from Edwards itself, Reed Malenfant, supple, tanned, vigorous, cheerful, seemed at home, much more than in a boardroom in Vegas or Manhattan or D.C., he looked like what he was, she thought, or rather what he had always wanted to be, a right stuff pilot of the old school, maybe somebody who could have gotten all the way into space himself. But, of course, it hadn't worked out that way. They reached the engine test facility. It was a big open box of scaffolding and girders with zigzag walkways scribbled across the structure, and a giant crane peering over the top of everything. Lights sparkled over the rig, bright despite the intensity of the afternoon sun. It looked like a piece of a chemical factory, unaccountably shipped out here to the dull California desert. But on a boxy structure at the center of the ugly conglomerate, Emma could see, crudely painted over, a NASA roundel. And there, as if trapped at the heart of the clumsy industrial metalwork, she saw the slim, snub-nosed form of a space shuttle external tank a shape familiar from images of more than a hundred successful Cape Canaveral launches and one memory-searing failure. White vapor was venting from somewhere in the stack, and it wreathed around the girders and tubing, softening the sun's glare. Oddly, she felt cooler. Perhaps the heat capacity of this giant mass of liquid fuel was sufficient to chill the desert air, her own body. Malenfant pulled up the jeep, and they stepped out. Malenfant waved at hard-hatted engineers who waved or shouted back, and he guided his party around the facility. What we have in there is a kind of mock-up of a space shuttle. We have the external fuel tank, of course, and a complete aft section with three main engines in place. Where the rest of the orbiter would go, we have a boilerplate truss section. The shuttle engines we use are obsolete. 
They've all flown in space several times and have been decommissioned. We got the test hardware from NASA's old shuttle main engine test facility in Mississippi, the Stennis Space Center. He pointed to a fleet of tankers parked alongside the facility. They were giant 18-wheelers, but against the rig they looked like beetles at the foot of an elephant. At Stennis, they bring in the fuel, locks, and liquid hydrogen by barge. We don't have that luxury. They reached a flame pit, a mighty concrete conduit dug into the desert alongside the test rig. Malenfant said, We've already achieved 522nd burns here, equivalent to a full shuttle flight demonstration test at 100% thrust. He smiled at Moradella. This is the only place in the world anybody is firing shuttle main engines right now, still the most advanced rocket engines in the world. We have a 19-story high fuel tank in there, 800 tons of liquid fuel chilled through 300 degrees or below. When the engines fire up, the turbo pumps work at 40,000 revs per minute. A thousand gallons of fuel are consumed every second. All very impressive, Malenfant, Della said, but I'm hardly likely to be overwhelmed by engineering gosh-wow numbers. This isn't the 1960s. You really think you need to assemble all this space hardware just to lose a little waste? Surely. What we plan is to use rocket combustion chambers as high-temperature, high-volume incinerators. He led them to a show board, a giant flow diagram showing mass streams, little rockets with animated yellow flames glowing in their hearts. We reached two to three thousand centigrade in there, twice as high as in most commercial incinerators, which are based on rotary kiln or electric plasma technology. We feed the waste material through at high speed, first to break it down and then to oxidize it. Any toxic products are removed by a multi-stage cleansing process that includes scrubbers to get acidic gases out of the exhaust. We think we can process most poisonous industrial byproducts and also nerve gas and biological weapons at a much greater speed and a fraction the cost of conventional incinerators. We think we'll be able to process tons of waste every second. We could probably tackle massive ecological problems like cleaning out poisoned lakes. Getting rich by cleaning the planet, Della said. Malenfant grinned, and Emma knew he had worked his way onto home ground. Representative, that's the philosophy of my corporation. We live in a closed economy. We've girdled the earth, and we have to be aware that we're going to have to live with whatever we produce, useful goods or waste. But if you can spot the flows of goods and materials and economic value, it's still possible to get rich. Cornelius Tain had walked away from the others. Now he was clapping slowly and softly. Gradually he caught the attention of Malenfant and Della. Captain Future, I forgot you were here, Malenfant said sourly. Oh, I'm still here, and I have to admire the way you're handling this. The plausibility. I believe you're even sincere on the level of this cover-up. Moradella said, Cover-up? What are you talking about? Key Largo, Cornelia said. That's what this is really all about, isn't it, Malenfant? Malenfant glowered at him, calculating. Here we go, Emma thought bleakly. Not for the first time in her life with Malenfant, she had absolutely no idea what was going to come next, as if she were poised over a roller coaster drop. I watched your Delaware speech the other night, Cornelia said. Malenfant looked even more uncomfortable. Expanding across the galaxy, all of that? I've given that talk a dozen times. I know, Cornelia said, and it's admirable, as far as it goes. What do you mean? that you haven't thought it through. You say you're planning a way for humankind to live forever. Getting off the earth is the first step, etc. Fine. But what then? What is forever? Do you want eternity? If not, what will you settle for? A billion years? A trillion? He waved a hand at the sun-drenched sky. The universe won't always be as hospitable as this warm bath of energy and light far downstream... Downstream, I mean in the far future, the stars will die. It is going to be cold and dark, a universe of shadows. Do you hope that humans or human descendants will survive even then? You haven't thought about this, have you? And yet it's the logical consequence of everything you're striving for. And there is more, Cornelia said. 
Perhaps you are right that we are alone in this universe, the first minds of all. Since the universe is believed to have evolved from others, we may be the first minds to have emerged in a whole string of cosmoses. That is an astounding thought. And if it is true, what is our purpose? That, you see, is perhaps the most fundamental question facing humankind, and ought to shape everything you do, Malenfant. Yet I see no sign in any of your public statements that you have given any consideration to all this. The meaning of life? Was this guy for real? But Emma shivered, as if in this hot desert light the wind of a billion years was sweeping over her. We understand, you see, Cornelia said. Understand what? That you are trying to initiate a clandestine return to space here. Bull hockey, Malenfant barked. Emma and Moradella spoke together. Malenfant, he alleged this earlier. If this is true... Oh, it's true, Cornelia said. Come clean, Malenfant. The truth is, he wants to do more than fire off rockets to burn waste. He wants to build a rocket ship. In fact, a fleet of rocket ships. And launch them from here, the heart of the desert, and send them all the way to the asteroids. Malenfant said nothing. Della was visibly angry. This is not what I came here for, Cornelia said. Malenfant, we back you. A mission to an NEO, a near-Earth object, makes obvious economic and technical sense. The first step in any expansion off-planet, in the short to medium term, and in the long term, it could make the difference. What difference? Della said. The difference, Cornelia said easily, between the survival of the human species and its extinction. So is that what you came to tell me, you swivel-eyed freak? Malenfant snapped. That I get to save the world? Actually, we think it's possible, Cornelia said evenly. Della frowned, eyebrows arched skeptically. Really? So tell us how the world will end. We don't know how. We think we know when, however, two hundred years from now. The number, its blunt precision, startled them to silence. Malenfant looked from one to the other, the suspicious ex-wife, the frowning congresswoman, the mysterious prophet, and Emma saw he was, rarely for him, hemmed in. Malenfant drove them back to the porta cabin. They traveled in silence, sunk in their respective moods, wary of each other. Only Cornelius, self-absorbed, seemed in any way content. At the cabin, Malenfant served them drinks, beer and soda and water, and they stood in the California desert. Voices drifted over the baked ground, amplified and distorted, as a slow countdown proceeded. Malenfant kept checking his watch. It was a fat, clunky Rolex. No implants or active tattoos for Reed Malenfant, no, sir. For a man with his eye on the future, Emma thought, he often seemed wedded to the past. The firing started. Emma saw a spark of light, an almost invisible flame at the base of the stand, billowing white smoke, and then the noise came, a nonlinear crackle tearing at the sky. The ground shook as if she were witnessing some massive natural phenomenon, a waterfall or an earthquake, perhaps. But this was nothing natural. Malenfant had once taken her to see a shuttle launch. She'd had tears in her eyes then, from sheer exhilaration at the man-made power of the thing. And there were tears now, she found, to her reluctant surprise, even at the sight of this pathetic, cut-down half-ship, trapped in its steel cage and bolted to the earth. Cornelius is right, isn't he, Malenfant? she said. You've been lying to me for months. Years, maybe. Malenfant touched her arm. It's a long story. I know. I've lived it. Damn you, she whispered. There's a lot of unfinished business here, Malenfant. We'll handle it, Malenfant said. We can handle this guy, Cornelius, and his band of airheads. We can handle anybody. This is just the beginning. Cornelius Tane watched, eyes opaque. Bill Tybee. My name is Bill Tybee. Is this thing working? Oh, shit. Start again. Hi. My name is Bill Tybee, and this is my diary. Well, kind of. It's really a letter for you, June. It's a shame they won't let us talk directly, but I hope this makes up for you not being home for your birthday, a little ways anyhow. You know, Tom and little Billy are missing you. 
I'll send you another at Christmas if you aren't here, and I'll keep a copy at home so we can all watch it together. Come see the house. Here's the living room. Sorry, I folded up the cam. There. Can you see now? You notice I got the video wall replaced, finally. Although I hate to think what the down payments are going to do to our bank balance. Maybe we could have got by with the old one, just the hundred channels. What do you think? Oh, I got the solar cell roof replaced, too. That storm was a bitch. Here's Billy's bedroom. I'm whispering because she's asleep. She loves the hologram mobile you sent her. Everybody says how smart she is. Same as her brother. I mean it. Even the doctors agree about Billy. They're both off the... What do they say? The percentile chart's way off. You managed to give birth to two geniuses here, June. I know they don't get it from their father. I'll kiss her for you. There you go, sweet pea. One from me, too. Here we are in the bathroom. Now, June, I know it's not much as part of the guided tour, but I just want to show you this stuff because you're not to worry about it. Here's my Metalert ribbon, this cute silver thing. See? I have to wear it every time I leave the house, and I ought to wear it indoors, too. And here are the pills I have to take every day in this bubble packet. The specialist says they're not just drugs, but also little miniature machines, tumor busters that go prowling around my bloodstream looking for the defective cells before breaking themselves up and flushing them out of, well, I won't show you out of where. Here I am taking my pill for today. See? Gone. Nothing to worry about. The big C just ain't what it used to be. Something you have to live with to manage, like diabetes, right? Come on. Let's go see if Tom will let us into his room. He loves those star pictures you sent him. He's been penning them up on his wall. Emma Stoney Emma was still furious when she drove into work the morning after her trip to the plant. Even this early, on an August morning, the Vegas streets were thronged. People in gaudy artificial fabrics strolled past the giant casinos, the venerable Caesar's Palace and the Luxor and the Sands, the new Twin Sen Park, with its cartoon reconstructions of 30s gangster land Chicago and 60s space-age Florida and 80s yuppie-era Wall Street. The endless lights and laser displays made a storm of color and motion that was dazzling even against the morning sunlight like glimpses into another brighter universe. But the landscape of casinos and malls didn't stay static. There were a number of vacant or redeveloping lots like missing teeth and a smiling jaw. And whatever the facade, the scene within was always the same. Square miles of lush, ugly carpet, rows of gaming machines fed by joyless punters, blackjack tables kept open twenty-four hours a day by the virtual dealers. Still, the people seemed to be changing, slowly. Not so fat, for one thing. No doubt the fat buster pills were to thank for that. And she was sure there were fewer children, fewer young families than there used to be. Demography in action, the graying of America, the concentration of buying power in the hands of the elderly. Not that it was so easy to tell how old people were any more. There were fewer visible signs of age. Faces were smoothed to seamlessness by routine cosmetic surgery. Hair was restored to the vigor and color of a five-year-old's. Emma herself was approaching forty now, ten years or so younger than Malenfant. Strands of her hair were already white and broken. She wore them with a defiant pride. Malenfant had moved his corporation here, out of New York, five years ago. A good place for business, he said. God bless Nevada. Distract the marks with gambling toys and virtual titties while you pick their pockets. But Emma hated Vegas tacky joylessness. It had taken a lot of soul-searching for her to follow Malenfant, especially after the divorce. "'So we aren't married any more,' he'd said. "'That doesn't mean I have to fire you, does it?' Of course, she had given in. Come with him. Why, though? He wasn't her responsibility, as the e-therapists continually emphasized. He wasn't even open with her. This latest business with the shuttle engines, if true, was yet another piece of evidence for that.' And he had, after all, broken up their marriage and pushed her away. Yet, in his own complex, confused way, he still cared about her. She knew that. And so she had a motive for working with him. Maybe if she was still in his life, he might give more thought to his grandiose plans than otherwise. 
Maybe he would keep from strip-mining the planet in order to spare her feelings. Or maybe not. Her e-therapists warned that this was a wound that would never close as long as she stayed with Malenfant, worked with him. But then maybe it was a wound that wasn't meant to close. Not yet, anyhow. Not when she still didn't even understand why. When Emma walked into Malenfant's office, she found him sitting with his feet on his desk, crushed beer cans strewn over the surface. He was talking to a man she didn't know. An upright military type of about seventy, dressed in a sports shirt and slacks straight out of Cheers, circa 1987, with a bare frosting of white hair on a scalp-burned nutmeg brown. The stranger got up on Emma's entrance, but she ignored him. She faced Malenfant. Company business. Malenfant sighed. It's all company business. Emma, meet George Hench, an old buddy of mine from Air and Space Force days. George nodded. When it used to be just plain Air Force, he growled. Malenfant, why is he here? To take us into space, Reed Malenfant said. He smiled, a smile she'd seen too often before. Look what I did. Isn't it neat? So it's true. You're just incredible, Malenfant. Does the word accountability mean anything to you at all? This isn't a cookie jar you're rating. This is a business, and we can't win with this. A lot of people have looked at commercial space ventures. The existing launcher capacity is going to be sufficient to cover the demand for the next several years. There is no market. Malenfant nodded. You're talking about LEO stuff, communications, earth resources, meteorology, navigation. Yes. Well, you're right. Although demand patterns have a way of changing. You can't sell cruises until you build a cruise liner. But I'm not talking about low earth orbit. We will build a heavy lift booster, a direct ascent single throw out of earth orbit. And now she knew that everything Cornelius Tain had told her was true. You really are talking about going to the asteroids, aren't you? Why, for God's sake? George Hench answered. Because asteroids are flying mountains of stainless steel and precious metals, such as gold and platinum. Or they are balls of carbon and water and complex organics. A single metallic-type near-Earth object would be worth, conservatively, trillions in today's market. It would be so valuable, in fact, that it would change the market itself. And if you reach a C-type, a carbonaceous chondrite full of water and organic compounds, you can do what the hell you like. Such as? Malenfant grinned. You can throw bags of water and food and plastics back to Earth orbit, where they would be worth billions in saved launch costs. Or you could let a hundred thousand people go live in the rock. Or you can refuel and go anywhere. Bootstrapping, like it says on the letterhead. The truth is, I don't know what we're going to find. But I know that everything will be different. It will be like Cecil Rhodes discovering diamonds in southern Africa. He didn't discover the mine, she said. He just made the most money. I could live with that, Hench said earnestly. The key to making money out of space is getting the costs of reaching Earth orbit down by a couple of magnitudes. If you fly on shuttle, you're looking at 35,000 bucks per pound to orbit. And, Malenfant said, because of NASA's safety controls and qual standards, it takes years and millions of dollars to prepare your payload for flight. The other launch systems available are cheaper, but still too expensive and unreliable and are booked up anyhow. We can't hire Emma and we can't buy. That's why we have to build our own. Emma shook her head. But it's impossible. People have been trying to come up with cheap launchers for years. Yes, Hench said, and every time they were killed by the gun club. She eyed him. The gun club? NASA, Hench growled. Bureaucrat lifers with turf to defend, and the space lobby and the USASF, which, anyhow, has always been overruled by the fighter pilots who run that service. She turned back to Malenfant. And the permissions we'll need, the legal obstacles, the safety rules, have you thought about any of that stuff? Malenfant, this is such a leap in the dark, not even NASA's launching spaceships right now. Hench cackled. But that's the beauty of it, the excitement. Miss Stoney, we are historically a capitalistic frontier people. We've known space is the new frontier since 1950. 
Now's the time to wriggle out from under the gun club federal guys and do it the way we always should have. Malenfant shrugged. Emma, I've got the business plans lined up if you want to see them, and potential investors coming out of my ass. Bankers, investment brokers, merchant bankers, financiers, venture capitalists from Citibank, Prudential Beige, Morgan Trust, all of which you've kept from me. For God's sake, Malenfant, forget your drinking buddies and after-dinner audiences. How the hell do we persuade real investors to risk real money? By building incrementally, Hench said. By cutting tin fast. By building a little, flying a little, getting off the ground as fast as we can. That's how we built the Thor. In the 1950s, with the Atlas and Titan intercontinental ballistic missiles already under development, the United States defined a need for a smaller, simpler weapon for intermediate-range missions to be based in Britain and Turkey. The Thor, built from Atlas parts, was the answer. You'd call it a skunk works operation today, Hench said. We had that damn bird on the pad a year after the contract was signed, and we did it within budget, too. Not only that, MacDonald took it over and upgraded it to the Delta, and that baby is still flying and making money today, and that's why I'm confident I'm going to be able to deliver. Hench's eyes were a washed-out watery brown and flecked by damaged blood vessels. Malenfant was listening, rapt, to this old man's reminiscences. Emma realized, of course, that his decision was already made, the new program under this man implemented and running, a done deal. Malenfant would implicitly trust Hench, his personal Werner von Braun, to deliver as he promised, and he would take a personal interest again only when there was hardware ready to fly on some launch pad. But even if the technology worked, even if the costs worked out as Malenfant seemed to believe, there was the gun club and all the other opposing forces that had killed earlier turf-threatening new initiatives, forces that had pushed Malenfant himself into this covert scheme, obviously concocted over years in absolute secrecy even from her. But now that it's out in the open, what, she thought uneasily, is to stop the bad guys from killing us too. And if they do, where will that leave Malenfant? Where, in fact, will it leave me? For she knew, of course, that she was already involved, that she would follow Malenfant wherever his latest dream took him, for better or worse. What a schmuck I am, she thought. She resolved to make more time for her e-therapists. Hench talked on, urgently, meaninglessly, about rockets and engineering projects, for some time she thought of Cornelius Taine, his cold eyes, his bleak, crazy warnings of the future. Malenfant? Yeah? What are you doing at Key Largo? Space Cadet Copy this and pass it on. The news is just incredible. After all that coverage over the weekend, there can't be a soul on the planet who isn't aware of Reed Malenfant and what he's trying to do out in the Mojave. Naturally, the usual naysayers are hovering, moaning that Colonel Malenfant is acting outside the law, or is screwing up the environment, or is in some other way irresponsible. And there is the usual stench of hypocrisy and decay from the bloated corpse that is NASA, our space agency, the agency that should have done all this for us decades ago anyhow. Here's the pitch. Following a hastily convened gathering in Hollywood, California, a new society tentatively called the Flying Mountain Society has been formed. If you want to join, it will cost $500 U.S. or equivalent. For that investment, you won't get any information or brochures or member services. We will not print glossy magazines or feed a giant staff. In fact, we will have no full-time employees. As we are not another NASA booster club, you won't get glossy pictures of spacecraft that will never be built. All you will get is a guarantee that we won't waste your money. FMS isn't the only space organization, but it does exist solely to get us into space. Here's the catch. Don't join unless you are a hard-working person. Don't join unless you support Colonel Malenfant's goal of developing a space industry in our lifetimes and are prepared to work for it. In fact, we'd prefer you didn't join at all. We'd prefer you started up your own local chapter affiliated to the society, which we hope will evolve into a global umbrella organization of pressure groups and activists. 
You can start with a bake sale. You can start by bombarding the schools with images of asteroids. You can start by hiking out to the Mojave, rolling up your sleeves, and helping Colonel Malenfant any way he can use you. There is, incidentally, no truth in the rumors propagated in some sections of the press that the Flying Mountain Society is in any way affiliated with or funded by Bootstrap Incorporated or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates as, quote, a propaganda exercise. This is, in fact, counterfactual malice spread by Colonel Malenfant's turf warrior enemies. If you want to get involved, reply to this mail. Better yet, just get to work. Mara Della, Open Journal, September 3, 2010 It was soon after my visit to Malenfant's experimental site in the Mojave that the news broke about Bootstrap's true purpose, that is, to assemble a private heavy-lift vehicle with space shuttle technology to send some kind of mining mission to an asteroid. I don't know if Cornelius Tain had anything to do with that. Presumably, yes, if it served his shadowy organization's purposes— but it wasn't impossible the leak came from elsewhere. Bootstrap is surely as porous as any large organization. Anyhow, I find myself being sucked into the project. Somehow, through the leak and my covert involvement, the fact that I didn't blow the whistle immediately when I got back from the Mojave, I'm becoming seduced into considering not just rocket engine firings, not just a private launch system, but the NEO mission itself. This seems to be Malenfant's modus operandi. To build up an unstoppable momentum, to launch first and answer questions later. The usual forces of darkness are already gathering in Congress to oppose this. It's going to be a struggle. But I already know I'm not going to walk away from Malenfant, despite his outlandish covert scheming. You see, I happen to think Reed Malenfant is right. For the cost of one more space launch, which is undisputed financially and environmentally, it might be possible to reach a near-Earth object, actually to start exploiting one of those sun-orbiting gold mines, and so, just as Malenfant's corporate title suggests, to bootstrap a new human expansion into space. I think we've all become desensitized to the state of our world. We live in a closed economy, an economy of limits. Grain yields globally have been falling since 1984, fishing yields since 1990, and yet the human population continues to grow. This is the stark reality of the years to come. It seems to me our best hope for getting through the next century or so is to reach some kind of steady state, recycle as much as possible, try to minimize the impact of industry on the planet, try to stabilize the population numbers. For the last five to ten years I have, in my small way, been working toward exactly that goal, that new order. I don't see that any responsible politician has a choice. I must say I entered politics with rather higher hopes of the future than I enjoy now. But even the steady state, our best hope future, may not be achievable without space. Without power and materials from space, we are doomed to shuffle a known, in fact, diminishing stockpile of resources around the planet. Some players get rich, others get poor. But it's not even a zero-sum game. In the long term, we're all losers. It isn't just a question of economics. It's what this does to our spirit. We are frightened of the future. We exclude strangers, try to hold on to what we have rather than risk the search for something better. We spend more energy on seeking someone to blame for our present woes than on building for a better future. We've become a planet full of old people, old in spirit anyhow. Speaking as a sexagenarian, I know what I'm talking about. The point is that if we can open up the limits to growth, then we can all be winners. It's as simple as that. That is why I'm prepared to back Malenfant. Not, you'll note, because I like his methods, but the ends, I suspect, in this case, justify the means. However, all this is going to take some extremely delicate opinion management, especially over what Malenfant is doing at Key Largo. Sheena Five and in the warm, shallow waters of the continental shelf off Key Largo. The night was over, 
The sun, a fat ball of light, was already glimmering above the water's surface, which rippled with flat light. Sheena Five had spent the night alone, foraging for food among the seabed grasses. She had eaten well of small fish, prawns, larvae. She had been particularly successful using her arms to flash out hiding shrimp from the sand. But now, in the brightness of day, the squid emerged from the grasses and corals and rose in the water. The shoals formed in small groups and clusters, eventually combining into a community a hundred strong that soared in arcs and rows through the water. The jets made the rich waters sing as they chattered to each other, simple sentences picked out by complex skin patterns, body posture, texture. Court me, court me. See my weapons. I am strong and fierce. Stay away, stay away. She is mine. It was the ancient cephalopod language, Sheena knew, a language of light and shadow and posture, the words shivering one into the other, words of sex and danger and food. It was a language as old as the squid, millions of years old, much older than humans, and it was rich and beautiful, and she shoaled and chattered with joy. But there was a shadow on the water, and Sheena's deep gravity sense told her of an approaching infrasonic rumble, quite characteristic. It was a barracuda, a vicious predator of the squid. This one was young and small, but no less dangerous for that. The sentinels, scattered around the fringes of the shoal, immediately adopted concealment or bluff postures. Their simple words blared lies at the approaching predator and warned the rest of the shoal. Black bands on the mantle, arms limp, swimming rapidly backward, Look at me. I'm a parrotfish. I am no squid. Clear body, dark arms, and a downward V. Look at us. We are seagrass, sargassum, drifting in the current. We are no squid. A pseudomorph, a squid-shaped blob of ink, hastily emitted and bound together by mucus. Look at us. We are squid. We are all squid. Turn to predator, spread arms, white spots and false eyes to increase apparent size. Look at me, I am strong and fierce. Flee! The dark shape lingered close, just as a true barracuda would, before diving into the shoal, seeking to break it up. Sheena knew that there would be no true predators here in this garden-like reserve. Sheena recognized the glimmer of steel, the camera lenses pockmarking the too smooth hide of the beast, the regular churn of the propellers in back. She understood that the shadow could only be a watching bootstrap machine. But she sensed a dull recognition of this fact in the glittering animal minds of her cousins all around her. They were smart, too, smart enough to know they were safe here. Besides, so sophisticated were the defenses that the squid were rarely troubled by predators. So there was an element of play in the darting concealment and watchfulness of the shoal. And then came the hunt. The slim cylinder cruised through the posturing, half-concealed squid. Recognition pulsed through the shoal. Some of them spread their arms, covered their mantles with patterns of bars and streaks. Look at me. I have seen you. I will flee. It is futile to chase me. Now one of the squid shoal, a strong male, broke free and jetted in front of the barracuda. A pattern began to move over his skin in steady waves, a patchwork of light and dark brown that radiated from his streamlined body to the tips of his tentacles. It was the pattern Dan called the passing cloud. Stop and watch me. The barracuda cruised to a stop. The male spread his eight arms, raised his two long tentacles and his green binocular eyes fixed on the barracuda. Confusing patterns of light and shade pushed aside his hide. Look at me. I am large and fierce. I can kill you. The metal barracuda hung in the water, apparently mesmerized by the pattern, just as a predator should have been if it had been real. Slowly, cautiously, the male drifted toward the barracuda, coming to within a mantle length, gaze fixed on the fish. At the last moment, the barracuda turned sluggishly and started to slide away through the water. But it was too late for that. The male lunged, his two long tentacles whipped out, too fast even for Sheena to see, and their club-like pads of suckers pounded against the barracuda hide, sticking there. The barracuda surged forward. It was unable to escape. The male pulled himself toward the barracuda and wrapped his eight strong arms around its body, his body pattern changing to an exultant uniform darkening, 
careless now of detection. But when the male tried to jet backward, hauling at the prey, the barracuda was too massive and strong. The male broke the standoff by rocketing forward until his body slammed into the barracuda's metal hide. He seemed shocked by the hardness of the flesh, and he wrapped his two long, powerful tentacles around the slim gray body. Then he opened his mouth and stabbed at the hull with his beak. The hull broke through easily, Sheena saw. Evidently, it was designed for this. The male injected poison to stun his victim, and then dug deeper into the hide to extract the warm meat beneath. And meat there was, what looked like fish fragments to Sheena, booty planted there by Dan. The squid descended, chattering their ancient songs, diving through the cloud of rich, cold meat, lashing their tentacles around the stricken prey. Sheena joined in, her hide flashing in triumph, cool water surging through her mantle, relishing the primordial power of this kill, despite its artifice. That was when it happened. Mara Della Miss Della, welcome to Ocean Lab, Danny Stabo said. As she clambered stiffly down through the airlock into the habitat, the smell of air freshener overwhelmed Mara. The two men here, biologist Danny Stabo and a professional diver, watched her sheepishly. She sniffed. Woodland fragrance, correct? The diver laughed. He was a burly fifty-year-old, but the dense air mixture here, Hydraliox, turned his voice into a Donald Duck squeak. Better than the alternative, Miss Della. Mara found a seat between the two men before a bank of controls. The seat was just a canvas frame, much repaired with duct tape. The working area of this hab was a small cramped sphere, its walls encrusted with equipment. It featured two small, tough-looking windows, and its switches and dials were shiny and worn with use. The lights were dim, the instruments and screens glowing. A sonar beacon pinged softly like a pulse. The sense of confinement, the feel of the weight of water above her head, was overwhelming. Dan Estebo was fat, breathy, intense, thirty-ish, with Coke bottle glasses and a mop of unlikely red hair, a typical geek scientist type. Igor to Malenfant's Dr. Frankenstein, she thought. His face was underlit by the orange glow of his instrument panel. So, he said awkwardly, what do you think? I think it feels like one of those old Soviet-era space stations. The mirror, maybe. That's not so far off, Dan said, evidently nervous, talking too fast. This is an old Navy installation, built in the 1960s, nearly fifty years ago. It used to be in deep water out by Puerto Rico, but when a hab diver got himself killed, the Navy abandoned it and towed it here to Key Largo. Another Cold War relic, she said, just like NASA. Dan smiled. Swords into plowshares, ma'am. She leaned forward, peering into the windows. Sunlight shafted through dusty gray water, but she saw no signs of life, not a fish or frond of seaweed. So where is she? Dan pointed to a monitor a modern soft screen pasted over a scuffed hull section. It showed a school of squid jetting through the water in complex patterns. The image was evidently enhanced. The water had been turned to sky blue. We don't rely on naked eye so much, Dan said. Which one is Sheena Five? Dan touched the soft screen image, picking out one of the squid, and the virtual camera zoomed in. The streamlined, torpedo-shaped body was a rich burnt orange, mottled black. Wing-like fins rippled elegantly alongside the body. CPO toothis, CPOidea, Dan said. The Caribbean reef squid, about as long as your arm. See her counter shading? The light is downwelling, coming from above. She has shaded her mantle, brighter below, to eliminate the effect of shadow, making herself disappear. Squid, all cephalopods, in fact, belong to the phylum mollusca. Mollusks? I thought mollusks said feet. They do. Dan pointed. But in the squid, the foot has evolved into the funnel, here, leading into the mantle, and the arms and tentacles, here. The mantle cavity contains the viscera, the circulatory, excretory, digestive, reproductive systems. But the gills also lie in there. The squid breathes by extracting oxygen from the air that passes over the gills, and Sheena can use the water passing through the mantle cavity for jet propulsion. She has big ring muscles that... How do you know that's her? Dan pointed again. See the swelling between the eyes, around the esophagus? That's her enhanced brain? 
A squid's neural layout isn't like ours. Sheena has two nerve cords running like rail tracks the length of her body, studded with pairs of ganglia. The forward ganglia pair is expanded into a mass of lobes. We Jen anged Sheena and her grandmothers to... to make a smart squid. Miss Della squid are smart anyway. They are mollusks, invertebrates, but they are functionally equivalent to fish. In fact, they seem to have evolved a long time ago during the Jurassic in competition with the fish. They have senses based on light, scent, taste, touch, sound, including infrasound, gravity, acceleration, perhaps even an electric sense. See the patterns on Sheena's hide? Yes. They're made by chromatophores, sacs of pigment granules surrounded by muscles. The chromatophores are under conscious control. Sheena can open or close them as she chooses. The pigments are black, orange, and yellow. The underlying colors, blues and violets, are created by passive cells we call reflecting... Miss Della, Sheena can control her skin patterns consciously. She can make bands, bars, circles, annuli, dots. She can even animate the display. The mantle skin is like a reverse retina, where neural signals are converted to patches of shade rather than the other way around. And these patterns are signals? Not just the skin patterns. A given signal seems to be made up of a number of components. The patterns, skin texture, rough or smooth, posture, the attitude of the limbs, head, body, fins, and locomotor components, whether Sheena is resting, jetting, hovering, grabbing, ink jetting. There may be electric or sonic components, too. We can't be sure. The diver growled. Miss Della, we've barely scratched the surface with these animals, not to mention their deep-water cousins. Until the last few decades, all we did was lower nets and see what we could catch. We used to say it was like trying to understand the animals of the land by working with a butterfly net from a balloon in the clouds. And what do they use this marvelous signaling for? Mara asked. Dan sighed. Again, we aren't sure. They don't hunt cooperatively. They forage alone by night and shoal by day. The shoaling seems to be to provide protection while they rest. The squid don't hide on the bottom like octopuses. They shoal over seagrass beds where there are few predators. They have elaborate courtship rituals, and the young seem to learn from the old. They post sentinels, very effectively, too, though they may have six or seven predator encounters per hour, with yellow jacks and mutton snappers, barracuda and town fish coming at them from anywhere. The skid kill rate is very low. But a squid shoal is not a community like ours. They don't play or groom. There are no leaders among them. The squid don't show much loyalty to each other. They don't care for their young, and individuals move between shoals every few days. And they live only a couple of years, mating only once or twice. The squid live fast and die young. It's not clear to us why such short-lived animals need such complex behavior, communication systems, and breeding rituals. Yet they have them. Miss Della, these are not like the animals you may be familiar with. Perhaps they are more like birds. And you claim that these communication systems are actually a language. End of side one. 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 And of side one, and of side one, and of side one, and of side one, and of side one. Side two. Time. By Stephen Baxter. Continuing on page thirty five. Dan scratched his beard. We've been able to isolate a number of primal linguistic components that combine in a primitive grammar, even in unenhanced squid. But the language seems to be closed. It's about nothing but food, sex, and danger, as far as we can see. It's like the dance of the bee. Unlike human languages. Yes, what we have done is open up the language of the squid. We built on the basic patterns and grammar the squid already employ. The number of signals Sheena can produce is not unlimited, of course, but even unenhanced squid have a very wide vocabulary, taking into account the range of intensity, duration, and so forth they can employ. We think they express, for example, moods and intentions with these factors. And some of this stuff is extremely ancient. 
Some of the simpler signals, the dynamic displays designed to drive off predators, for example, can be observed among the octopuses. And the squid diverged from them back in the early Mesozoic, some 200 million years ago. Anyhow, building on this, we believe Sheena, or at any rate her descendants, should be able to express an infinite number of messages, just as you or I can, Miss Della. Squid are clever mollusks. Giving them language was easy. How do you train them? With positive reinforcement, mostly. Mostly? He sighed. I know what you're asking. Yes, cephalopods can feel pain. They have three nerve endings in the skin. We use low-voltage electric currents to deliver mild shocks during discrimination training. They react as if, well, as you would if I touched you with a stinging nettle. It's no big deal. Miss Della, I hope you aren't going to get hung up on this. I cherish Sheena, above and beyond her mission. I wouldn't damage her. I have no interest in hurting her. Studying him, she realized she believed him. But she sensed a certain lack in him, a lack of a moral center. Perhaps that was a prerequisite in any sentient creature who would inflict pain on another. Dan was still talking. Designing the Sheena series of enhancements, we were able to prove that the areas of the brain responsible for learning are the vertical and superior frontal lobes that lie above the esophagus. How did you prove that? Dan blinked. By cutting away parts of squid brains. Mara sighed. Here we go again. Memo, she thought. Do not let Igor here repeat this Nazi doctor stuff in front of the cameras. She felt uneasy on a deeper level, too. Here was Dan Estavo hijacking the squid's evidently remarkable communications senses for his own purposes, for capturing banal commands transmitted by humans. But Dan had admitted he didn't know what all this rich speech was really for. What if we are damaging Sheena, Mara thought, by excluding her from the songs of her shoals? Does a squid have a soul? They studied Sheena. That head was crowned by a beak surrounded by flipper-like arms, and two forward-looking eyes, blue-green rimmed with orange, peered briefly into the camera. Alien eyes. Intelligent. How did it feel to be Sheena? And could Sheena possibly understand that humans, Reed Malenfant and his associates, in fact, were planning to have her fly a rocket ship to an asteroid? The squid school on the soft screen seemed to be hunting now. They were moving in formation around an unmanned camera buoy. The images were spectacular, Jacques Cousteau stuff. They swim awful fast, she said. They're not swimming, Dan said patiently. When they swim, they use their fins. Right now, they are squirting water out of vents. Jet propulsion. You understand why I'm here? Malenfant is asking me to go to bat for you on the hill Monday. I have to put my reputation on the line to enable this project. I know that. Tell me this, Dr. Estabo. You're sure, absolutely sure, this is going to work? Absolutely. He spoke with a calm conviction. Miss Della, you have to see the power of Malenfant's conception. I'm convinced Sheena will be able to function in space and at the NAO. She is smart, obviously adapted to gravity-free conditions. There will be no calcium depletion or body fluid redistribution or any of that crap for her. Almost as if she has evolved for the conditions of space travel as we self-evidently haven't. And she can manipulate her environment. We have a variety of Waldo-driven instruments which will enable her to carry out her functions on the NEO. I'm told the squid are social creatures, and they're very mobile, obviously. Whereas Sheena will be alone in the can we're going to cram her into, she'll have a lot of facilities, Miss Della, including comms, of course. We'll do everything we can to keep her functioning. Functioning? Why not an octopus? Squid are social creatures. In fact, isn't it true that their consciousness arises from their social structures? Whereas octopuses, I'm told, are solitary, sedentary creatures, anyhow, who could stand the isolation and confinement. But not so smart, Dan said. They work alone. They don't need to communicate, and they rely on smell, not sight, to hunt. 
thanks to those squid eyes forward placed for binocular vision, Sheena will be able to navigate through space for us. It had to be a squid, Miss Della. If she's a little uncomfortable en route, that's a price we'll have to pay. And what about the return trip? The stresses of re-entry, rehabilitation, in hand, Dan said vaguely. He blinked like an owl. In hand. Sure, you're not the one going to the asteroid, you charmless nerd. Mara found herself convinced. Malenfant knows what he's doing right down the line. I have to force the approvals through on Monday. Sheena, smart, flexible, and a lot cheaper than an equivalent robot, even when you took into account the launch costs for her life support environment, was the item that had closed Reed Malenfant's interplanetary design. There were some things working in her favor. Behind the scenes, Malenfant had already begun to assemble promises of the technical support he was going to need. His old buddies at NASA had started to find ways to free up deep space communications and provide support for detailed mission design and other support facilities. And it would help, she thought, that this wouldn't be solely a NASA-related project. Cooperation from Woods Hole in Massachusetts and the Research Institute at Monterey Bay Aquarium in California diluted the hostility NASA always attracted on the hill. But, she thought, if I succeed, I will be forever associated with this. And if the news about the brave little squid turns sour enough, I may not survive myself. I've been working with Sheena for months now, Dan said. I know her. She knows me. And I know she's committed to the mission. You think she understands the risks? Dan looked uncomfortable. We're counseling her. And we're planning to have Sheena make some kind of statement of her own. Something we can broadcast, of course, with a translation. If something does go wrong, we hope the public will accept it as a justified sacrifice. Mara grunted, unconvinced. Tell me this, she said. If you were her, would you go? Hell no, he said. But I'm not her. Miss Della, every moment of her life, from the moment she was hatched, Sheena has been oriented to the goal. It's what she lives for, the mission. Somberly, Mara watched the squid, Sheena, as she flipped and jetted in formation with her fellows. I need to pee, she realized. She turned to Dan. How do I, um... The old diver type handed her a steel jar with a yellow label that had her name on it. Your personal micturition vessel. Welcome to the space program, Miss Della. Perhaps reacting to some out-of-shot predator threat, the squid show collapsed to a tight school and jetted away with startling speed. Their motion three-dimensional and complex, rushing out of the virtual camera's field of view. Sheena Five the courting began. The squid swam around each other, subtly adopting new positions in time and space, each female surrounded by two, three, four males. Sheena enjoyed the dance, the ancient, rich choreography, even though she knew courting was not for her. It never could be, after she had been selected by Bootstrap. Dan had explained it all. But now, regardless of Dan's strictures, regardless of the clamoring mind she carried, he came for her. The killer male, one tentacle torn on some loose fragment of metal bearing his wound proudly. She should swim away, but here he was next to her, swimming back and forth with her. She fled a short distance, but he pursued her, swimming with her, his every movement matching hers. She knew this was wrong, and yet... It was irresistible. She felt a skin pattern flush over her body, a pied mottling of black and clear speckled with white spots. It was a simple, ancient message. Court me. He swam closer, but the other males, still orbiting her, began to encroach, their eyes hard and intent. The hunter, her male, swam up to meet the most bold. They met each other, arms flaring, heads dark, bright bands on the mantle. Get away! She is mine! The male refused to back off, his body pattern flaring to match the hunter's. But the hunter raised his body until his fins bumped the intruders who backed away. Now he came back to her. 
She could see that his far side was a bright uniform silver, a message to the other males. Keep away now. Keep away. She is mine. But the side closest to her was a soothing uniform gray-black, a smooth texture into which she longed to immerse herself, to shut off the clattering analysis of the brain the humans had given her. As he rolled, the colors tracked around his body, and she could see the tiny muscles working the pigment sacs on his hide. Now he faced her, open arms starfished around his mouth. His eyes were on her, green and unblinking, avid, mindless, without calculation, utterly irresistible. And already he was holding out his hectocotylus toward her, the modified arm bearing the clutch of spermatophores at its tip. For a last instant she remembered Dan, his rigid human face peering out of glass windows at her, the little panels he sent into the water flashing their signs. Mission, Sheena, mission. Bootstrap, mission, Dan. She knew she must not do this. But then the animal within her rose, urgent. She opened her mantle to the male. He pumped water into her, seeking to flush out the sperm of any other mate. And then his hectocotylus reached for her, striking swiftly, and lodged his needle-like spermatophore among the roots of her arms. Already it was over. And yet it was not. She could choose whether or not to embrace the spermatophore and place it in her seminal receptacle. The male was withdrawing. All around her, the squid's flashing songs pulsed with life. She knew, compared to a human's, her life was short, flashing, bright, lasting one summer, two at most, a handful of matings, and she was alone. She did not know her parents, would never know her young, might never see this mate of hers again. And yet, it did not matter, for there was consolation in the shoal, and the shoal of shoals, the ancient songs that reached back to a time before humans, before whales, before even the fish. The songs... Poetry of light and dance made every squid aware she was part of a continuum that stretched back to those ancient seas and on to the incomprehensible future, and that her own brief, vibrant life was as insignificant yet as vital as a single silver scale on the hide of a fish. Sheena, with her human-built mind, was the first of all squid to be able to understand this, and yet every squid knew it on some level that transcended the mind. But Sheena was no longer part of that continuum. Dan understood nothing of the shoal, not really, but he had stressed that much to her. Sheena was different, with different goals, human goals. Even as the mayo receded, she felt overwhelmed with sadness, loneliness, isolation. Flaring anger at the humans who had done this to her, she closed her arms over the spermatophore and drew it inside her. E. C. N. N. Following the revelation that a genetically enhanced squid is to be the effective control center of Reed Malenfant's quixotic mission to an asteroid, detail, there has been a predictable outcry from conservation and wildlife rights groups. But there was an unexpected reaction on Wall Street today where stocks in information technology companies took a beating. Prices, full listing, quoted for the traditional giants like IBM, Link, and Microsoft, Link, tumbled. But so did the prices for companies like Qubit, Link, and Biocom, Link. Recent stars of the markets, with their stream of successes in the burgeoning fields of quantum technology computing and biocomputing, background. The reason for all this action is Bootstrap's rejection of traditional IT solutions in favor of the apparently exotic choice of an enhanced animal. Now analysts are questioning whether the industry's reputation for overpriced, unreliable, and bug-ridden products is finally taking its toll. Most of the firms we contacted refused to comment. But an e-spokesperson for IBM said today, animation, that... Ocean Child. Thank you, Your Honor. I only want to say this. I want everybody to know what we in the Eden League are attempting. 
We are developing an internal technology that will selectively suppress the so-called higher brain functions in humans. It is clear to us that our intelligence has been of no real evolutionary advantage, and therefore we intend to discard it. That is why I have no regrets about the mine we attempted to drop onto the laboratory at Key Largo. Frankly, I wish it had worked, and I know that statement will affect my sentencing. I don't care. In fact, I welcome it. And I can announce from this platform that we have already started researching a counter-technology that will similarly restore the squid to their innocence. What those fascist scientists are doing is cruel. I don't mean the experiments where they scoop out the brains of a sentient, intelligent creature. I don't mean the way they plan to put them to work, farming the oceans for us and even shooting them off into space where once they were free. I mean the fact that these animals have been given minds at all. For centuries we have dragged these beautiful creatures from the ocean for our food. Now for our own convenience we have committed a much greater crime. We have inflicted on these squid an awareness of mortality. And for that, may the Mother Ocean forgive us. Thank you. That's all. Emma Stoney We are invoking deep principles of scientific thinking, Cornelius Tain said. Copernicus pointed out that the earth moves around the sun, not the other way around, and so we were displaced from the center of the universe. The Copernican principle has guided us ever since. Now we see earth as just one star, unexceptional, among billions in the galaxy. We don't expect to find ourselves in a special place in space. Why should we expect to be in a special place in time? But that is what you have to accept, you see, if you believe humankind has a future with very distant limits, because in that case we must be among the very first humans who ever lived. Get to the point, Alan Trant said softly. All right. Based on arguments like this, we think a catastrophe is awaiting humankind, a universal extinction a little way ahead. We call this the Carter Catastrophe. Emma shivered, despite the warmth of the day. Malenfant had suggested they follow up Cornelius Tain's sudden intrusion into their lives by accepting his invitation to come to the New York head offices of Eschatology Incorporated. Emma resisted. In her view, they had far more important things to talk about than the end of the world. But Malenfant insisted. Cornelius, it seemed, had gotten under his skin. So here they were, the three of them sitting at a polished table big enough for twelve with small inlaid soft screens. On the wall was a gray glowing monitor screen. Malenfant sucked aggressively at a beer. Eschatology, he snapped. The study of the end of things, right? So tell me about the end of the world, Cornelius. What? How? That we don't know, Cornelius said evenly. There are many possibilities. Impact by an asteroid or a comet, another dinosaur killer, a giant volcanic event. A global nuclear war is still possible. Or perhaps we will destroy the marginal, bio-maintained stability of the Earth's climate. As we go on, we find more ways for the universe to destroy us, not to mention new ways in which we can destroy ourselves. This is what Eschatology Incorporated was set up to consider. But there's really nothing new in this kind of thinking. We've suspected that humanity was doomed to ultimate extinction since the middle of the 19th century. The heat death, Malenfant said. Yes, even if we survive the various short-term hazards, entropy must increase to a maximum. In the end, the stars must die, the universe will cool to a global uniformity, a fraction above absolute zero, and there will be no usable energy anywhere. I thought there were ways out of that, Malenfant said. Something to do with manipulating the big crunch, using the energy of a collapsing universe to live forever? Cornelius laughed. There have been ingenious models of how we might escape the death, survive a big crunch. But they are all based on pushing our best theories of physics, quantum mechanics, and relativity into areas where they break down, such as the singularity at the end of a collapsing universe. Anyway, we already know from cosmological data that there is no big crunch ahead of us. The universe is doomed to expand forever without limit. The heat death in one form or another seems inevitable. 
But that would give us billions of years, Malenfant said. In fact, more, Cornelius replied. Orders of magnitude more. Well, perhaps we should settle for that, Malenfant said dryly. Perhaps. Still, the final extinction must come at last. And the fact of that extinction is appalling, no matter how far downstream it is. But, Emma said skeptically, if you're right about what you said in the desert, we don't have trillions of years, just a couple of centuries. Cornelius was watching Malenfant, evidently hoping for a reaction. Extinction is extinction. If the future must have a terminus, does it matter when it comes? Hell yes, Malenfant said. I know I'm going to die someday. That doesn't mean I want you to blow my brains out right now. Cornelius smiled. Exactly our philosophy, Malenfant. The game itself is worth the playing. Emma knew Cornelius felt he had won this phase of the argument, and gradually, step by step, he was drawing Malenfant into his lunacy. She sat impatiently, wishing she wasn't here. She looked around the small, oak-paneled conference room. There was a smell of polished leather and clean carpets, impeccable taste, corporate lushness, anonymity. The only real sign of unusual wealth and power, in fact, was the enviable view, from a sealed, tinted window, of Central Park. They were high enough here to be above the park's main UV dome. She saw people strolling, children playing on the glowing green grass, the floating sparks of police drones everywhere. Emma wasn't sure what she had expected of eschatology. Maybe a trailer home in Nevada, the walls coated with tabloid newspaper cuttings, the interior crammed with cameras and listening gear. Or perhaps the opposite extreme, an ultra-modern facility with a giant virtual representation of the organization's Mr. Big beamed down from orbit, no doubt stroking his white cat. But this office, here in the heart of Manhattan, was none of that. It was essentially ordinary. That made it all the more scary, of course. Malenfant said now, So tell me how you know we only have two hundred years. Cornelia smiled. We're going to play a game. Malenfant glared. Cornelius reached under the table and produced a wooden box sealed up. It had a single grooved outlet with a wooden lever alongside. In this box there are a number of balls. One of them has your name on it, Malenfant. The rest are blank. If you press the lever, you will retrieve the balls one at a time, and you may inspect them. The retrieval will be truly random. I won't tell you how many balls the box contains. I won't give you the opportunity to inspect the box, save to draw out the balls with the lever. But I promise you there are either ten balls in here, or a thousand. Now, would you hazard which is the true number? Ten or a thousand? Nope, not without evidence. Very wise. Please pull the lever. Malenfant drummed his fingers on the tabletop. Then he pressed the lever. A small black marble popped into the slot. Malenfant inspected it. It was blank. Emma could see there was easily room for a thousand such balls in the box, if need be. Malenfant scowled and pressed the lever again. His name was on the third ball he produced. There are ten balls in the box, Malenfant said immediately. Why do you say that? Because if there was a thousand in there, it's not likely I'd reach myself so quickly. Cornelius nodded. Your intuition is sound. This is an example of Bayes' rule, which is a technique for assigning probabilities to competing hypotheses with only limited information. In fact, he hesitated, calculating, the probability that you're right is now two-thirds on the basis of your ball being third out. Emma tried to figure that for herself, but like most probability problems, the answer was counterintuitive. What's your point, Cornelius? Let's think about the future. Cornelius tapped the soft screen embedded in the tabletop before him. The small monitor before Emma lit up and a schematic graph drew itself elegantly on the screen. It was a simple exponential curve, she recognized, a growth rising slowly at first, steepening up to a point labeled now. Cornelius said, 
Here is a picture of the growth of the human population over time. You can see the steep rise in recent centuries. It is a remarkable fact that 10% of all the humans who have ever existed are alive now. More than 5% of all humans, Malenfant, were born after you were. But that is the past. Let's imagine how the future might develop. Here are three possibilities. The curve continued to climb, steepening as it did so, climbing out of Emma's frame. This, Cornelia said, is the scenario most of us would like to see, a continued expansion of human numbers. Presumably this would require a move-off planet. Another possibility is this. A second curve extrapolated itself from the now point, a smooth tip over to a flat horizontal line. Perhaps our numbers will stabilize. We may settle for the resources of the Earth, find a way to manage our numbers and our planet indefinitely. A bucolic and unexciting picture, but perhaps it is acceptable. But there is a third possibility. A third curve climbed a little way past the now marker, then fell spectacularly to zero. Jesus, said Malenfant, a crash. Yes, studies of the population numbers of other creatures, lower animals and insects, often show this sort of shape, plague, famine, that sort of thing, for us the end of the world is soon. Now, you can see that in the first two cases, the vast majority of humans are yet to be born, even if we stay on Earth, we estimate we have a billion years ahead of us before changes in the sun will render Earth's biosphere unviable. Even in this restricted case, we would have far more future than past. And if we expand off-planet, if we achieve the kind of future you're working for, Malenfant, the possibilities are much greater. Suppose we, or our engineered descendants, colonize the galaxy... There are 400 billion stars in the galaxy, many of which will provide habitable environments for far longer than a mere billion years. Then the total human population over time might reach trillions of times its present number. Oh, and that's the problem, Malenfant said heavily. You're starting to see the argument, Cornelia said, approving. I'm not, Emma said. Malenfant said... Remember his game with the balls in the box? Why are we here now? If we really are going on to the stars, you have to believe that you were born in the first one billionth part of the total human population. And how likely is that? Don't you get it, Emma? It's as if I drew out my ball third out of a thousand. Far more unlikely than that, in fact, said Cornelius. Malenfant got up and began to pace the room, excited. Emma... I don't know statistics from my elbow, but I used to think like this as a kid. Why am I alive now? Suppose we do go on to colonize the galaxy. Then most of the humans who ever live will be vacuum-sucking cyborgs in some huge interstellar empire, and it's far more likely that I'd be one of them than what I am. In fact, the only pop curve where it's reasonably likely that we'd find ourselves here now is... A crash, said Emma. Yes, Cornelius said somberly. If there is a near-future extinction, it is overwhelmingly likely that we find ourselves alive within a few centuries of the present day, simply because that is the period when most humans who ever lived, or who will ever live, will have been alive, ourselves among them. I don't believe this for a second, Emma said flatly. It is impossible to prove, but hard to refute, said Cornelius. Put it this way. Suppose I tell you the world will end tomorrow. You might think yourself unlucky that your natural lifespan has been cut short. But in fact, one in ten of all humans, that is, the people alive now, would be in the same boat as you. He smiled. You work in Las Vegas. Ask around. Losing out to one in ten odds is unlucky, but not drastically so. You can't argue from an analogy like this, Emma said. There are a fixed number of balls in that box. But the total number of possible humans depends on the undetermined and open-ended future. It might even be infinite. 
And how can you possibly make predictions about people who don't even exist yet, whose nature and powers and choices we know absolutely nothing about? You're reducing the most profound mysteries of human existence to a shell game. You're right to be skeptical, Cornelia said patiently. Nevertheless, we have thirty years of these studies behind us now. The methodology was first proposed by a physicist named Brandon Carter in a lecture to the Royal Society in London in the 1980s. And we have built up estimates based on a range of approaches, calling on data from many disciplines. Mellenfront said hoarsely, When? Not earlier than 150 years from now, not later than 240. Mellenfront cleared his throat. Cornelius... What's this all about? Is this an extension of the old eggs-in-one-basket argument? Are you going to push for an off-planet expansion? Cornelius was shaking his head. I'm afraid that's not going to help. Valentin looked surprised. Why not? We have centuries. We could spread over the solar system. But that's the point, Cornelius said. Think about it. My argument wasn't based on any one threat or any assumptions about where humans might be located or what level of technology we might reach. It was an argument about the continued existence of humanity, come what may. Perhaps we could even reach the stars, Malenfant, but it will do us no good. The Carter catastrophe will reach us anyway. Jesus, said Malenfant. What possible catastrophe could obliterate star systems, reach across light years? We don't know. There was a heavy silence in the wood-laden room. Malenfant said gruffly, So tell me what you want from me. I'm coming to that, Cornelia said evenly. He stood up. May I bring you more drinks? Emma got out of her chair and walked to the window. She looked out over Central Park, the children playing. They were engaged in some odd, complex game of shifting patterns. She watched for a while. It looked almost mathematical, like a geometric form of communication. Kids were strange these days, getting brighter according to the news media. Maybe they needed to be. But some things never changed. Here came a buggy, she saw, crossing through the park drawn by a horse, tireless and steady. The world, bathed in smoky, smog-laden sunlight, looked rich, ancient yet renewed, full of life and possibilities. Was it possible Cornelius was right? That all this could end so soon? Two hundred more years was nothing. There were hominid tools on the planet two million years old. And, she thought, will there be a last day? Will there still be a New York, a Central Park, the last children of all playing here on that day? Will they know they have no future? Or is all this simple craziness? Malenfant touched her arm. This is one hell of a thing, isn't it? She recognized the tone, the look. All the skepticism and hostility he had shown to Cornelius out in the desert had evaporated. Here was another big idea, and Reed Malenfant was distracted like a kid by a new shiny toy. Shit, she thought. I can't afford for Malenfant to take his eye off the ball. Not now. And it's my fault. I could have dumped Cornelius in Vegas, found a way to block his approach. Too late. Too late. She tried anyway. Malenfant, listen. I've been digging up Cornelius' past. Malenfant turned attentive. Some of it was on record. She hadn't even recognized the terms mathematicians used to describe Cornelius' academic achievement. Evidently, it covered games of strategy, economic analysis, computer architecture, the shape of the universe, the distribution of prime numbers. He had been on his way, it seemed, to becoming one of the most influential minds of his generation. But he had always been, well, odd. His gift seemed non-rational. He would leap to a new vision, somehow knowing its ripeness instinctively, and construct laborious proofs later. Cornelius had remained solitary. He had attracted awe, envy, resentment. 
As he'd approached thirty, he had driven himself through a couple of years of feverish brilliance. Maybe this was because the well of mathematical genius traditionally dries up at around that age, a prospect that must have terrified Tane, so that he thought he was working against time. Or maybe there was a darker explanation, Emma's e-therapists speculated. It wasn't unknown for creativity to derive from a depressive or schizoid personality, and creative capacities could be used in a defensive way to fend off mental illness. Maybe Cornelius had been working hard in order to stay sane. If he had been, it didn't seem to have worked. The anecdotes of Cornelius' breakdown were fragmentary. At first he was just highly aware, watchful, insomniac. Then he began to see patterns in the world around him, the cracks in the sidewalk, telephone numbers, the static of dead television screens. He had said he was on the verge of deep cosmic insights available only to him. Who says all this? His colleagues, his doctors, case notes, later. You see the pattern, Malenfant? Everything got twisted around. It was as if his faith in the rationality and order of the universe had turned against him, becoming twisted and dysfunctional. Yeah, right. And envy and peer pressure and all that good stuff had nothing to do with it. Malenfant, on his last day at Princeton, they found him in the canteen, slamming his head against a wall over and over. After that... Cornelius had disappeared for two years. Emma's data miners had been unable to trace how he spent that time. When he re-emerged, it wasn't to go back to Princeton, but to become a founding board member of Eschatology Incorporated. And here was Emma now with Malenfant in the orderly office of this apparently calm, rational, highly intelligent man, talking about the end of the world. Don't you get it, Malenfant? she whispered urgently. Here's a guy who tells us he sees patterns in the universe nobody else can make out. A guy who believes he can predict the end of humanity. A guy who seemed on the point of inducing Malenfant to turn aside his own gigantic projects to follow his insanity. Are you listening? Malenfant touched her arm. I hear what you say, he said, but... But what? What if it's true? Whether Cornelius is insane or not, what if he's right? What then? His eyes were alive, excited. Emma watched the children in the park. Cornelius returned and invited them to sit once more. He had brought a fresh chilled beer for Malenfant and a coffee for Emma. A decent latte and a china cup, smelling as if it had been freshly brewed and poured by a human hand. She was impressed, as was, no doubt, the intention. Cornelius sat down. He coughed. Now comes the part you may find hard to believe. Malenfant barked laughter. Harder than the death of humankind in two hundred years? Are you for real? Cornelius said with a nod to Emma, Here's a little more dubious logic for you. Suppose in the next few decades humans, our descendants, do find a way to avoid the catastrophe a way for us to continue into the indefinite future. That's impossible if your arguments are correct. No, merely highly unlikely. But in that case, and knowing the hugeness of the catastrophe to come, if they did find a way, what might our descendants try to do? Malenfant frowned. You're losing me. Cornelius smiled. They would surely try to send us a message. Emma closed her eyes. The madness deepens, she thought. Whoa! Malenfant held up his hand. You're talking about sending a message back in time? Cornelius went on. And the most logical thing for us to do would be to make every effort to detect that message, wouldn't it? Because it would be the most important message ever received. The future of the species would depend on it. Time paradoxes, Emma whispered. I always hated stories about time paradoxes. Malenfant sat back. Suddenly, to Emma, he looked much older than his fifty years. Jesus, what a day. And this is what you want me for? To build you a radio that will pick up the future? Perhaps the future is already calling. All we have to do is try any which way. They're our descendants. They know we are trying. They even know how we are trying. And so they can target us, or will. Our language is a little limited here. You are unique, Malenfant. 
You have the resources and vision to carry this through. Destiny awaits you. Malenfant turned to Emma. She shook her head at him. We ought to get out of here. He looked bemused. He turned back to Cornelius. Tell me one thing, he said. How many balls were there in that damn box? But Cornelius would only smile. Read Malenfant. Afterward, they shared a cab to the airport. Remember those arguments we used to have? He smiled. Which arguments in particular? About whether to have kids. Yeah. We agreed our position, didn't we? If you have kids, you're a slave to your genes. Just a conduit from past to future. From the primeval ocean to galactic empire. Right now, she said, that doesn't seem such a bad ambition. And if we did have kids, we might be able to figure it out better. Figure out what? She waved a hand at the New York afternoon. The future. Time and space. Doom soon. I think I'm in some kind of shock, Malenfant. Me too. But I think if I had kids, I'd understand better. Because those future people who will never exist except as Cornelius' statistical phantoms would have been my children. As it is, they have nothing to do with me. To them, I'm just a... a bubble that bursts, utterly irrelevant, far upstream. So their struggles don't mean anything. We don't mean anything. All our struggles, the way we loved each other and fell out with each other and fought like hell, our atom of love, none of it matters. Because we're transient. We'll vanish like bubbles, like shadows, like ripples on a pond. We do matter. You do. Our relationship does. Even if it is self-contained, sealed off. You aren't irrelevant to me, Emma. And my life, what I've achieved, means a lot to me. But that's me subliminating. That's what you diagnosed years ago, isn't it? I can't diagnose anything about you, Malenfant. You're just a mass of contradictions. If you could change history like Cornelius says the future people are trying to do, he said, if you could go back and fix things between us, would you? She thought about that. The past has made us what we are. If we changed it, we'd lose ourselves, wouldn't we? No, Malin thought. I wouldn't change a damn thing, but... Yeah? She was watching him, her eyes as black as deep lunar craters. That doesn't mean I understand you. And I don't love you. I know that, he said, and he felt his heart tear. Bill Tyvee. June... I know you want me to tell you everything, good and bad, so here goes. The good is that Tom loves the heart you sent him for his birthday. He carries it around everywhere, and he tells it everything that happens to him, though, to tell you the truth, I don't understand the half of what he says to it myself. Here's the bad. I had to take Tom out of school yesterday. Some kids picked on him. I know we've had this shit before, and we want him to learn to tough it out, but this time it went beyond the usual bully-the-brainiac routine. The kids got a little rough, and it sounds as if there was a teacher there who should have intervened but didn't. By the time the principal was called, it had gotten pretty serious. Tom spent a night in the hospital. It was only one night, just bruising and cuts and one broken bone in his little finger, but he's home now. If I turn the screen around... Wait. You can see him. Fine, isn't he? He's a little withdrawn. I know we discourage that rocking thing he does, but today's not the day. You can see he's reading. I have to admit I still find it a little scary the way he flips over the pages like that, one after the other, a page a second, but he's fine. Just our Tom. So you aren't to worry but I'll want assurances from that damn school before I let Tom go back there again. Anyway, enough. I want to show you Billy's painting. Emma Stoney When she heard Malenfant had hauled Dan Estebo out from Florida, Emma stormed down to Malenfant's office. Here's the question, Dan, Malenfant was saying. 
How would you detect a signal from the future? Behind his beard, Danny Stavo's mouth was gaping. His face and crimson hair shone greasy, and there were two neat half-moons of dampness under his armpits. Souvenirs, Emma thought, of his flight from Florida, the first available, and his yellow smart cab ride from the airport. What are you talking about, Malenfant? A signal from the future. What would you do? How would you build a receiver? Dan looked, confused, from Malenfant to Emma. Malenfant, for Christ's sake, I've got work to do. Sheena Five, you've got a good team down there, Malenfant said. Cut them a little slack. This is more important. He pulled out a chair and pushed at Dan's shoulders, almost forcing him down. He had a half-drunk can of shit. Now he shoved it to Dan. Thirsty? Drink. Hungry? Eat. Meantime, think. Yo, Dan said uncertainly. You're my Mr. Science, Dan. Signals from the future. What? How? Wait until you hear the stuff I am on to here. It's incredible. If it pans out, it will be the most important thing we've ever done. Christ, it will change the world. I want an answer in twenty-four hours. Dan looked bewildered. Then a broad smile spread over his face. God, I love this job. Okay, you got connections in here? Malenfant stood over him and showed him how to log on from the soft screen built into the desk. When Dan was up and running, Emma pulled at Malenfant's sleeve and took him to one side. So once again you're ripping up the car park. Malenfant grinned and ran his big hand over his bare scalp. I'm impulsive. You used to like that in me. Don't bullshit, Malenfant. First I find we've invested millions in Key Largo. Then I learn that Dan, the key to that operation, is reassigned to this la-la eschatology bullshit. But he's done his job at Largo. His juniors can run with the ball a while. Malenfant, Dan isn't some general-purpose genius like in the movies. He's a specialist, a marine biologist. If you want someone to work on time travel signals, you need a physicist or an engineer. Better yet, a sci-fi writer. He just snorted at that. People are what counts. Dan is my alpha geek, Emma. I don't know why I stay with you, Malenfant. He grinned. For the ride, girl, for the ride. All right. But now we're going to sit down and do some real work. We have three days before your stakeholder presentation, and the private polls do not look good for us. Are you listening to me, Malenfant? Yeah. But Malenfant was watching Dan. Yeah. Sorry. Come on, we'll use your office. Read Malenfant. Malenfant had called the stakeholder presentation to head off a flight of capital after the exposure of his off-earth projects. He hired a meeting room at the old McDonnell Douglas Huntington Beach Complex in California. McDonnell had been responsible for the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft back in Spaceflight's Stone Age, or Golden Age, depending on your point of view. Mercury and Gemini, little ships that could, had been highly popular with the astronaut corps. Also, he had the room lined with displays of pieces of hardware taken from his Mojave development shops. Hydraulic actuators and autopilots and vernier motors. Real scorch-marked rocket engineering. To the smart operator, Malenfant liked to say, everything is a symbol. Emma nudged him. It was time. He stood up and climbed onto the stage. The audience bus dropped and the lights dimmed. Once again... A turning point, he thought. Another make-or-break crisis. If I succeed today, then the big dumb booster flies. If I fail, then hell. I find another way. He was confident, in command. He began. We at Bootstrap believe it is possible that America can dominate space in the 21st century, making money doing it, just as we dominated commercial aviation in the 20th century. In fact... As I will try to explain, I believe we have a duty to the nation, indeed the human species, at least to try. But the first thing we have to do is to bring down Earth to orbit costs, he said. And there are two ways to achieve that. One way is to build a new generation of reusable spacecraft. The first challenge came, a voice floating from the back of the room. We already have a reusable spacecraft. We've been flying it for thirty years. Malenfant held his hands up. Much as I admire NASA's achievements, to call the space shuttle reusable is to stretch the word to its yield point. 
After each shuttle flight, the orbiter has to be stripped down, reassembled, and recertified from component level up. It would actually be cheaper to build a whole new orbiter every time. So you're proposing a new reusable craft? Lockheed has spent gigabucks and years developing. I'm not aiming for reusability at all, if you'll forgive me, because the other approach to cutting launch costs is to use expendables that are so damn cheap that you don't care if you throw them away. Hence, the big dumb booster. Using the giant soft screen behind him, he let them look at a software graphic image of George Hench's BDB on the pad. It looked something like the lower half of a space shuttle, two solid rocket boosters strapped to a fat, rust-brown external fuel tank, but there was no moth-shaped shuttle orbiter clinging to the tank. Instead, the tank was topped by a blunt-nosed payload cover almost as fat and wide as the tank itself. And there were no NASA logos, just the bootstrap insignia and a boldly displayed stars and stripes. There were some murmurs from his audience, one or two snickers. Somebody said, It looks more Soviet than anything American. So it did, Malenfant realized, surprised. He made a note to discuss that with Hench, to take out the tractor factory tinge. Symbolism was everything. Malenfant pulled up more images, including cutaways giving some construction details. The stack is over 300 feet tall. You have a boat tail of four space shuttle main engines here, attached to the bottom of a modified shuttle external tank, so the lower stage is powered by liquid oxygen and hydrogen. You'll immediately see one benefit over the standard shuttle design, which is inline propulsion. We have a much more robust stack here. The upper stage is built on one shuttle main engine. Our performance to low Earth orbit will be 135 tons, twice what the shuttle can achieve. But LEO performance is secondary. This is primarily an interplanetary launcher. We can throw 50 tons directly onto an interplanetary trajectory. That makes the avionics simple, incidentally. We don't need to accommodate Earth orbit or re-entry or landing, just point and shoot. It may be big and dumb, but it's scarcely cheap. Oh, but it is. What you have here is a bird built from technology about as proven and basic as we can find. We only use shuttle engines and other components at the end of their design lifetimes. And as I've assured you before, I am investing not one thin dime in R&D. I'm interested in reaching an asteroid, not in reinventing the known art. We believe we could be ready for launch in six months. What about testing? We will test by flying, and each time we fly, we will take up a usable payload. That's ridiculous. Not to say irresponsible. Maybe, but NASA used that approach to accelerate the Saturn V development schedule. Back then, they called it all-up testing. We're walking in mighty footsteps. There was some laughter at that. You have the necessary clearance for all this? We're working on it. More laughter, a little more sympathetic. As for our financial soundness in the short term, you have the business plans downloaded in the soft screens in front of you. Capital equipment costs, operating costs, competitive return on equity and the cost of debt, the capital structure including the debt-to-equity ratio, other performance data such as expected flight rate, tax rates, and payback periods. Even the first flight is partially funded by scientists who have paid to put experiments aboard from private corporations, the Japanese, and European space agencies, even NASA. You must realize your whole cost analysis here is based on flawed assumptions. The only reason you can pick up shuttle engines cheap is because the shuttle program exists in the first place. So it's a false saving. Only somebody funded by federal money would call any saving false, Malenfant said. But it doesn't matter. This is a bootstrap project, remember. All we need is to achieve the first few flights. After that, we'll be using the resources we find out there to bootstrap ourselves further out. Not to mention, make ourselves so rich, we'll be able to buy the damn shuttle program. I know this isn't easy to assess for any investor who isn't a technologist. Exercising due diligence, how would I check out such a business plan? How else but by giving it to my brother-in-law at NASA? After all, NASA has the only rocket experts available, right? But NASA will give you the same answer every time. It won't work. If it did, NASA would be doing it, and we aren't. 
All I can ask of you is that you don't just go to NASA. Seek out as many opinions as you can and research the history of NASA's use of bureaucratic and political machinery to stifle similar initiatives in the past. There was some stirring at that, even a couple of boos, but he let it stand. Let me show you where I want to go. He pulled up a blurred radar image of an asteroid, a lumpy rock. This piece of real estate is called Rhinemuth. It is a near-Earth asteroid discovered in 2005. It is what the astronomers call an M-type, solid nickel iron with a composition of a natural stainless steel. One cubic kilometer of it ought to contain seven billion tons of iron, a billion tons of nickel, and enough cobalt to last 3,000 years, conservatively worth six trillion bucks. If we were to extract it all, we would transform the national economy, in fact, the planet's economy. How can you expect a government to support an expansionist space colonization program? I don't. I just want government to get out of the way. Oh, maybe government could invest in some fast-track experimental work to lower the technical risk. Nodding heads at that. And there may be kickstarts the government can provide, like the Kelly Act of 1925, when the government gave mail contracts to the new airlines. But that's just seed corn stuff. This program isn't called bootstrap for nothing. We have a model from history. The British Empire worked to a profit. How? The British operated a system of charter companies to develop potential colonies. The companies themselves had to bear the costs of administration and infrastructure, running the local government, levying taxes, maintaining a police force, administering justice. Only when a territory proved itself profitable would the British government step in and raise the flag. The French and Germans, by contrast, worked the other way around, government followed by exploitation and trade. By 1900, colonial occupation had cost the French government the equivalent of billions of dollars. We don't want to make the same mistake. We believe the treaties governing outer space resources are antiquated, inappropriate, and probably unenforceable. We believe it is up to the U.S. government to revoke those treaties and begin to offer development charters along the lines I've described. What we're offering here is the colonization of the solar system and the appropriation of its resources as appropriate on behalf of the United States, at virtually zero cost to the U.S. taxpayer. And we all get rich as creases in the process. There was a smattering of applause at that. He stepped forward to the front of the stage. Before him there was a sea of faces, mostly men, of course, most of them over fifty and therefore conservative as hell. They were representatives of his corporate partners here, Aerojet and Honeywell and Deutsche Aerospace and Scaled Composites and Martin Marietta and others, as well as representatives of the major investors he still needed to attract and four or five NASA managers, even a couple of uniformed USASF officers. Movers and shakers, the makers of the future, and a few entrenched opponents. He marshaled his words. This isn't a game we're playing here, in a very real sense we have no choice. I cut my teeth on the writings of the space colony visionaries of the sixties and seventies. O'Neill, for instance, remember him? All those cities in space. Those guys argued convincingly that the limits to economic growth could be overcome by expansion into space. They made the assumption that the proposed space programs of the time would provide the capability to maintain the economic growth required by our civilization. None of it happened. Today, if we want to start to build a space infrastructure, we've lost maybe 40 years and a significant downgrade of our capability to achieve heavy lift into orbit. And the human population has kept right on growing. Not only that... There is a continuing growth in wealth per person. Even a pessimistic extrapolation says we need total growth of a factor of 60 over the rest of this century to keep up. But right now, we ain't growing at all. We're shrinking. We lose 25 billion tons of topsoil a year. That's equivalent to six 1930s dust bowls. Aquifers, such as those beneath our own grain belt, are becoming exhausted. Our genetically uniform modern crops aren't proving too resistant to disease, and so on. 
We are facing problems that are spiraling out of control exponentially. Let me put this another way. Suppose you have a lily doubling in size every day. In thirty days it will cover the pond. Right now it looks harmless. You might think you need to act when it covers half the pond. But when will that be? On the twenty-ninth day. People, this is the twenty-ninth day. Here's the timetable I'm working to. We need to be able to use power from space to respond to the global energy shortage by 2020. That's just ten years from now. By 2050, we need a working economy in space that can return power, microgravity, industrial products, and scarce resources to the Earth. We might even be feeding the world from space by then. We'll surely need tens of thousands of people in space to achieve this, an infrastructure extending maybe as far as Jupiter. That's just 40 years away. By 2100, we probably need to aim for economic equivalence between Earth and space. I can't hazard what size of economy this implies. Some say we may need as many as a billion people out there. We can figure it out later. These are targets, not prophecy. We may not achieve them. If we don't try, we certainly won't. My point is that we've sat around with our thumbs up our butts for too long. If we start now, we may just make it. If we leave it any longer, we may not have a planet to launch our spaceships from. And, he said, in the end, have faith. And who? You? Alan Fon smiled. His speech was well rehearsed, and it almost condensed him. But Cornelius Carter stuff nagged away at the back of his head. Was all this stuff, the exploitation of the solar system for profit, really to be his destiny? Or something else? Something he couldn't yet glimpse? He felt his pulse race at the prospect. Behind him, the soft-screen software-generated images gently morphed into a shot of a big, dumb booster, real hardware sitting on the pad, a pillar of heavy engineering wreathed in vapor under a burning blue sky, a spaceship ready for launch. Damn if he couldn't see some glistening eyes out there, shining in the transmitted desert light. This is a live image, he said. We're ramping up for our first smoke test. People, this is just the beginning. I'm going places. Come aboard. He waited for the applause. It came. Emma Stoney It only took a week before Dan had designed and set up his first message from the future experiment at a place called the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia. Emma was relieved that the funding required was modest, comparatively anyhow, and that Malenfant was able to pull strings to get his way without, as far as she could tell, any visible damage to the company. Translation, nobody had found out yet what the hell they were doing. Weeks went by, and the experiment produced nothing useful. Malenfant shuttled between Vegas, the Mojave, and West Virginia. After a month of trying to convince Malenfant to come back to work, Emma cleared her diary and caught a flight to West Virginia. She had a bootstrap driver take her out to the radio observatory. She arrived at midnight. The National Radio Astronomy Observatory proved to be set in a leafy valley surrounded by forest-clad hills. In the cloudless October sky, a sliver of moon floated among the stars. As her eyes dark adapted, Emma made out a cluster of upturned dishes, each cluttered with spidery receiving equipment. The dishes seemed to glow, silver and white, as they peered up hopefully into an impenetrable, infinite sky. Occasionally, one of the dishes would move on its fragile-looking stand with a grind of heavy equipment at the obscure command of one of the observers in the low, cheap-looking buildings. She wondered how many of the researchers here were now working for bootstrap or for eschatology, in either case presumably funded by Malenfant's money. She was taken to a grassy area where half a dozen folding lawn chairs had been set up. Malenfant, Danny Stabo, and Cornelius Tain were working their way through a couple of six-packs. All of them were bundled up against the chill. Dan, crumpled and slightly drunk, looked as if he hadn't changed his T-shirt since Florida. Cornelius wasn't drinking. 
He was wearing his customary designer suit, neat and seamless. Somehow he seemed sealed off from this environment, green hills and silence and stately nature. Malenfant was pacing, restless, his footprints dark against the dew on the grass. She sighed. Malenfant, in this obsessive mood, took some management. Well, she'd expected this to take some time. She sat down gingerly on a spare chair and accepted a beer. I should have brought a heavier coat, Dan said sleepily. After the first six-pack, you don't notice the cold. So, what have you picked up from our silver-suited descendants? Cornelia shook his head. We didn't expect success so easily. We just had to eliminate the most obvious possibility. She glanced around. These are radio telescopes, right? You're expecting to pick up back-to-the-future messages by radio waves? We're trying to build a Feynman radio here, Emma, Dan said. Feynman? As in Richard Feynman? Malenfant was smiling. Turns out, he said, there's a loophole in the laws of physics. Cornelius held up his hands. Look, suppose you jiggle an atom to produce a radio wave. We have equations that tell us how the wave travels, but the equations always have two solutions. Two? Dan scratched his belly and yawned. Like taking a square root. Suppose you have a square lawn, nine square yards in area. How long is the side? Three yards, she said promptly, because three is root nine. Okay, but nine has another square root. Minus three, she said. I know, but that doesn't count. You can't have a lawn with a side of minus three yards. It makes no physical sense. Dan nodded. In the same way, the electromagnetism equations always have two solutions. One, like the positive root, describes the waves we're familiar with, traveling into the future, that arrive at a receiver after they left the transmitter. We call those retarded waves, but there's also another solution, like the negative root, describing waves arriving from the future, I suppose. Well, yes, what we call advanced waves. Cornelia said, It's perfectly good physics, Ms. Stoney. Many physical laws are time-symmetric. Run them forward, and you see an atom emitting a photon. Run them backward, and you see the photon hitting the atom. Which is where Feynman comes in, Dan said. Feynman supposed the outgoing radiation is absorbed by matter, gas clouds, out there in the universe. The gas is disturbed and gives off advanced waves of its own. The energy of all those little sources travels back in time to the receiver. And you get interference. One wave canceling another. All the secondary advanced waves cancel out the original advanced wave at the transmitter, and all their energy goes into the retarded wave. It's kind of beautiful, Malenfant said. You have to imagine all these ghostly wave echoes traveling backward and forward in time, perfectly synchronized, all working together to mimic an ordinary radio wave. Emma had an unwelcome image of atoms sparsely spread through some dark, dismal future, somehow emitting photons in a mysterious choreography, and those photons converging on Earth, gathering in strength until they fell to the ground here and now around her. The problem is, Cornelia said gently, Feynman's argument, if you think about it, rests on assumptions about the distribution of matter in the future of the universe. You have to suppose that every photon leaving our transmitters will be absorbed by matter somewhere, maybe in billions of years from now. But what if that isn't true? The universe isn't some cloud of gas. It's lumpy, and it's expanding, and it seems to be getting more transparent. We thought it was possible, Dan said, that not all the advanced waves cancel out perfectly, hence all this. We use the radio dishes here to send millisecond pulse microwave radiation into space. Then we vary the rig. We send out pulses into a dead-end absorber. And we monitor the power output. Remember, the advanced waves are supposed to contribute to the energy of the retarded wave by Feynman's theory. If the universe isn't a perfect absorber, then there would be a difference in the two cases, Emma said. Yeah. We ought to see a variation, a millisecond wiggle, when we beam into space, because the echo effect isn't perfect. And we hope to detect any message in those returning advanced echoes, 
if somebody downstream has figured out a way to modify them. We pick cloudless nights and we aim out of the plane of the galaxy so we miss everything we can see. We figure that only 1% of the power will be absorbed by the atmosphere and only 3% by the galaxy environment. The rest ought to make it, spreading out ever more thinly, to intergalactic space. Of course, Cornelia said, we can be sure that whatever message we do receive will be meaningful to us. He looked around. His skin seemed to glow in the starlight. I mean, to the four of us, personally, for they know we are sitting here planning this. Emma shivered again. And did you find anything? Not to a part in a billion, Cornelia said. There was silence, save for a distant wind rustling ink-black trees. Emma found she had been holding her breath. She let it out gently. Of course not, Emma. What did you expect? Crying shame, Danny Stabo said, and he reached for another beer. Of course, experiments like this have been run before. You can find them in the literature. Schmidt in 1980. Partridge. Newman a few years earlier. Always negative. Which is why, he said slowly, we're considering other options. What other options? Emma asked. We must use something else, Cornelia said. Something that isn't absorbed so easily as photons. A long, mean-free path length. Neutrinos. The spinning ghosts. Dan belched and took a pull at his beer. Nothing absorbs neutrinos. Emma frowned, only vaguely aware of what a neutrino was. So how do you make a neutrino transmitter? Is it expensive? Cornelius laughed. You could say that. He counted the waves on his hands. You set off a new Big Bang. You spark off a supernova explosion. You turn a massive nuclear power plant on and off. You create a high-energy collision and a particle accelerator. Mallon thought nodded. Emma, I was going to tell you. I need you to find me an accelerator. Enough, she thought. Emma stood and drew Malenfant aside. Malenfant, face it. You're being spun a line by Cornelius here, who has nothing to show you, nothing but shithead arguments based on weird statistics and games with techno toys. He's spinning some kind of schizoid web, and he's drawing you into it. It has to stop here before... If something goes wrong in the cockpit, he snapped, you don't give up. You try something else, and then another thing, again and again until you find something that works. Have a little faith, Emma. Emma opened her mouth, but he had already turned back to Danny Stabo. Now tell me how we detect these damn neutrons. Neutrinos, Malenfant. Cornelius leaned over to Emma. The Feynman stuff may seem spooky to you. It seems spooky to me. The idea of radio waves passing back and forth through time but it's actually fundamental to our reality. Why is there a direction to time at all? Why does the future feel different from the past? Some of us believe it's because the universe is not symmetrical. At one end there is the Big Bang, a point of infinite compression, and at the other there is the endless expansion, infinite dilution. They couldn't be more different. We can figure out the structure to the universe by making observations, expressing it in such terms. But what difference does it make to an electron? How does it know that the forward-in-time radio waves are the correct ones to emit? Maybe it's because of those back-in-time echoes. Perhaps an electron can tell where it is in time and which way it's facing. And that, how come the forward-in-time waves are the ones that make sense? All this is analogy and anthropomorphism. Of course, electrons don't know anything. I could say, more formally, that the Feynman theory provides a way for the boundary conditions of the universe to impose a selection effect on retarded waves, but that would just be blinding you with science. And we wouldn't want that, would we? He was smiling, his teeth white. He was toying with her, she realized. Malenfant and Estebo talked on, slightly drunk, eager. It seemed to Emma that their voices rose up into the sky, small and meaningless, and far above the stars wheeled, unconcerned. Bill Tybee, Tuesday Well, June, I had my meeting with Principal Bradfield. 
she's still determined she won't take Tom back. At least I found out a little more. Tom, well, he isn't the only one. The only super smart kid, I mean. There are three others they've identified at the school and a couple more they're suspicious about. That makes it a couple per thousand, and that's about right. It seems this is some kind of nationwide phenomenon, maybe global. But the numbers are uncertain. The kids are usually identified only when they get to school. The principal says they are disruptive. If you have one of them in a class, she gets bored and impatient and distracts everybody else. If there is more than one, they kind of hook up together and start doing their own projects, even using their own private language, the principal says, until you can't control them at all. And then there's the violence. The principal wasn't about to say so, but I got the impression some of the teachers aren't prepared to protect the kids properly. I asked the principal, why us? But she didn't have an answer. Nobody knows why these kids are emerging. Maybe some environmental thing, or something in the food, or some radiation effect that hit them in the womb. It's just chance it happened to be us. Anyhow, the school board is looking at some other solution for Tom. Maybe he'll have a teacher at home. We might even get an e-teacher, but I don't know how good they are. I did read in the paper there have been proposals for some kind of special schools just for the smart kids, but that wouldn't be local. Tom would have to board. Anyhow, I don't want Tom to be taken off to some special school, and I know you feel the same. I want him to be smart. I'm proud that he's smart. But I want him to be normal, just like other kids. I don't want him to be different. Tom wants me to download some of the stuff from his heart for you. Just a second. Emma Stoney Back in her Vegas office, Emma sat back and read through her latest submission to Mara Della. The antique treaties that govern space activities are examples of academic lawmaking. They were set down far in advance of any activity they were supposed to regulate. They certainly fail to address the legitimate needs of private corporations and individuals who might own space-related resources and or exploit them for profit. In fact, they are more political statements by the former Soviet Union and Third World nations than a workable set of legal rules. We believe the most appropriate action is therefore to get our ratification of the treaties revoked. There are precedents for this. Notably, when President Carter revoked the Panama Canal Treaty by an executive order. And to put it bluntly, since the United States signed these treaties with a single main competitor in mind, the Soviet Union, a competitor which no longer even exists, there is no reason to be morally bound by them. Malenfant was picking a fight by building his damned spaceship out in the desert, exposing it to the cameras and daring the bureaucrats and turf warriors and special interest groups to shut him down. That boldness had carried him a long way. But Emma suspected that Malenfant had had an easy ride so far. The bureaucratic infighting had barely begun. Emma, with a team of specialist lawyers mostly based in New York and with backing from Mara and other friends in Washington, was trying to clear away the regulatory issues that could ground Malenfant's BDBs just as surely as a blow-up on the pad. Space activities were regulated internationally by various treaties that dated back to the Stone Age of spaceflight, days when only governments operated spacecraft, treaties drafted in the shadow of the Cold War. But the mass of badly drafted legislation and treaties gave rise to anomalies and contradictions. Consider tort liabilities, for instance. If Malenfant had been operating an airline and one of his planes crashed on Mexico, then he would be responsible and his insurance would have to soak up the damages and lawsuits. But under the terms of a 1972 Space Liability Convention, if Malenfant's BDB crashed, the U.S. government itself would be liable. Another problem area was the issue of certification of airworthiness, or maybe spaceworthiness, of Malenfant's BDBs. Every aircraft that crossed an international border was supposed to carry a certificate of airworthiness from its country of registry, a certificate of manufacture and a cargo manifest. So was a BDB an air vehicle? Federal aviation regulations actually contained no provisions for certifying a space vehicle. 
When she dug into the records, she'd found that the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, had dodged the issue regarding the space shuttle when, in 1977, it had ruled that the shuttle orbiter was not an aircraft, despite being a winged vehicle that glided home. It was a mess of conflicting and unreasonable regulations at national and international levels. Maybe it was going to take a bull-headed operator like Malenfant to break through this thicket. And all that just concerned the operation of a private spacecraft. When Malenfant reached his asteroid, there would be a whole different set of problems to tackle. Malenfant didn't want to own the asteroid. He just wanted to make money out of it. But it wasn't clear how he could do even that. Malenfant was arguing for a system that could enforce private property rights on the asteroid. The Patent and Property Registry of a powerful nation, specifically the United States, would be sufficient. The claims would be enforceable internationally by having the U.S. Customs Office penalize any import that was made to the United States in defiance of such a claim. This mechanism wouldn't depend on the United States or anybody else actually claiming sovereignty over the rock. There was actually a precedent. The opening up of Trans-Appalachian America in the 17th century, long before any settler got there, under a system of British Crown land patents. But the issue was complex, disputatious, drowned in ambiguous and conflicting laws and treaties. Unutterably wearying. She got up from her desk and poured herself a shot of tequila, a particular weakness since her college days. The harsh liquid seemed to explode at the back of her throat. End of side two. 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 Side three. Time. By Stephen Baxter. Continuing on page sixty six. Did she actually believe all this? Did she think it was right? Did the United States have the moral authority unilaterally to hand out off-world exploitation charters to people like Malenfant? The precedents weren't encouraging. For instance, the British Empire's authorization of brutal capitalists like Cecil Rhodes had led to such twentieth-century horrors as apartheid. And there was, of course, the uncomfortable fact that the upkeep and defense of the British Empire, though admirably profitable for some decades, had ultimately bankrupted its home country, a detail Malenfant generally omitted to mention in his pet talks to investors and politicians. Meanwhile, like a hobby for her spare time, she was, somewhat more reluctantly, pursuing Malenfant's other current obsession, Find Me an Accelerator. With glass in hand, she tapped at her soft screen, searching for updates from her assistants and data miners. A candidate particle physics laboratory had quickly emerged, Fermi Lab, outside Chicago, where Malenfant had a drinking buddy relationship with the director. So Emma started to assemble applications for experiment time. Immediately she had found herself coming up against powerful resistance from the researchers already working at Fermi Lab, who saw the wellspring of their careers being diverted by outsiders. She tried to make progress through the university's research association, a consortium of universities in the United States and overseas, but she met more obstruction and resistance. She had to fly to Washington to testify before a sub-panel of something called the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel of the Department of Energy, which had links into the president's science advisor. The problem was that the facilities and experiments required giant sums of money. The physicists were still smarting from the cancellation by Congress in the 1990s of the superconducting super collider, a 53-mile tunnel of magnets and particle beams that would have been built under a cotton field in Ellis County, Texas, and would have cost as much as a small space station. And in spite of all the megabucks spent, there didn't seem to have been a fundamental breakthrough in the field for some decades. Well, the news today, she learned now, 
was that the approval for the family lab runs had come through. It wasn't a surprise. She had found the physicists intelligent, prone to outrage, but also politically naive and easily outmaneuvered. She sat back thinking. The question was what she should do with this news. She decided to sit on it for now, trying to squeeze a little more productivity out of Malenfant. Because when she told Malenfant they'd won, he would take the first plane to Chicago, and she had a lot of issues to discuss with him. Such as the pressure Cornelius was applying for Bootstrap to get involved with another of eschatology's pet projects, the Milton Foundation. The foundation was a reaction to the super-smart children who seemed to be sprouting like weeds across the planet. The foundation was proposing to contact these kids to make sure their special needs were met and to try to ensure they got the opportunities they needed to exercise their abilities. No potential Einsteins doomed to waste their brief lives toiling in fields. No putative Picassos blown apart in mindless wars. No more mute and glorious Miltons. Everyone would benefit, the kids themselves, their families, and the human race as a whole, with this bright new intellectual resource to call on. That was the prospectus, and it had sold easily to Malenfant. It fit in with his view that the future needed to be managed, ideally by Reed Malenfant. But it was worrying for Emma on a number of levels. Here was a report, for example, on some kid who'd turned up in Zambia, southern Africa, he seemed the brightest of all, according to some globally applied assessment rating. But did that make it right to take him out and dump him in some school, maybe on another continent? What could a kid like that, or even his parents, possibly know about getting involved with a powerful, amorphous Western entity like eschatology? And besides, what really lay behind this strange phenomenon of super-smart children? Could it really be some kind of unusually benign environmental change effect, as the experts seemed to be saying? Her instinct, if she felt she wasn't in control of some aspect of the business, was always to go see for herself. She had to get out there and see for herself how all this worked, just once. The Zambia case, the first in Africa, might be just the excuse. Of course, it could be the tequila doing her thinking for her. Africa. Jesus. She poured another shot. The journey was grueling, a hop over the Atlantic to England and then an interminable overnighter south across Europe, the Mediterranean, and the dense heart of Africa. She flew into Harare, Zimbabwe. Then she had to take a short internal flight to Victoria Falls, the small tourist-choked town on the Zimbabwe side of the falls themselves. At her hotel, she slept for twelve hours. The next morning, a bootstrap driver took her across the falls, through a comic opera immigration checkpoint, and into Zambia. The man she had come to meet was waiting at the checkpoint. He was the teacher who had reported the boy to the Milton Foundation. He came forward hesitantly, holding out his hand. Miss Stoney, I'm Steph Younger. He was small, portly, dressed in a kind of loose safari style, baggy shirt and shorts fitted with deep, bulging pockets. He couldn't have been older than thirty. He was prematurely balding, and his scalp, burned pink by the winter sun, was speckled with sweat. He was obviously Southern African, probably from Zimbabwe or South Africa itself. His elaborate accent, forever linked to a nightmare past, made her skin prickle. But there were blue chalk dust stains on his shirt, she noticed, the badge of the teacher since time immemorial, and she warmed to him just a little. They got back in the car and drove away from the falls. Africa was flat and still and dusty, eroded smooth by time, apparently untouched by the twenty-first century. The only verticals were the trees and the skinny people, moving slowly through the harsh light. They reached the town of Livingston. She could discern the remnants of Art Deco style in the closed-up banks and factories and even a cinema, now sun-bleached and washed out to a uniform sand color, all of it marred by ubiquitous Schick Cola ads. Younger gave her a little tourist grounding. This remained a place of grinding poverty. Misguided aid efforts had flooded the area with cheap western clothes, and local crooks had used them to undercut and wipe out the textile factories that had once kept everyone employed. Now the unemployment here ran at 80% of adults. 
and there was no kind of welfare safety net. If you didn't have a relative who worked somewhere, you found some other way to live. Younger pointed. Look at that. At the side of the road there was a baboon squatting on the rim of a rusty trash can. He held himself there effortlessly with his back feet while he dug with his forearms into the trash. Emma was stunned. She'd never been so close to a non-human primate before, not outside a zoo, anyhow. The baboon was the size of a ten-year-old boy, lean and gray and obviously ferociously strong, eyes sharp and intelligent, so much more human than she might have thought. Younger grinned. He's looking for plastic bags. He knows that's where he will find food. Tourists think he's cute. But get him food and he'll be back tomorrow. Smart, see? Smart as a human. But he doesn't think. What does that mean? He doesn't understand death. You see the females carrying around dead infants, sometimes for days, trying to feed them. Maybe they're grieving. Nah. Younger wound down his window and raised his fist. The baboon's head snapped around, sizing up Younger with a sharp, tense glance. Then he left off the trash can rim and loped away. Away from the town, the road stretched, black and unmarked, across a flat, dry landscape. The trees were sparse, and in many instances smashed over, as if by some great storm. There was little scrub growing between the trees, but everywhere the land was shaped by tracks, the footsteps of animals and birds overlaid in the white Kalahari sands. The tracks of elephants were great craters bigger than dinner plates, and where the ground was firm she could see the print left by the tough cracked skin of an elephant's sole, a spidery map as distinctive as a fingerprint. Emma was a city girl, and she was struck by the self-evident organization of the landscape here, the way the various species, in some cases separated genetically by hundreds of millions of years, worked together to maintain a stable environment for them all. Control, stability, organization, all without an organizing mind, without a proboscidean Reed Malenfant to plan the future for them. But this, she thought, was the past, for better or worse. Now mind was here, and had taken control. It was mind, not blind evolution, that would shape this landscape and the whole of the planet in the future. Maybe there is a lesson for us all, she thought. Damned if I know what it is. At length, driving through the bush, she saw elephants. They moved through the trees, liquid, graceful, and silent, like dark clouds gliding over the earth, shapers of this landscape. With untrained eyes, she saw only impressionistic flashes, a gleam of tusks, a curling trunk, and unmistakable morphology. The elephants were myths of childhood and picture books and zoo visits, miraculously preserved in a world growing over with concrete and plastic and waste. They came at last to a village. The car stopped, and they climbed out. Younger spread his hands. Welcome to Nakatindi. Huts of dirt and grass clustered to either side of the road and spread away to the flat distance. Nervous and embarrassed at herself for feeling so, Emma glanced back at the car. The driver had wound up and opaqued the windows. She could see him lying back, insulated from Africa in his air-conditioned bubble, his eyes closed, synth music playing. As soon as she walked off the dusty hardtop road, she was surrounded by kids, stick-thin and bright as buttons. They were dressed in ancient western clothes, t-shirts and shorts, mostly too big, indescribably worn and dirty, evidently handed down through grubby generations. The kids pushed at each other, tangles of flashing limbs competing for her attention, miming cameras. Snap me! Snap me alone! They thought she was a tourist. The dominant color as she walked into the village was a kind of golden brown. The village was constructed on the flat Kalahari sand that covered the area for a hundred miles around. But the sand here was marked only by human footprints and was pitted with debris, scraps of metal, and wood. The sky was a washed-out blue dome, huge and empty, and the sun was directly overhead, beating at her scalp. There were no shadows here, little contrast. She had a renewed sense of age, of everything worn flat by time. There were pieces of cars scattered everywhere. She saw busted-off car doors used like garden gates, hubcaps beaten crudely into bowls. Two of the kids were playing with a kind of skateboard, just a strip of wood towed along by a wire loop. 
The wheels of the board were, she recognized with a shock, sawn off lengths of car exhaust. Gunger explained that a few years ago some wrecks had been abandoned a mile or so away. The villagers had towed them into town and scavenged them until there was nothing left. You'll mostly see men here today, men and boys. It's Sunday, so some of the men will be drunk. The women and girls are off in the bush. They gather wild fruit, nuts, berries, that kind of stuff. There was no sanitation here, no sewage system. The people, women and girls, carried their water from a communal standpipe and yellowed plastic bowls and bottles. For their toilet, they went into the bush. There was nothing made of metal, as far as she could see, save for the scavenged automobile parts and a few tools. Not even any education, save for the underfunded efforts of gone tomorrow volunteers like Younger. Younger eyed her. These people are basically hunter-gatherers. A hundred and fifty years ago, they were living late Stone Age lives in the bush. Now hunting is illegal, and so this. Why don't they return to the bush? Would you? They reached Younger's hut. He grinned, self-deprecating. Home sweet home. The hut was built to the same standard as the rest, but Emma could see within it an inflatable mattress, what looked like a water purifier, a soft screen with a modem and an inflatable satellite dish, a few toiletries. I allow myself a few luxuries, Younger said. It's not just indulgence. It's a question of status. She frowned. I'm not here to judge you. No. Fine. Younger's mood seemed complex, part apologetic for the conditions here, part a certain pride, as if of ownership. Look at the good I'm doing here. Depressed, Emma wondered whether, even if places of poverty and deprivation did not exist, it would be necessary to invent them to give mixed-up people like Younger a purpose to their limited lives. Or maybe that was too cynical. He was, after all, here. A girl came out of the hut's shadows. She looked no more than ten, shoulder high, thin as a rake in her grubby brown dress. She was carrying a bowl of dirty water. She seemed scared by Emma, and she shrank back. Emma forced herself to smile. Younger beckoned and spoke to the girl softly. This is Mindy, he told Emma, my little helper. Thirteen years of age, older than she looks, as you can see. She keeps me from being a complete slob. He laid his soft hand on the girl's thin shoulder. She didn't react. When he let her go, she hurried away, carrying the bowl on her head. Come see the star of the show. Younger beckoned, and she followed him into the shadows of the little hut. Out of the glaring flat sunlight, it took a few seconds for her eyes to adjust to the dark. She heard the boy before she saw him, soft breathing, slow, dusty movements, the rustle of cloth on skin. He seemed to be lying on his belly on the floor. His face was illuminated by a dim yellow glow that came from a small flashlight propped up in the dust. His eyes were huge. They seemed to drink in a flashlight light, unblinking. He's called Michael, Younger said. How old is he? Eight, nine. Emma found herself whispering. What's he doing? Younger shrugged. Trying to see photons. I noticed him when he was very young, five or six. He would stand in the dust and whirl around, watching his arms and clothes being pulled outwards. I'd seen kids with habits like that before. You see them focusing on the swish of a piece of cloth, or the flicker of light in the trees. Mildly autistic, probably, unable to make sense of the world, and so finding comfort in small, predictable details. Michael seemed a bit like that, but he said something strange. He said he liked to feel the stars pulling him around. She frowned. I don't understand. I had to look it up. It's called Mach's Principle. How does Michael know if he is spinning around or if the universe is all spinning around him? She thought about it. Because he can feel the centripetal forces? Ah, but you can prove that a rotating universe, a huge matter current flowing around him, would exert exactly the same force. It's actually a deep result of general relativity. My God, and he was figuring this out when he was five? He couldn't express it, but yes, he was figuring it out. He seems to have in his head, as intuition, some of the great principles the physicists have battled to express for centuries. 
And now he's trying to see a photon? Younger smiled. He asked me what would happen if he shone his flashlight up in the air. Would the beam just keep on spreading thinner and thinner all the way to the moon? But he already knew the answer, or rather, he somehow intuited it. The beam fragments into photons. Yes, he called them light bits, until I taught him the physics term. He seems to have a sense of the discreteness of things. If you could see photons one at a time, you'd see a kind of irregular flickering, all the same brightness, photons, particles of light, arriving at your eye one after another. That's what he hopes to see. And will he? Unlikely, Younger smiled. He'd need to be a few thousand miles away, and he'd need a photomultiplier to pick up those photons. At least I think he would. He looked at her uneasily. I have some trouble keeping up with him. He's taken the simple math and physics I've been able to give him and taken them to places I never dreamed of. For instance, he seems to have deduced special relativity, too. From first principles. How? Younger shrugged. If you have the physical insight, all you need is Pythagoras' theorem. And Michael figured out his own proof of that two years ago. The boy played with his flashlight, obsessive, and speaking, ignoring the adults. She walked out into the sunshine, which was dazzling. Michael followed her out. In the bright light, she noticed that Michael had a mark on his forehead, a perfect blue circle. What's that? A tribe mark? No, Younger shrugged. It's only chalk. He does it himself. He renews it every day. What does it mean? But Younger had no answer. She told Younger she would return the following day with tests, and maybe she should meet Michael's parents, discuss release forms and the compensation and conditions the Foundation offered. But Younger said the boy's parents were dead. It ought to make the release easier, he said cheerfully. She held up her hand to the boy in farewell. His eyes widened as he stared at her hand. Then he started to babble excitedly to Younger, plucking his sleeve. "'What is it?' she asked. "'What's wrong?' "'It's the gold. The gold ring on your hand. He's never seen gold before. Heavy atoms, he says.' She had an impulse to give the boy the ring. After all, it was only a token of her failed marriage to Malenfant and meant little to her. Younger noticed her dilemma. "'Don't offer him anything. Gifts. Money. A lot of people come here and try to give the shirt off their backs. Guilt. I guess. But you give one money, they all want it. They have no ambition, these fellows. They sit around with their beer and their four wives. They're happy in their way. She remembered that Younger had talked about the baboon and the trash in exactly the same tone of voice. Mindy, the slim girl child, now returned, carrying a plastic bowl of fresh water. She looked anxiously to Younger and would not meet Emma's eyes. If she was thirteen, Emma thought, the girl was of marriageable age here. Maybe Steph Younger was finding more compensation in his life here than mere altruism. It was a relief to climb into the car to sip cool water and brush ten-million-year-old Kalahari dust out of her hair. That night she had trouble sleeping. She couldn't get the image of those bright-buttoned village kids out of her head. Mute and glorious Miltons, indeed. On the way here, Emma had done some more digging into the Milton Foundation. Milton turned out to be a shadowy coalition of commercial, philanthropic, and religious groups, particularly Christian. The Foundation was international, and its schools had been set up in many countries, including the United States. The children were in general separated from their families and homes and spirited away to a school perhaps half a world away. In fact, so some journalists alleged, children were being moved from school to school, even between countries, making monitoring even more difficult. Not everybody welcomed the arrival of a school full of children labeled as geniuses. Nobody likes a smartass. In some places, the schools and children had actually come under physical attack, and there were rumors of one murder. The foundation, she had learned, spent a remarkable amount of its money on security and almost as much on public relations. And there were darker stories, still, of what went on inside the schools. Emma's doubts about associating Bootstrap with the initiative continued to grow, but she knew that until she came up with a stronger case for pulling back, she was going to be overruled by Malenfant himself. 
She wished she understood Cornelius and his shadowy associates better. She didn't yet grasp how this program fitted in with eschatology's wider agenda. The end of the world, messages from the future. She had the intuition that what they were seeking wasn't just smart children, but something much more strange. And she wondered if that was exactly what she had found here in Africa. She stepped onto her balcony. Looking up at the stars, Michael's stars, she could tell she was far from home. She recognized Ursa Major, but the familiar childhood panhandle shape was upside down, and its pointer stars were pointing below the horizon. And when the moon rose, it climbed straight up into the sky, heading for a point somewhere over her head. Not only that, it was tipped up sideways. The man in the moon's forehead was pointing north. But it wasn't the moon that was tipped. It was herself. She had flown around the belly of the planet, which was thereby proven to be round. It was a startling thought. I should travel more, she thought. How was it possible for a kid on the fringe of the African bush to figure out so much fundamental physics? If she and Malenfant had had kids, she supposed, she might have a better instinct on how to handle the situation. But they hadn't, and the whole world of children, damaged or superintelligent or otherwise, was a mystery to her. On a whim, she unfolded her soft screen and looked up the properties of gold. She learned that relativistic effects, the strange and subtle effects of very high speeds and energies, determined the color of gold. In light elements, electrons orbited the nuclei of atoms at a few hundred miles per second, fast but only a few percent of the speed of light. But in elements with massive nuclei, like uranium, lead, or gold, the electrons were dragged around at a large fraction of the speed of light, and relativity effects became important. Most metals had a silvery luster, but not gold, and that was because of the strange high-speed phenomenon Michael seemed intuitively to understand. Relativity, time dilation effects, operating deep within the gold atoms themselves. She took off her ring and put it on the balcony before her. The stars were reflected in its scuffed surface. She wondered what Michael had seen as he stared into her ring. When she got back to the States, she discovered that Malenfant had found out about the accelerator project clearances and had holed himself up at Fermi Lab, where Danny Stabo claimed almost immediately to have results. She flew straight on to Illinois. New York Times From an unpromising grade school in a run-down neighborhood at the heart of New York City has come what may prove to be the most striking example yet of the recent wave of brilliant children. Background A group of children here, average age just eight, seem to have come up with a proof of a mathematical statement called the Riemann Hypothesis. This is concerned with the distribution of prime numbers. Click for detail. The hypothesis is something that generations of professional mathematicians have failed to crack, and yet it is opened up to a bunch of children in a few weeks of their working together at the school in their lunch breaks. The result has electrified, terrified, astonished, according to temperament. The children at this New York school may be the first to attract serious attention from the academic and business communities and the federal government as a potential national resource. They have also become the first to require round-the-clock armed guards. The news of this obscure mathematical result has crystallized the fear some people seem to be forming over these super kids. Police were forced to head off a mob that marched out to the school, angry, scared, evidently with ugly intent. A mob that had even included some of the parents and older brothers and sisters of the children themselves. Emma Stoney. Fermi Lab turned out to be 35 miles west of Chicago, close to a town called Batavia. From the air, Illinois was a vast emptiness studied by lost-looking little towns. Disoriented, jet-lagged, she glimpsed Fermi Lab itself, the perfect circle of the collider ring set amid green tall grass prairie, presumably replanted. She wasn't sure what she had expected of a super science lab like this. 
something futuristic, maybe, a city of glass and platinum where steely-eyed men in white suits made careful notes on super-advanced soft screens. What she found was an oddly park-like campus littered by giant constructions like the abandoned toys of some monster child. This artificial landscape, the huge constructions, made a startling contrast with the bare bleakness of Africa. But the concrete was cracked and streaked with rust and mold. This was an aging, underfunded place, she thought, a lingering dream of a more expansive age. But here and there she saw the sleek, cool curves of the Treviton itself, a three-mile-wide torus within which subatomic particles were accelerated to a substantial fraction of the speed of light. The main hall was called Wilson Hall, a surreal sixteen-story sculpture of two towers connected by crisscrossing bridges. Inside, there was a gigantic atrium stocked with trees and shrubs. Malenfant was waiting for her there. There were black stress rings around his eyes, but he was agitated, excited. What do you think? Quite a place. It's a technocrat's wet dream. They rebuilt the prairie afterward, you know. They even have a herd of buffalo here. We're not here for the buffalo, Malenfant. Shall we get this over with? He grinned. Wait until you see what we got here, babe. He led her deeper into the complex and into the cramped and jumbled technical areas. She found herself squirming past gigantic, unrecognizable pieces of apparatus. There were steel racks everywhere, crammed with badly packed electronic instrumentation and cable bunches over the floor, walls, and ceilings. In some places, the cables were bridged by little wooden ladders. There was a smell of oil, shaved metal, cut wood, cleaning solvents, and insulation, all overlaid by a constant clamoring metallic noise. There was none of the controlled cool and order she'd expected. Malenfant brought her to what he called the Muon Laboratory. This was some way away from the accelerator ring itself. It seemed that beams of high-speed protons were drawn off from the ring and impacted into targets here. And here they found Danny Stabo, wearing a smeared white coat over a disreputable T-shirt hunched over soft screens spread out on a trestle table. The screens were covered with particle decay images and charts of counts, none of which Emma could understand. Dan's broad face split into a grin. Yo, Emma, have you heard? One step at a time, Malenfant said. Tell her what you're doing here, Dan. Dan took a breath. Making neutrinos. We're slamming the Tevatron's protons into a target to make pions. Pions? A pion is a particle, a combination of a quark and its antiquark, and it is unstable. Pions decay into, among other things, neutrinos. So we have our neutrino source. But it should also be a source of advanced neutrinos, neutrinos coming from the future, arriving in time to make our pions decay. Backward ripples, Emma said. Exactly. Hopefully modified and containing some signal. How do you detect a neutrino? Malenfant grunted. It isn't easy. Neutrinos are useful to us in the first place because matter is all but transparent to them. But we have a full-scale neutrino detector a ton of dense photographic emulsion, the stuff you use on a camera film. When charged particles travel through this ship, they leave a trail, like a jet contrail. I thought neutrinos had no charge. They don't, Dan said patiently. So what you have to look for is a place where tracks come out, but none go in. That's where a Tevatron neutrino has hit some particle in our emulsion. You get it? You have a mass of counters and magnets downstream of the emulsion, and you measure the photons with a 20-ton lead-glass detector array, and the results are stored on laser disks and analyzed by the data acquisition software. He talked on, lapsing continually into jargon she couldn't follow. But then they started talking about the neutrinos themselves. Neutrinos, it seemed, barely existed. No charge, no mass, just a scrap of energy with some kind of spooky quantum mechanical spin fleeing at the speed of light. Spinning ghosts, indeed. Most of them had come out of the Big Bang, or the time just after, when the whole universe was a soup of hot subatomic particles. But neutrinos didn't decay into anything else, and so there were neutrinos everywhere. All her life... She would be immersed in a sea of neutrinos, a billion of them for every particle of ordinary matter, relics of that first millisecond. At that thought, 
She felt an odd tingle, as if she could feel the ancient, invisible fluid that poured through her. Now humans had sent waves rippling over the surface of that transparent ocean, and the waves, it seemed, had come reflecting back. Dan talked fast, as excited as she'd ever seen him. Malenfant watched, rigid with interest. Essentially, we've been producing millisecond neutrino pulses, Dan said. He produced a bar chart, a scrappy series of pillars, uneven in height. Anyhow, up until yesterday, we were just picking up our own pulses, unmodified. Then, this. A new bar chart showing a long series of many pulses. Some of the pulses now seemed to be missing or were much reduced in size. Dan picked out the gaps with a fat finger. See? On average, these events seem to have around half the neutrino count of the others. So, half the energy. He looked at Emma, trying to see if she understood. This is exactly what we'd expect if somebody downstream has some way of suppressing the advanced wave neutrinos. The apparent retarded neutrinos, then, would have only half the strength. But it's such a small effect, Emma said. You said yourself neutrinos are hard to detect. There must be other ways to explain this without invoking beings from the future. That's true, Dan said. Though if this sustains itself long enough, we're going to be able to eliminate other causes. Anyhow, that's not all. We have enough data now to show that the gaps repeat in a pattern. This is new to me, Malenfant growled. A repeating pattern? A signal? Dan rubbed his greasy hair. I don't see what else it could be. A signal, Malenfant said. Damn, then Cornelius was right. Emma felt cold, despite the metallic stuffiness of the chamber. Dan produced a simplified summary of several periods of the pattern, a string of black circles and white circles. Look at this. The blacks are full-strength pulses, the whites half-strength. You get a string of six white, then a break of two black, then an irregular pattern for twelve pulses, then two black, six white, and a break, then another string of twelve framed by the two black and six white combination. I think we're seeing delimiters around these two strings of twelve pulses, and this is what repeats over and over. Sometimes there are minor differences, but we think that's caused by the experimental uncertainty. If it's a signal, Malenfant said, what does it mean? Binary numbers, Emma replied. The signals are binary numbers. They both turned to her. Malenfant asked, huh? Binary numbers? Why? She smiled, exhausted, jet-lagged, disoriented. Because signals like this always are. Dan was nodding. Yes, right. I should have thought of that. We have to learn to think like Cornelius. The downstreamers know us. Maybe they are us, our future selves. And they know we'll expect binary. He grabbed a pad and scribbled out two strings of one and zero. One 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 zero one zero one zero one zero zero one zero one 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 zero 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 one zero. He sat back. There. Malenfant squinted. What's it supposed to be? Emma found herself laughing. Maybe it's a Carl Sagan picture, a waving downstreamer. Shut up, Emma. No. Dan said. It's too simple for that. They have to be numbers. He cleared his soft screen and began tapping in a simple conversion program. After a couple of minutes, he had it running. 3753-1986. They stared. Malenfant asked, What do they mean? Dan began to feed the raw neutrino counts through his conversion program and the converted signals live as they were received in the film emulsion detector, scrolled steadily up the screen. 1986-3753-1986-3753-1986. Someone should call Cornelius, Dan said. Emma didn't share Malenfant's evident glee at this result. She felt dwarfed. She imagined the world wheeling around her, spinning as it carried her through darkness around the sun, around the rim of the galaxy, while the galaxy itself sailed off to its own remote destination, stars glimmering like the windows of a great ocean liner. Messages from the future. 
Could it be that there were beings far beyond this place and time trying to signal to the past, to her, through this lashed-up physics equipment? Was Cornelius right? Right about everything? Right to her about the Carter catastrophe, the coming extinction of them all? It couldn't be true. It was insanity, an infection of schizophrenia from Cornelius that was damaging them all. Malenfant, of course, was hooked. She knew him well enough to understand he would be unable to resist this new adventure wherever it took him. And how, she wondered, was she going to be able to persuade him to do any work at all after this? 3753-1986-3753-1986 Read Malenfant the puzzle of the Feynman radio message nagged at Malenfant, even as he threw himself into his myriad other projects. He could write out the numbers on a pad or have them scroll up on a soft screen. He tried taking the numbers apart, fractorizing them, multiplying them, dividing them one by the other. He got nowhere. Cornelius Taine was equally frustrated. He would call Malenfant at odd time-zoned hours. Mathematics, even numerology, must be the wrong approach. Why? What do you know about math, Malenfant? Remember the nature of the signal we're dealing with here. Remember that the downstreamers are trying to communicate with us, specifically with you. Me? Yes. You're the decision-maker here. There has to be some simple meaning in these numbers for you. Just look at the number, Cornelius urged. Don't think too hard. What do they look like? One, nine, eight, six, three, seven, five, three... Hmm. One nine eight six could be a date. A date? It had been the year of Challenger and Chernobyl, a first overseas posting of a young pilot named Reed Malenfant. It wasn't the happiest year in history, but nothing so special for me. Hey, Cornelius, could three seven five three also represent a date? His skin prickled. The thirty-eighth century. Christ, Cornelius, maybe that's the true date of the Carter catastrophe. Cornelius's soft screen image slightly blurred, showing him frowning. It's possible, but any date after a couple of centuries is very unlikely. Anything else? No. Keep thinking, Cornelius. Yes. And Malenfant would roll up the soft screen and return to his work or try to sleep. Until the day came when Cornelius, in person, burst into a BDD Project Progress meeting. It was an airless porta cabin at the Mojave test site. Malenfant was with George Hench, poring over test results and subcontractor sign-offs. And suddenly there was Cornelius, hot, disheveled, pink with sunburn, tie knot loosened, white gypsum clinging to the fabric of his suit pants. Malenfant couldn't keep from laughing. Cornelius, at last I've seen you out of control. Cornelius was panting. I have it. The numbers. The Feynman numbers. I figured it out, Malenfant, and it changes everything. Despite the heat of the day, Malenfant felt goosebumps rise on his bare arms. He made Cornelius sit down, take his jacket off, drink some water. Cornelius brusquely cleared clutter from the tabletop, battered soft screens, quality forms, a progress chart labeled with bars and arrows, old-fashioned paper blueprints, sandwich wrappers, and beer cans, and he spread his own soft screen over the desk. It was staring us in the face the whole time, Cornelius said. I knew it had to be connected to you, Malenfant, to your interests, your obsessions even, and it had to be something you could act on now. And what... He waved a hand. Could be a grander obsession than this, your asteroid mission. George Hench paced around the room, visibly unhappy. Cornelius glanced up at George. Look, I'm sorry to disrupt your work. George glared. Malenfant, do we have to put up with this bull? Whatever it is, it ain't bull, George. I've seen the setup. Malenfant, I spent my career fending off hand-waving artistes like this guy. Color coordinators. Feng Shui artists. Even astrologers, for Christ's sake. Sometimes I think the U.S. is going back to the Middle Ages. Malenfant said gently, George, there was no U.S. in the Middle Ages. 
Mallon thought we have a job to do here. A big job. We're going to a fucking asteroid. All I'm saying is you need to focus on what's important here. I accept that, George. But I have to tell you, I've come to believe there's nothing so important as the downstreamer's message. If it's real. Oh, it's real, Cornelia said fervently. And what it means is that you're going to have to redirect your mission. Cornelia sighed George. Away from Rhinemuth. George visibly bristled. Now you listen to me. Malenfant held up a hand. Let's hear him out, George. Cornelius tapped at his soft screen. When I began to wonder if the numbers referred to an asteroid, I thought 1986 might be a discovery date. So I logged on to the Minor Planet Center in Massachusetts. A table of numbers and letters scrolled down the screen. The first column of four digits and two letters all began with 1986. This is a list of all the asteroids first reported in 1986. This first code is a provisional designation. What do the letters mean? The first shows the half month when the asteroid was discovered. The second is the order of discovery in that half month. So 1986 AA is the first asteroid to be discovered in the first half of January 1986. Malenfant eyed the numbers with dismay. Shit, there must be dozens just for 1986. More in later years, asteroid watches have gotten better. So which one is ours? Cornelius smiled and pointed to the second column. As soon as enough observations have been accumulated to determine the asteroid's orbit, it is given an official designation, a permanent number, and sometimes a name. The official numbers Malenfant saw with growing excitement were in the range 3,700 to 3,800. Cornelius scrolled down until he came to a highlighted line. 1986TO37530.4800 one point five one two zero point zero eight nine. The key numbers jumped out at Malenfant. Nineteen eighty six. Thirty seven fifty three. Holy shit, he said. It's there. It's real. Not only that, Cornelia said. This little baby, nineteen eighty six TO, is like no other asteroid in the solar system. How so? Cornelia smiled. It's Earth's second moon, and nobody knows how it got there. George Hench stomped out to go bend some tin, glaring at Cornelius as he did so. Cornelius, unperturbed, called up more soft screen data and told Malenfant what little was known about asteroid number 3753. It's not in the main belt. In fact, it's a near-Earth object, like Rhinemuth. What the astronomers call an Aten. Malenfant nodded. So its orbit mostly lies inside Earth's. It was discovered in Australia, part of a routine sky watch run out of the Siding Springs Observatory. Nobody's done any careful spectral studies or radar studies, but we think it's a C-type. A carbonaceous chondrite, not nickel iron like Rhinemuth. Water, ice, carbon compounds. It's probably wandered in from the outer belt, far enough from the sun, that it was able to keep its volatile ices and organics, or else it's a comet core. Either way, we're looking at debris left over since the formation of the solar system, unimaginably ancient. How big is it? Nobody knows for sure. Three miles wide is the best guess. Does this thing have a name? Cornelia smiled. Cruthney, an ancient Irish name. The ancestor of the Picts. Malenfant was baffled. What does that have to do with Australia? It could have been worse. There were asteroids named after spouses, pets, rock stars. The orbit of Kruthni is what made it worth naming. Cornelius pointed to numbers. These figures show the asteroid's perihelion, aphelion eccentricity. Asteroid 3753 orbited the sun in a little less than an Earth year. But it did not follow a simple circular path like Earth. Instead, it swooped in beyond the orbit of Venus, out farther than Mars. And, Cornelius said, it has an inclined orbit. Cornelius' diagrams showed 3753's orbit as a jaunty ellipse, tipped up from the elliptic. 
the main solar system plane, like Frank Sinatra's hat. Malenfant considered this looping, out-of-plane trajectory. So what makes it a moon of the Earth? Not a moon, exactly. Call it a companion. The point is, its orbit is locked to Earth's. A team of Canadian astronomers figured this out in 1997. Watch. Cornelius produced a display showing the orbits of Earth and Kruthni from a point of view above the solar system. Earth, a blue dot, sailed evenly around the sun on its almost circular orbit. By comparison, Kruthni swooped back and forth like a bird. Suppose we follow the Earth. Then you can see how Kruthni moves in relation. The blue dot slowed and stayed in place. Malenfant imagined the whole image circling, one revolution for every Earth year. Relative to the Earth, Kruthni swooped toward Venus, inside Earth's orbit, and rushed ahead of Earth. But then it would sail out past Earth's orbit, reaching almost to Mars and slow, allowing Earth to catch up. Compared to Earth, it traced out a kind of kidney bean path, a fat, distorted ellipse sandwiched between the orbits of Mars and Venus. In the next year, Kruthni retraced the kidney bean, but not quite. The second bean was placed slightly ahead of the first. Overall, Cornelia said, 3753 is going faster than the Earth around the sun, so it spirals ahead of us year on year. He let the images run for a while. Kruthni's orbit was a compound of the two motions, Every year the asteroid traced out its kidney bean, and over the years the bean worked its way along Earth's orbit, tracing out a spiral around the sun counterclockwise. Now what's interesting is what happens when the kidney bean approaches Earth again. The traced out bean worked its way slowly toward the blue dot. The bean seemed to touch the Earth. Malenfant expected it to continue its spiraling around the sun. It didn't. The kidney bean started to spiral in the opposite direction, clockwise, back the way it had come. Cornelius was grinning. Isn't it beautiful? You see, there are resonances between Kruthni's orbit and Earth's. When it comes closest, Earth's gravity tweaks Kruthni's path. That makes Kruthni's year slightly longer than Earth's, instead of shorter, as it is now. So Earth starts to outstrip the kidney bean. He ran the animation forward, and when it has spiraled all the way back again to where it started, another reversal. Earth tweaks again and makes Kruthni's year shorter again, and the bean starts to spiral back. He accelerated the time scale further until the kidney bean ellipses arced back and forth around the sun. It's quite stable, Cornelius said, for a few thousand years at least. Remember, a single kidney bean takes around a year to be traced out. So it's a long time between reversals. The last were in 1515 and 1900. The next will be in 2285 and 2680. It's like a dance, said Malenfant. A choreography. That's exactly what it is. Although Kruthni crossed Earth's orbit, its inclination and the tweaking effect kept it from coming closer than forty times the distance from Earth to Moon. Right now, Malenfant learned, the asteroid was a hundred times the Earth-Moon distance away. After a time, Malenfant's attention began to wander. He felt obscurely disappointed. So we have an orbital curiosity. I don't see why it's so important you'd send a message back in time. Cornelius rolled up his soft screen. Malenfant, NEOs, near Earth objects, don't last forever. The planets pull them this way and that, perturbing their orbits. Maybe they hit a planet, Earth or Venus or even Mars. Even if not, a given asteroid will be slingshot out of the solar system in a few million years. And so, and so, we have plausible mechanisms for how Kruthni could have been formed, how it could have got into an orbit close to Earth's. But this orbit, so finely tuned to Earth's, is unlikely. We don't know how Kruthni could have gotten there, Malenfant. It's a real needle threader. Malenfant grinned. And so maybe somebody put it there. Cornelia smiled. We should have known. We shouldn't have needed a signal from the downstreamers, Malenfant. That Earth-locked orbit is a red flag. Something is waiting for us out there on Kruthni. What? I have absolutely no idea. 
So now what? Now we send a probe there. Malenfant called back George Hench. The engineer prowled around the office like a caged animal. We can't fly to this piece of shit, Kruthny. Even if we could reach it, which we can't, Kruthny is a ball of frozen mud. Um, Cornelia said. More to it than that. We're looking at a billion tons of water, silicates, metals, and complex organics, aminos, nitrogen bases. Even Mars isn't as rich as this, pound for pound. It's the primordial matter, the stuff they made the solar system out of. Maybe you should have planned to fire the probe at a sea type in the first place. George, it's true, Malenfant said evenly. We can easily make an economic case for Kruthny. Malenfant, Rhinemuth is made of steel. My God, it gleams. And you want to risk all that for a wild goose chase with your la-la buddy? Malenfant let George run on patiently. Then he said, Tell me why we can't get to Kruthny. It's just another NEO. I thought the NEOs were easier to reach than the moon, and we got there forty years ago. George sighed, but Malenfant could see his brain switching to a different mode. Yeah, that's why the space jockeys have been campaigning for the NEOs for years, but most of them don't figure the correct energy economics. Yes, if you look at it solely in terms of Delta V... If you just add up the energy you need to spend to get out of Earth's gravity well, there are a lot of places easier to get to than the moon. But you need to go to a chart deeper than that. Your NEO's orbit has to be very close to Earth's, in the same plane, nearly circular, and with almost the same radius. Now Rhinemuth's orbit is close to Earth's. Of course, it means that Rhinemuth doesn't line up for low-energy missions very often. The orbits are like two clocks running slightly adrift of each other. So tell me, Malenfant said heavily, why Kruthny is so much more difficult. George ticked the problems off on his fingers. Kruthny is twenty degrees out of the plane of the elliptic. Plane changes are very energy expensive. That's why the Apollo guys landed close to the moon's equator. Two, Kruthny's orbit is highly eccentric so we can't use the low-energy Hohmann trajectories we employ to transfer from one circular orbit to another, for instance, in traveling from Earth to Mars. Changes to elliptic orbits are also energy expensive. Three. Malenfant listened a while longer. So you've stated the problem, Malenfant said patiently. Now tell me how we do it. There was more bluster and bullshit and claims of impossibility which Malenfant weathered. And then it began. George produced mass statements for the BDB and its payload, began to figure the velocity changes he would need to reach Kruthny, how much less maneuvering capability he would have, how much less payload he could carry there compared to Rangmuth. Then he began calling in an array of technicians, all of whom started just as skeptical as himself, and most of whom in the end were able to figure a reply. They called up Dan Estabo at Key Largo to ask him how little living room his pet squid really, truly could survive in. Dan was furious, but he came back with answers. It took most of the day. Slowly, painfully, a new mission design converged. Malenfant only had to sit there and let it happen as he knew it would. But there was a problem. The present spacecraft design packed enough life support to take Sheena 5 to Rhinemuth, support her work there, and bring her home again. She was supposed to come sailing into Earth's atmosphere behind a giant aero shell of asteroid slag. But there was no way a comparable mission to Kruthny could be achieved. There was a way to meet the mission's main objectives, however. In fact, it would be possible to get Sheena to Kruthny much more rapidly by cutting her life support and burning everything up on the way out. For Sheena, a Kruthny voyage would be one way. Emma Stoney From Emma's perspective, sitting in her office in Vegas, everything was starting to fall apart. The legalistic vultures were hovering over Malenfant and his toy spaceships, and meanwhile the investors, made distrustful by rumors of Malenfant's growing involvement with bizarre Futurian types, were starting to desert. If Malenfant had made himself more available, more visible, to shore up confidence, it might have made a difference. 
but he didn't. Right through Christmas and into the new year, Malenfant remained locked away with Cornelius Tain or holed up at his rocket test site. It seemed to Emma events were approaching a climax, but still Malenfant wouldn't listen to her. So Emma went to the Mojave. Emma stayed the night in a motel in the town of Mojave itself. She was profoundly uncomfortable and slept little. Her transport arrived before dawn. It was an army bus. When she climbed aboard, George Hench was waiting for her. He had a flask of coffee and a bagel. Breakfast, he said. She accepted gratefully. The coffee was industrial strength, but welcome. The other passengers were young engineers trying to sleep with their heads jammed in corners by the windows. The drive out to the BDB test site was dull but easy. The sun had risen, the heat climbing, by the time they hit the thirty-mile road to Malenfant's BDB launch complex, or launch simplex, as he liked to call it. Hench jammed open the bus window. Natural air conditioning, he said, cackling. She glanced back. One or two of the youngsters behind them stirred. Hench shrugged. They'll sleep. At the site, the bus passed through the security fence and pulled over, and Emma climbed down cautiously. The light glared from the sand that covered everything, and the heat was a palpable presence that struck at her, sucking the moisture from her flesh. The test site had grown. There were a lot more structures, a lot more activity even at this hour of the morning, but it was nothing like Cape Canaveral. There were hardly any fixed structures at all. The place had the air of a construction site. There were trailers scattered over the desert, some spouting antennae and telecommunications feeds. There weren't even any fuel tanks that she could see, just fleets of trailers, frost gleaming on their tanks. People, engineers, most of them young, moved to and fro, their voices small in the desert's expanse, their hard hats gleaming like insect carapaces. And there was the pad itself, the center of attention, maybe a mile from where she stood, bearing the Nautilus. Bootstrap's first interplanetary ship, read Malenfant's Pride and Joy. She saw the lines of a rust-brown shuttle external tank and the slim pillars of solid rocket boosters. The stack was topped by a tubular cover that gleamed white in the sun. Somewhere inside that fairing, she knew, a Caribbean reef squid, disoriented as all hell, would someday ride into space. Hench said gruffly, I'll tell you, Miss Stoney, Emma, working with those kids has been the best part of this whole damn project for me. You know, these kids today come out of graduate school, and they are real whizzes with computer-aided this and that, and they do courses in science theory and math and software design, but they don't get to bend ten. Not only that, they've never seen anything fail before. In engineering, experience gained is directly proportional to the amount of equipment ruined. No wonder this country has fallen behind in every sphere that counts. Well... Here they've had to build stuff to budget and schedule. Some of the kids were scared off, but those that remained flourished. And here came Malenfant. He was wearing beat-up overalls. He even had a wrench and a loop at his waist, and his face and hands and scalp were covered in white dust patches. He bent to kiss her, and she could feel gritty sand on her cheek. So, what do you think of Nautilus? Isn't she beautiful? Kind of rough and ready. Malenfant laughed. So she's supposed to be. An amplified voice drifted across the desert from the launch pad. What was that? Hench shrugged. Just a checklist item. You're going through a checklist? A launch checklist? Demonstration test only, Malenfant said. We're planning two tests today. We've done it a dozen times already. Later today, we'll even have that damn squid of Danny Stabos up in the payload pod on top of a fully-fueled ship. We're ready, and Kruthny is up there waiting for us, and who knows what lies beyond that. As soon as you can clear away the legal bullshit, we're working on it, Malenfant. Malenfant took her for a walk around the booster pad, eager to show off his toy. Malenfant and Tench, obviously high on stress and adrenaline, launched into war stories about how they'd built their rocket ship. The whole thing is a backyard rocket, Malenfant said. It has space shuttle engines and an F-15 laser gyro set and accelerometer and the autopilot and avionics from an MD-11 airliner. In fact, 
that BDB thinks it's an MD-11 on a peculiar flight path. We sent the grad school kids scouring through the West Coast aerospace junkyards, and they came back with titanium pressure spheres and hydraulic actuators and other good stuff, and so on. Assembled and flight ready in six months. He seemed to know every one of the dozens of engineers here by name. He was by turns manipulative, bullying, brutal, overbearing. But he was, she thought, always smart enough to ensure he wasn't surrounded by sycophants and yay-sayers. Maybe that's why he keeps me on. How safe is all this, Malenfant? What if the ship blows up or a fuel store... He sighed. Emma, my BDBs will blow up about as often as a 747 blows up on takeoff. The industries have been handling locks and liquid hydrogen safely for half a century. In fact, I can prove we're safe. We've kept the qual and reliability processes as simple as possible. No hundred-mile NASA paper chains, and we put the people on the ground in charge of their own quality. Qual up front, the only way to do it. He looked into the sun, and the light caught the dust plastered over his face, white lines etched into the weather-beaten wrinkles of his face. You know, this is just the beginning, he said. Right now, this is Kitty Hook. You got to start somewhere, but someday this will be a true spaceport. Like Cape Canaveral? Oh, hell no. Think of an airport. You'll have concrete launch pads with minimal gantries, so simple we don't care if we have to rebuild them every flight. We'll have our own propellant and oxidizer manufacturer facilities right here. The terminal buildings will be just like JFK or O'Hare. They'll build new roads out here, better rail links. The spaceport will be an airport, too. We'll attract industries, communities. People will live here. But she heard tension in his voice under the bubbling faith. She'd gotten used to his mood swings, which seemed to her to have begun around the time he was washed out of NASA. But today, his mood was obviously fragile and, with a little push, liable to come crashing apart. The legal battle wasn't won yet. Far from it. In fact, Emma thought, it was more like a race, as bootstrap lawyers sought to find a way through the legal maze that would allow Malenfant to launch, or at least keep testing, before the FAA inspectors and their lawyers found a way to get access to this site and shut everything down. Tomorrow, she told herself... Tomorrow I have to confront him with the truth, the fact that we're losing the race. As the sun began to climb down the blue dome of sky, Emma requested an army bus ride back to her motel in Mojave. There she pulled the blinds and spread out her soft screen. She fired off mails, ate room service junk, tried to sleep. The phone rang, jarring her awake. It was Malentant. Go to your window. What? I'm simplifying a few bureaucratic processes, Emma. He sounded a little drunk and dangerous. She felt a cold chill settle at the pit of her stomach. What are you talking about? Go to the window and you'll see. I've been talking to Cornelius about Dr. Johnson. Once Johnson was asked how he would refute solipsism. You know, the idea that only you exist. All else is an illusion constructed by your mind. She opened her shutters. In the direction of the test range, a light was spreading over the bottom half of the sky, a smeared yellow-white rising fast, not like a dawn. Johnson kicked a rock, and he said, I refute it, thus. Oh, Malenfant, what have you done? They came to shut me down, Emma. We lost the race with those FAA assholes. One of those smart kids of George's turned out to be an FBI plant. The inspectors arrived. They would have drained the Nautilus and broken her up, and then we'd never have reached Scrutiny. I decided it was time to kick that rock. Emma, you should see the dust we're raising. And now a spark of light rose easily from the darkened horizon, climbing smoothly into the sky. It was yellow light, like a fleck of sunlight, and it trailed a pillar of smoke and steam that glowed in the light spark. She knew what that was, of course. The yellow-white was the burning of the solid propellants of the twin boosters, half-combusted products belching into the air. The central hydrogen-oxygen main engine flame was almost invisible. Already, she could see, the arc of the climbing booster was turning east, toward the trajectory that would take it off the planet. 
And now the noise arrived, rocket thunder billowing over her like the echo of a distant storm. This is just the beginning, Malin thought whispered. Part Two Downstream And so someday the mighty ramparts of the mighty universe, ringed around with hostile force, will yield and face decay and come crumbling to ruin. Lucretius Sheena Five Drifting between worlds, the spacecraft was itself a miniature planet, a bubble of ocean just yards across. The water was sufficient to protect its occupants from cosmic and solar radiation, and the water sustained concentric shells of life, a mist of diatoms feeding off the raw sunlight, and within them the deeper blue water, a shell of krill and crustaceans and small fish schools hunting and browsing, and at the center of it all a single enhanced cephalopod. Here was Sheena swimming through space. Space. Yes, she understood what that meant, that she was no longer in the wide oceans of Earth, but in a small, self-contained ocean of her own that drifted through emptiness, a folded-over ocean she shared only with the darting fish and the smaller, mindless animals and plants on which they browsed. She glided at the heart of the Nautilus, where the water that passed through her mantle over her gills was warmest, richest. The core machinery, the assemblage of devices that maintained life here, was a black mass before her, suspended in dark water, lights winking over its surface, weeds and grasses clinging to it. Sheena saw no colors. She swam through a world of black, white, and gray. But she could discern polarized light, and so now she saw that the light that gleamed from the polished surfaces of the machinery was subtly twisted this way and that, giving her a sense of the solidity and extent of the machinery. When the ship's roll took her into shadow, she hunted and browsed. She would rest on the sand patches that had been stuck to the metal, changing her mantle color so as to be almost invisible. When the fish or the krill came by, all unawares, she would dart out and snatch them, crushing them instantly in her hard beak, ignoring their tiny cries. Such simple ambushes were sufficient to feed her, so confused did the fish and krill appear in this new world that lacked up and down and gravity. But sometimes she would hunt more ambitiously, luring and stalking and pursuing, as if she were still among the rich Caribbean reefs. But all too soon the ship's languid roll brought her into the light, and brief night gave way to false day. Rippling her fins, she swam away from the machinery cluster, away from the heart of the ship, where she lived with her shoals of fish. As she rose, the water flowing through her mantle cooled, the rich oxygen thinning. She was swimming out through layers of life, and she sensed the subtle sounds of living things washing through the sphere, the smooth rush of the fish as they swam in their tight schools, the bubbling murmur of the krill on which they browsed, the hiss of the diatoms, and algae that fed them, and the deep infrasonic rumble of the water itself, compression waves pulsing through its bulk. And just as each successive sphere of water was larger than the one it contained, so Sheena knew there was a hierarchy of life. To sustain her, there had to be ten times her weight in krill, and a hundred times in diatoms. And if there had been other squid, of course, those numbers would increase, but there was no other squid here but herself. For now. She could see through misty, life-laden water the ship's hull, a membrane above her like an ocean surface, except that it wasn't above her, as it would be in a true ocean, and there was no sandy ocean floor below. Instead, the membrane was all around her, closed on itself, shimmering in great slow waves that curled around the sphere's belly. This was self-evidently a complex world, a curved world, a world without the simple top and bottom of the ocean, and the light was correspondingly complex, its polarization planes random, or else spiraling down around her. But Sheena hunted in three dimensions. She could come to terms with all this strangeness. She knew she must, in fact. She reached the wall of the ship. The membrane was a firm, if flexible, wall. If she pushed at it, it pushed back. Human eyes could see that the wall was tented gold. 
Dan had told her how beautiful this great golden egg had been in the skies of Earth as it receded to the stars. Sheena ship, good, pretty, he said, like Earth. Ship people see, gold bubble, ship of water. Grass algae grew on the wall, their long filaments dangling and wafting in the currents. Crabs and shellfish grazed on the grass algae. The benthic grazers helped feed her, and in the process kept the walls clean. Every creature in the small ocean had a part to play. Here, for instance, she drifted past a floating bank of seaweed. The seaweed cleaned the water and used up drifting food that the algae and diatoms could not consume, and the seaweed was useful in itself. One of Sheena's jobs was to gather the weed when it grew too thick and deliver it to a hopper in the machinery cluster. There it could be spun into fibers that Dan called sea silk. The sea silk would be used when she got to her destination to make and repair the equipment she would use there. Now the ship's slow rotation carried Sheena into the light of a milky, blurred disk. It was the sun, dimmed by the membrane so it did not hurt her eyes, with near it a smaller crescent. That, she knew, was the earth, all its great oceans reduced to a droplet. The craft scooted around the sun after Earth like a fish swimming after its school, seeking the rock that was the target for this mission. Once, swimming under the arching membrane like this, she had been startled by a starburst of light only a few moments swim from her. It had disappeared as soon as it had occurred, but it had seemed to her that there was a flaw in the membrane, a small patch that had lost its lustrous glow. She had been able to see from the muddled polarization how the composition of the water had been disturbed beneath the flaw. Then she had seen something moving outside the membrane. She cowered, flashing signals of false threat and concealment, thinking it was some deep space predator. It was no predator. It was just a box that squirted back and forth, emitting gentle little farts of glittering crystals. It was pulling a patch over the hole. Dan told her it was a firefly robot, a smart little box with its own power supply and fuel and miniaturized machinery and cameras and machine intelligence. The ship carried a shoal of these small craft for external inspection and repairs like this. But the little craft's life was limited, intended for a single use only, and it could achieve only one thing, which was to fix the membrane, unlike Sheena, who could do many different things. When its job was done, its fuel expended, the craft neatly folded away its tool-bearing arms and used the last breath of its fuel to push itself away from the ship. Sheena had watched as the little craft, discarded, dwindled to a sunlit point. She had learned that her ship leaked all the time anyway from tiny flaws and miniature punctures. And every few days the throwaway robots would scuttle over the membrane, tracking the vapor clouds, fixing the worst of the leaks before sacrificing themselves. She let the lazy, whale-like roll of the ship carry her away from the glare of the sun, and she peered into the darkness, where she could see the stars. The stars were important. She had been trained to recognize many of them. When she had memorized their positions around the ship, she would return to the machinery cluster and work the simple controls Dan had given her. By this means, she could determine her position in space far more accurately than even Dan could have from far off Earth. Then the rockets would flare, sending hails of exhaust particles shooting into space. They would push at the hide of the ship like a squid shoving at the belly of a whale. Waves, flaring with light, pulsed back and forth across the meniscus illuminating the drifting clouds of algae, and Sheena could detect the subtle wash of gravity around her as the great mass of water was nudged back to its proper trajectory. But to Sheena the stars were more than navigation beacons. Sheena's eyes had a hundred times the number of receptors of human eyes, and she could see a hundred times as many stars. To Sheena the universe was crowded with stars, vibrant and alive. The galaxy was a reef of stars beckoning her to come jet along its length. But there was only Sheena here to see it. She found it hard to rest. Sheena was utterly alone. Though she knew that there were no predators here, that she was as safe as any squid had ever been, she could not rest, not without the complex protection of the shoal around her, its warnings and sentinels, and, of course, 
Without the shoal, she was cut off from the society of the squid, the mating and learning and endless dances of daylight. Dan had provided a kind of dream shoal for her, squid-like shapes that swam and jetted around her glimmering. But the polarization of the light from their false sides was subtly wrong, and the fake shoal was no comfort. She was surprised Dan had not understood. As the mission progressed, as she grew progressively more weary, her loyalty to Dan crumbled, grain by grain. E. C. N. N. And we return to our main story, the developing crisis around the illegal space launch by the Bootstrap Corporation from their Mojave facility. It has become clear that the authorities, far from granting the approvals Bootstrap is seeking, were, in fact, moving to close down the operation completely. Joe? Thanks, Madeline. We do know that Kruthny was not the original target of Reed Malenfant's interplanetary ambitions. Originally, he was planning to head for Rhinemuth, another asteroid that is much richer in metals than Kruthny. So why Kruthny? It's now emerged from sources inside Bootstrap itself that in recent months, Malenfant has become convinced that the world itself may be coming to an end, and that this global doom is somehow linked to asteroid Kruthny. What are we to make of this remarkable twist in this spectacular story? We've been trying to determine if there is more to Malenfant's fears about the future than mere paranoia. It is said there are respectable scientists who claim that it is a statistical fact that the world will end, taking all of us with it, in just a few centuries. Apparently, this has been known in government circles since the 1980s. Again, the administration declined to comment. Madeline? Joe, Reed Malenfant, 51, is highly charismatic and popular. Since the announcement of his interplanetary venture, he has become something of a cult figure. In fact, last year's best-selling Christmas toys were models of Bootstrap's so-called Big Dumb Booster, along with action figures and animated holograms of the intelligent squid crew and even of Reed Malenfant himself. But while undoubtedly an attractive figure, Malenfant has long been regarded by commentators as an unstable personality. However, Bootstrap spokespersons are saying this is all scurrilous rumor put out by enemies of Reed Malenfant, perhaps within his own corporation. John Tinker Yes, they threw me out of the Flying Mountain Society. Screw them. And screw Reed Malenfant. Malenfant is a wimp. Yes, he got his bird off the ground. But to continue to launch with 1940s-style chemical rockets is at best a diversion, at worst a catastrophic error. People, you can't lift diddly into space by burning chemicals. There has been a solution on the drawing boards since the 1960s. Project Orion. You take a big plate, attach it by shock absorbers to a large capsule, and throw an atomic bomb underneath. Your ship will move, believe me. Then you throw another bomb and another. For an expenditure of a small part of the world's nuclear stockpile, you could place several million pounds in orbit. I believe in the dream. I believe we should aim to lift a billion people into space by the end of the century. This is the only way to establish a population significant enough to build a genuine space-going industry infrastructure. And incidentally, the only way to lift off enough people to make a dent in the planet's population problem. Yes, this will cause some fallout, but not much compared to what we already added to the background radiation. What's the big deal? Malenfant is right. We are facing a crisis over the survival of the species. Hard times make for hard choices. Omelets and eggs, people. Anyhow, these bombs aren't going to go away. If America doesn't use them, somebody else will. Art Morris My name is Art Morris, and I am 40 years old. I am a Marine, or used to be, until I got disabled out. My most prized possession is a snapshot of my daughter, Leanne. In the snap, she's at her last birthday party, just five years old, in a splash of Florida sunshine. The snap's one of those fancy modern ones that can show you movement, and it cycles through a few seconds of Leanne blowing at her cake. And it has a sound track. If you listen under the clapping and whoops of the family and the other kids, you can just hear her wheeze as she took her big breath. What you can't see off the edge of the picture is me just behind Leanne's shoulder, 
taking a blow myself to make sure those damn candles did what she wanted them to do, making sure that something in her world worked just once. It wasn't long after that that we had to put her into the ground. I didn't understand half of what the doctors told me was wrong with her, but I got the headline. She was a yellow baby, a space baby, a rocket baby. End of side three. 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 Side four. Time. By Stephen Baxter. Continuing on page 103. Maybe by now she would have been one of those smart kids the news is full of, but she never got the chance. I rejoiced when they shut down the space program. But now those assholes in the desert have started firing off their damn rockets again regardless. I keep Leanne's picture taped to the dash of my car or in my pocket. Look what you did, Reed Malenfant. Reed Malenfant. Madam Chairman, this is not some wacko stunt. It is a sound business venture. Here's the plan from here on in. Kruthny is a ball of loosely aggregated dirt, probably 80% silicates, 16% water, 2% carbon, 2% metals. This is an extraordinarily rich resource. Our strategy is to aim for the simplest technologies, fast return, fast payback. The first thing we're going to make up on Kruthny is rocket fuel. The fuel will be a methane oxygen bipropellant. Then we'll start bagging up permafrost water from the asteroid along with a little unprocessed asteroid material. We'll use the propellant to start firing water back to Earth orbit, specifically a type of orbit called HEEO, a highly eccentric Earth orbit, which in terms of accessibility is a good compromise place to store extraterrestrial materials. Thus, we will build a pipeline from Kruthni to Earth orbit. This will not be a complex operation. The methane rockets are based on tried and trusted Pratt and Whitney designs. The cargo carriers will be little more than plastic bags wrapped around big dirty ice cubes. But in HEEO, this water will become unimaginably precious. We can use it for life support and to make rocket fuel. We think Nautilus should be able to return enough water to fuel a further 20 to 50 NEO exploration missions at minimal incremental cost. This is one measure of the payback we're intending to achieve. Also, we can sell surplus fuel to NASA. But we are also intending to trial more complex extraction technologies on this first flight. With suitable engineering, we can extract not just water, but also carbon dioxide, nitrogen, sulfur, ammonia, phosphates, all the requirements of a life support system. We will also be able to use the asteroid dirt to make glass, fiberglass, ceramics, concrete, dirt to grow things in. We are already preparing a crude follow-up mission to Kruthni that will leverage this technology to establish a colony, the first colony, off the planet. This will be self-sufficient almost from day one, and the colonists will pay their way by further processing the Kruthni dirt to extract its metals. The result will be around 90% iron, 7% nickel, 1% cobalt, and traces. The trace, however, includes platinum, which may be the first resource returned to the surface of the earth. Nickel and cobalt will probably follow. Incidentally, I'm often asked why I'm going to the asteroids first rather than to the moon. The moon seems easier to get to and is much bigger than any asteroid besides. Well, the slag that is left over after we extract the water and volatiles and metals from asteroid ore, the stuff we'd throw away, that slag is about equivalent to the richest moon rocks. That's why I ain't going to the moon. Later we'll start the construction of a solar power plant in Earth orbit. The high-technology components of the plant, such as guidance, control, communications, power conversion, and microwave transmission systems, will be assembled on Earth. The massive low-tech components, wires, cables, girders, bolts, fixtures, station-keeping propellants, and solar cells, will all be manufactured in space from asteroid materials. This plan reduces the mass that will have to be lifted into Earth orbit several-fold. 
This plant will produce energy, safe, clean, pollution-free, that we can sell back to Earth. And that's the plan. In the next few years, Kruthni Volatiles will support the space station, more Earth orbital habitats, and missions to the Moon and Mars, as well as the first self-sufficient off-Earth colony. That little lot ought to see me through to retirement. But what about beyond that? Beyond that, the galaxy awaits, and all the universe, virgin territory. All we need is a toehold, and that's what Bootstrap will give us. America has discovered a new frontier, and we will become great again. Frankly, Madam Chairman, I think I've spent enough time in front of congressional committees like this and other boards of inquiry. All I need is for you to let me carry on and do my job, and I don't see I have a damn thing to apologize for. Thank you. Sheena 5 Swimming through space, despite her consuming weariness, Sheena 5 had work to do. She explored the complex knot of equipment that was the center of her world. It was like swimming around a sunken boat. The machinery was covered with switches and levers, labeled with black and white stripes and circles so she could recognize them. And there were dials designed for her eyes, dials coated with stripes like the height of a squid, dials that could send out pulses of twisting polarized light. The dials told her what was happening inside the equipment, and if anything was wrong, she was trained to turn the levers and switches to make it right. Sometimes she had to chase away curious fish as she did so. If anything more serious was wrong, she could ask Dan for help, and he always knew the answer or could find it out. She would fit the plastic cup to her eye, and speckled laser light would paint images on her retina, distorted diagrams and simple signs that showed her what to do. The machinery contained whirring motors that drove pumps and filters, devices that, coupled with the flow of heat from the sun, drove steady currents. The currents ensured that the waters mixed, that no part became too hot or cold, too rich with life or too stagnant. Otherwise, the diatoms and algae would cluster under the bubble's skin where the sunlight was strongest and would grow explosively until they had exhausted all the nutrients available and formed a dank cloud so thick the water would die. And the filters removed waste from the water, irreducible scraps that no creature in this small world could digest. But something had to be done with those wastes, or gradually they would lock up all the nutrients in the water. So the machine contained a place that could burn the wastes, breaking them down into their component parts. The products, gas and steam and salts, could then be fed back to the plants and algae. Thus, in Sheena's spacecraft, matter and energy flowed in great loops, sustained by sunlight, regulated by its central machinery, as if by a beating heart. Dan told her that she was already a success. In her management of the equipment, she had shown herself to be much smarter and more adaptable than any human-made machine they could have sent in her place. She knew that in their hearts the humans would prefer to send machines, mindless, rattling things, rather than herself. That was because they knew they could control machines, down to the last clank and whir. But they could never control her as was proven by the remnants of the spermatophore she still guiltily hoarded in her mantle cavity, cemented to the inner wall. Perhaps they were jealous. How strange, she thought, that her kind should be so well adapted to this greater, infinite ocean so much better than humans, as if this was somehow meant to be. It seemed to Sheena that it must be terribly confining to be a human, to be confined to the skinny layer of air that clung to the earth. At first, she had found it strangely easy to accept that she would die without seeing Earth's oceans again, without rejoining the shoals. She suspected this was no accident, that Dan had somehow designed her mind to accept such instructions without fear, which was, of course, not true. But as her restlessness and tiredness gathered, as her isolation increased, the importance of Dan and his mission receded, and her sense of loss grew inexorably. And, of course, there was a final complicating factor nestling in her mantle cavity. She would have to release her eggs eventually, but not yet, not here. There were many problems that day would bring, and she wasn't ready for them. So, swimming in starlight, Sheena cradled her unhatched young, impatiently jetting clouds of ink in the rough shape of the male she had known, the male with the bright, mindless eyes. 
Michael. It was some weeks after the woman had come to the village that Steph called him. I have to go away, Steph said. So do you. Michael didn't understand. Steph, with his machines and his food and his girls, was the most powerful person in the village, far more powerful than the head man or the herbalist. Who could make him do things? And besides, Michael had never been more than a few hundred yards outside the village, never slept anywhere but in a village hut. He wasn't sure what going away might actually mean, what he would be made to do. It seemed unreal. Perhaps it was all some game of Steph's. I don't want to go, Michael said, but Steph ignored him. He slept, trying not to think about it. But the very next day, they came for him. A car pulled up outside the village. Big smiling women got out. Cars came to the village every day, stayed a few hours, left again. But this day, for the first time in his life, Michael would have to get into the car and leave with it. He took his clothes and the flashlight Steph had given him. Steph had given him new batteries, too, long-life batteries, that would not run down so quickly. Michael didn't want to go, but the big women, their smiles hard, made it clear there was no choice. "'I'm sorry,' Steph said to Michael. "'We never finished our lessons, but you'll be okay. You'll keep learning.' Michael knew that was true. He knew he couldn't stop learning. Even when he was alone, even in the dark, he would just keep working, learning, figuring out. Even so, he was frightened. "'Take me with you,' he said. But Steph said, "'No. "'They won't even let me take Mindy,' he said. Mindy had been his favorite girl. Now pregnant, she had gone back to her mother because no man would have her. "'They'll look after you,' Steph said to Michael. "'You're a blue.' That was the first time Michael had heard that word, the English word, used like that. He didn't know what it meant. He wondered if he would ever see Steph again. He was taken through a series of bright buildings, a barrage of voices and signs, nothing of which he could understand. Even the smells were strange. At one point he was in an airplane looking down over parched land and blue sea. Afterward he thought he must have slept a great deal, for his memories of the journey were jumbled and fragmented, and he could put them in no logical order. So he came to the school. Emma Stoney Thanks to the unauthorized launch, the spectacular side of the golden spacecraft leaving Earth orbit, Malenfant had become a popular hero. This was his Elvis year, for sure, the media advisors were telling them, and they were working hard on making him even more mediagenic. But he had made an awful lot of very powerful enemies. Opposition to Malenfant had erupted, as if orchestrated right across the financial and political spectrum. Right now, it seemed to Emma, they were farther away than ever from being certified to fly again, and farther still from being licensed to keep any money they made out of Kruthny, assuming Nautilus actually got there. Emma called a council of war in the bootstrap offices in Las Vegas, herself, Malenfant, Mara Della. She didn't invite him, but Cornelius Tain came anyhow. Malenfant stalked around the office. I can't believe this shit, he glared at Emma. I thought we figured out our pre -buttles. If you're blaming me, I'm out of here, she said. Remember, you never warned me you were going to fire off your damn rocket. Mara said evenly, I know what you tried to do, Malenfant. You thought that by simply launching, by proving that your system worked safely, you could cut through the bureaucratic mess as well as prove your technical point. Damn right, just as I will prove my economic point when we start bringing the goodies home. Mara shook her head. You're so naive. You showed your hand. All you did was give your opponents something to shoot at. But we launched. We're going to Kruthny. That is a physical fact. All the staffers on the hill, all the placeholders in the NASA centers, can't do a damn thing about that. Cornelius Tain steepled his elegant fingers. But they can stop you from launching again, Melanchant. And they can throw you in jail, Emma said softly. We mustn't argue among ourselves. Let's go over it point by point. She tapped the tabletop. It turned transparent, and an embedded soft screen brought up a bullet chart. First, the NASA angle. Malenfant laughed bitterly. Fucking NASA. 
I couldn't believe the immediate 180 they pulled about the feasibility of my BDB design after it flew. Why are you surprised? Cornelius Tain asked. They hoped you would fail technically. Now that that is not possible, they intend to ensure you fail politically. Yeah, that or take me over. It seemed to be true. With indecent haste, leading Emma to suspect they had been working on precisely this move in advance and waiting for the moment to strike, NASA had come up with counterproposals for BDB designs, issuing formal requests for proposals to prospective industry partners. NASA claimed they could start flying BDBs of their own in five or ten years' time, after ensuring that all the relevant technologies were understood and in hand. Not only that, they were absorbing Malenfant's long-term goals as well, with proposals for an international program to reach and exploit the asteroids. I'm not sure how we can win this one, Mara said. After all, NASA is supposed to be the agency that develops spacecraft. But, Cornelia said heavily, this process of assimilation is precisely how NASA has killed off every new space technology initiative since the shuttle. Yeah, Malenfant growled. By turning it into another aerospace industry cartel feeding frenzy. Mara held her hands up. My point is, NASA may well win. If they do, we need a way to live with that. We, Emma thought. Even in the depths of this tense meeting, she found time to wonder at the way Malenfant had, once again, turned a potential enemy into a friend. Next, Emma said warily, Congressional funding... We're not reliant on federal funds, Malenfant snapped. That's true, Mara said dryly. But you've been happy to accept whatever general purpose funding you could lay your hands on, and that's turning into a weakness. We're being caught between authorization and appropriation. You need to understand this, Malenfant. These are two phases. Authorization is a wish list. Appropriation is the allocation of funds to the wish list. Not every authorized item gets funded. She paused. Let me put it simply. It isn't wise to spend authorized money as if it were appropriated already. That's what you did. It was a trap. It was peanuts, Malenfant growled. And anyhow, I don't know why the hell you Congress critters can't just make a simple decision. Mara sighed. Federal government is a complex thing. If you don't use the processes right, and, Emma said... Next year looks even worse. The bad guys have identified all sources of federal funding we budgeted for and have put in place precision and reprogramming processes to... Then we rebudget, Malenfant said. We cut, trim, rescope, find new funds. But the investors are being frightened off, Emma said. That's the next point. It started even before the launch, Malenfant. You knew that. Now they're hemorrhaging. The problems we've had with the regulatory agencies have scared away even more of them. But, Cornelius Tain said evenly, we must continue. Oh, Christ, Emma thought. Cornelius looked from one to the other, his face blank. Don't any of you understand this? Who do you want to appropriate the solar system? The Russians? The Chinese? Because if we fail now, that's what will happen. Emma said sharply, I'll tell you the truth, Cornelius. From where I'm sitting, you're part of the problem, not the solution. No wonder the investors took flight. If any of your kook stuff has leaked out, Cornelius said, the Carter catastrophe is coming no matter what you think of me. Mara frowned. The what? Emma took a breath. Malenfant, listen to me. Everything we've built up so far will be destroyed unless we start to take action. Action? Like what? A sellout to NASA? Maybe. And you have to cut your links with this character. Cornelius Tain smiled coldly. Malenfant's hands, clasped behind his back, showed white knuckles. The meeting broke up without agreement on a way forward. And on the way out, Mara whispered to Emma, Carter? Who the hell is Carter? Emma didn't get to her apartment until midnight that night. When she walked in the door, she told the TV to turn itself on, and there on every news channel was Cornelius Tain. Cornelius Tain. So, Dr. Tain, you're saying that these people from the future, the ones you call downstreamers, have reached into the past to us to send a message. Yes, we believe so. 
But if the downstreamers exist, or will exist, they survived this catastrophe of yours. Will survive, whatever, right? So why did they need to send a message? You're asking me about causal paradoxes. The downstreamers are saving their grandmothers, us, from drowning. But if she had drowned, they wouldn't even exist, so how can they save her, right? Um, yeah, I guess. There's a lot we don't understand about time. What happens if you try to change the past is at top of the list. Let me try to explain. It is a question of transactions, back and forth in time. The Feynman radio works on the notion of photons, electromagnetic wave packets traveling back in time. Fine. But photons aren't the only waves. Waves lie at the basis of our best description of reality. I mean, of course, the waves of quantum mechanics. These waves represent flows of what? Energy? Information? Certainly they crisscross space, spreading out from every quantum event like ripples. We have good equations to tell us how they propagate. And if we know the structure of the waves, we can tell a great deal about the macroscopic reality they represent. A clumping of the waves here means this is the most likely place to find that traveling electron emitted from over there. But like electromagnetic waves, quantum wave packets emitted from some event travel both forward and backward in time. And these backward waves are vital to the structure of the universe. Suppose you have an object of some kind that changes the state of another, a source and a detector, maybe of photons. The source changes state and sends quantum waves off into future and past. The future traveling wave reaches the detector. In turn, this emits waves traveling into both future and past like echoes. Here's the catch. The quantum echoes cancel out the source waves, both future and past, everywhere except along the path taken by the ordinary retarded waves. It's like a standing wave set up between source and receiver. Because no time passes for a wave traveling at light speed, all of this is timeless too, set up in an instant. It's called a transaction, as if source and detector are handshaking. Hi, I'm here. Yes, I can confirm you are. So there really are waves traveling back in time? So it seems, but you don't have to worry about them. I don't? No. There are no back-in-time paradoxes, you see, because the backward waves only work to set up the transaction. You can't detect them otherwise. And that's how our reality works. As the effects of some change propagate through space and time, the universe knits itself into a new form, transaction by transaction, handshake by handshake. Hmm. And this is quantum mechanics, you say? So what happened to all that quantum funny stuff? The collapsing wave function and Schrodinger's cat and the many worlds interpretation and... Oh, you can forget all that. We study that today the way we study Roman numerals. Now that we know what quantum mechanics is really all about, it's hard to imagine how people in those days thought like that. Do you follow? Um, Madeline? Let me get this straight. If I go back and change the past, I create a new universe that branches off at that point, right? If I kill my grandmother, I get two universes, one where she lived and I was born, one where she dies and I was never born? No, perhaps you haven't heard me. It just doesn't work like that. There is only one universe at a time. New universes may bud off from others, but they are not parallel in the way you say. They are separate and entire with their own self-consistent causalities. So what happens if I go back in time and do something impossible, like kill my granny? Because if she dies, I could never be born and could never have killed her. Each quantum event emerges into reality as the result of a feedback loop between past and future, handshakes across time. The story of the universe is like a tapestry stitched together by uncountable trillions of such tiny handshakes. If you create an artificial time-like loop to some point in space-time within the negative light cone of the present, whoa, in English. If you were to go back in time and try to change the past, you would nullify all those transactions, the handshakes between future and past. You would damage the universe, erasing a whole series of events within the time loop. 
So the universe starts over from the first point where the forbidden loop would have begun to exist. The universe, wounded, heals itself with a new set of handshakes, working forward in time until it is complete and self-consistent once more. Then changing the past is possible. Oh, yes. Tell me this, Dr. Tain. According to this view, even if you do go back and change the past, how do you know you succeeded? Won't you change along with the past you've altered? We don't know. How could we? We've never tried this before. But we think it's possible a conscious mind would know. How? Because consciousness, like life itself, is structure, and structure persists as the cosmic tapestry changes. Think about a DNA molecule. Some of the genes are important for the body's structure. Some are just junk. If you could perturb reality, consider possible alternate destinies for that molecule, you could see a lot of variation in the junk without affecting the operation of the molecule in any significant way. But if there's a change in the key structural components, those that contain information, the molecule may be rendered useless. Therefore, the key structure must be stable in the face of small reality changes. So if in some way our minds span reality changes, then maybe we'll be able to perceive a change, an adjustment of the past. Of course, this is speculative. And what about free will, Dr. Tain? Where does that fit into your grand plan? Free will is a second-order effect. Even life is a second-order effect. Light dancing from the rippled surface of Time's River. It is not the cause even of the ripples, let alone the great majestic flow itself. That's one gosh darned gloomy view. Realistic, however. You know our time is just a bubble far upstream that must seem utterly insignificant compared to the great enterprises of the future. But it isn't insignificant because it's the first bubble. And if we don't survive the Carter catastrophe, we lose everything. Eternity itself. Emma Stoney The media types had it all. The Carter prediction, the message from the future, the real reason for the redirection of the Nautilus, all of it. Emma was convinced it was Cornelius himself who had leaked the Carter stuff. It increased the pressure on Bootstrap hugely, but that only seemed to reinforce Malenfot's determination to fight his way through this, to maintain his links with Cornelius, continue on to Kruthny, and launch again. Which, of course, was exactly what Cornelius wanted. She had been outflanked. She spent a sleepless night trying to figure out what to do next. Michael At first, the school seemed a good place to Michael. Better than the village, in fact. The clothes were clean and fresh. The food was new and sometimes tasted strange, but there was always a lot of it. In fact, there were refrigerators that lit up and had food and drink inside, food the children could help themselves to whenever they wanted. Michael found he missed baobab fruit, though. There were lots of children here, from very small to young teenagers. They lived in dormitories, which were bright and clean. At first, the children had been wary of each other. They had no common language, and children who could speak to each other tended to gather in groups. There was nobody who spoke Michael's language, however, but he was used to being alone. This was a place called Australia. It was a big empty land. He saw maps and globes, but he had no real understanding of how far he had come from the village, except that it was a long way. There were lessons. The teachers were men and women called brothers and sisters. Sometimes the children would be gathered in a room, ten or fifteen of them, while a teacher would stand before them and talk to them or have them do work with paper and pen or a soft screen. Michael, like some of the other children, had a special soft screen that could speak to him in his own tongue. It was comforting to hear the little mechanical voice whisper to him like a remote echo from home. The best times of all were when he was allowed to go explore, as if the soft screen were a window to another world, a world of pictures and ideas. He had no interest in languages or music or history, but mathematics held his attention from the start. He drank in the symbols, tapping them onto his soft screen or scratching them on paper, even drawing in the dust as he had at home. Most of the symbols and their formalism were better than the ones he had made up for himself, and he discarded his own without sentiment. But sometimes he found his own inventions were superior, and so he kept them. He loved the strict rigor of a mathematical proof, 
a string of equations, statements of truth, which nevertheless, if manipulated correctly, led to a deeper, richer truth. He felt as if his own view of the world were crystallizing, freezing out like the frost patterns he watched inside the refrigerators, and his thinking accelerated. Soon, in math class, he was growing impatient to be forced to work at the same pace as the other children. Once, he grew restive. That was the first time he was punished by a sister who yelled at him and shook him. He knew that that was a warning, that this place was not as friendly as it seemed, that there were rules to learn, and that the sooner he learned them, the less harm would come to him. So he learned. He learned to sit quietly, if he was ahead of the rest. He could do his work almost as effectively that way anyhow. Michael seemed to be the one who enjoyed mathematics the most, but most of the children had one or two subjects in which they excelled. And then it was Michael's turn to sit and struggle, and the other's turn to race ahead, risking the wrath of the teachers. Any children who showed no such talent were soon taken out of the school. Michael didn't know what happened to them. It was a paradox. If you weren't smart enough, you were taken out of the school. If you were too smart, you were punished for impatience. Michael tried to learn this rule, too, to show just enough ability, but not too much. It didn't matter, anyhow. Most of his real work he did in his head, in the dark, and he never told anybody about it. There were many visitors, adults, tall and dressed smartly, who walked around the classes and the dormitories. Sometimes they brought people with cameras who smiled as if the children were doing something of great importance. Once a woman even took away Michael's soft screen, looking at the work he had recorded there with exclamations of surprise. He was given another soft screen, but of course it was empty, containing none of the work he had completed, but that didn't matter. Most of it was in his head anyhow. There was a girl here called Anna, a little older and taller than the rest, who seemed to learn the rules more quickly than the others. She had big gray eyes, Michael noticed, gray and watchful. She would speak to the others, including Michael, through his soft screen, trying to help them understand what was wanted of them. It meant she was in line for punishment more often than most of the others, but she did it anyway. Many of the children drew blue circles on their books or their soft screens or their skin or the walls of the dormitories, as did Michael, as he had for a long time. He didn't know what that meant. Those days, in retrospect, strange, bright days, didn't last long. Michael couldn't know it, but it was the publicizing of the Carter prophecies, the end of the world news, that forced the change in the schools, including his own, because suddenly people grew afraid of the future, of their own children. Leslie Gandolfo Frankly, our biggest problem since this damn end-of-the-world Carter bullshit broke has been absenteeism. We're up over 100% nationally. Not only that, but productivity is right down, and our quality metric program shows a massive decline in all functions, except accounting for some reason. We've also had a number of incidents of violence, immoral behavior, and so forth in the workplace, some but not all related to alcohol and or drugs. It's as if they all believe this pseudoscience bullshit about there being no tomorrow. But, of course, the clock punchers expect us to keep on providing salaries and bonuses and medical benefits, presumably right up until doomsday itself, with maybe an advance or two. I know our competitors are suffering, too, but we can't go on like this, ladies and gentlemen. Our costs are skyrocketing, our profits hemorrhaging. I'm pleased to see the federal government is finally taking some positive action. Gray-suited spokesmen denouncing Carter and eschatology as moonshine were all very well. What they are doing now, pumping out free 24-hour sports, comedy, soft soaps, and synth rock on TV, is a somewhat more practical response. We've already installed giant video walls in our workplaces in Tulsa and Palm Beach. Productivity took a hit, of course, but happily nowhere near as bad as in other sites without the wall-to-wall -wall pap. We've also provided free e-therapy up to four hours a week per permanent employee. For now, I agree with the government analysis that an anesthetized workforce is preferable to a workforce plunged into existential gloom. But this is just a palliative. We have to find a long-term way to handle this. The end of the world may or may not be inevitable. Our stockholder meeting is inevitable, however. 
I'm open to further suggestions. The Voice of Reason Mail this on to ten people you know and tell them to send it to ten people they know and so on. We have to inoculate the species against the contagion of madness that is plaguing humankind or this damn Carter hypothesis is going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. How to debunk Carter 1. First of all, don't dismiss it as nonsense. The hypothesis may be wrong-headed, but it's not irrational and it's not illogical. We aren't dealing with a usual airhead crap here. It's more potent than that. 2. Don't insult your opponent. Start with the premise that people aren't stupid, whether they know science and math or not. If you insult them, you'll be seen as arrogant, and you'll lose the argument. 3. The best attack on Carter is the notion that the cosmos is radically indeterministic. You can argue from quantum physics to justify this, if you can keep your audience with you, or from free will if not. There is no way, even in principle, to say how many humans might exist in the future. So the Carter analogy between humankind and balls and an urn breaks down. 4. If your audience is sophisticated enough, remind them that the whole argument is based on Bayesian statistics, which is a technique to refine probabilities of an event given a knowledge of prior probabilities. But in this case, we have no prior probabilities to work with. We can only guess about the long-term future of humankind. So the Bayesian technique can't be valid. 5. Reduce the argument to the trivial. It's trivially obvious that people discussing Carter's argument find themselves alive today, not hundreds of years in the future. But nothing non-trivial follows from a triviality. Since no humans of the future are yet alive, it isn't in the least surprising that we aren't among them. 6. You could try a reductio ad absurdum. On any scale, an exponential curve looks the same. You always seem to be at the beginning, minuscule compared to what is to come. So the catastrophe will always be just over the horizon. Of course, this argument falls down unless the exponential curve of the human population really does extend to infinity. Any finitude and something like Carter comes into play. But you don't have to mention that unless challenged. 7. Appeal to common sense. Look back in time. A human of, say, A.D. 1000 would likewise have been sitting on top of an exponential curve reaching back to the Paleolithic. Would she have been correct to deduce she was in the last generations? Of course not, as we can see with retrospect. You may find Carter proponents countering this one by saying this is a false analogy. Humanity today faces far graver extinction threats than in A.D. 1000 because of our technological advancement the way we have filled up the earth, etc. And it took our modern-day sophistication to come up with the Carter argument in the first place. So we have formulated the Carter prophecy at precisely the moment it is most applicable to us. But then you can argue that they are appealing beyond the statistics. Continuing list snipped. Remember, though, none of the counter-arguments are definitive. You may find yourself up against somebody with as much or more understanding of statistics than you. In that case, escalate the argument until you blind the general audience with science. The objective here isn't to disprove Carter. That may be impossible. You can hold the argument, but you can't sink it. And anyhow, the one true invalidation will be our continued survival in 201 years. But we must stop this ludicrous panic over Carter before it eats us all up like a brush fire. Moradella. Doom soon was all rather difficult to believe, a month after Cornelius had gone public, as Mara endured the usual Potomac hell. Breakfasts with reporters, morning staff meetings, simultaneous committee meetings to juggle, back-to-back -back sessions with lobbyists and constituents, calls, briefings, speeches, receptions, constant implant pager tingles to make quorum calls and votes on the run. And then there were the constituency issues she couldn't neglect. Casework. Distributing small favors funded by the Federal Pork Barrel and otherwise. And targeted mail and fundraising shots. And a chat room surgeries and online referenda and appearances. In person, e-person, or simulated. It was all part of the constant campaign. A treadmill she knew she couldn't fall off of if she expected to get elected again. 
But this was just the general grind of federal government. It was as if illegal rocket launches in the desert, the dire warnings of doom, had never happened. The federal government think tanks, who had tried to flesh out the Carter catastrophe hypothesis, had provided her with some gloomy reading. On the one hand, nobody could definitively undermine the argument itself on philosophical or mathematical grounds. No tame expert would stand up and say he or she could demonstrate the damn thing was bullshit in simple enough terms for the president to deliver to the nation, the panicking world. On the other hand, the think tanks could come up with a lot of ways the world might end. War, of course, nuclear, biological, chemical. A disaster from genetic engineering, malevolent or otherwise. The report recalled one near miss in the early thousands in Switzerland concerning a birth control vaccine. A genetically altered salmonella bacterium had been supposed to cause a temporary infection in the female gut that triggered antibodies against sperm. It had, of course, mutated and gotten out of control. A hundred thousand women had been rendered permanently infertile before the bug was stopped. Environmental catastrophes, the continuing collapse of the atmosphere structure, the greenhouse effect, Eco-terrorism, people waging war both for and against the environment. Witness the ground-to-air missile that had recently brought down the Znamya, the giant inflatable mirror that should have been launched into orbit to light up the night sky over Kiev. Witness similar attacks on the reef balls on the Atlantic Ocean shelf, the giant concrete hemispheres intended to attract fast-growing algae and so soak up excess atmospheric carbon dioxide. Mara was grimly amused to see that Bootstrap had been major investors in both these projects. But much worse was possible. The environment was essentially unstable, or at least only quasi-stable. If somebody found a way to tip that stability, it might only need a small nudge. That was the man-made stuff. Then there were natural disasters. That hoary old favorite, the asteroid strike, was still a candidate. And the earth, she read, was overdue for a giant volcanic event, one of a scale unseen in all of recorded history. The result would be a volcano winter comparable to nuclear war aftermath. Or the radiation from a nearby supernova could wipe the earth clean of life. She learned that the earth, in fact, was swimming through a bubble in space, a bubble blown clear in the interstellar medium by just such a stellar explosion. And here was something new to her. Perhaps a new ice age would be triggered by the Earth's passage through an interstellar cloud. The report concluded with more outlandish speculations. What about annihilation by extraterrestrials? What if some alien species was busily transforming the solar system right now, not even aware that we existed? Or how about vacuum decay? It seemed that space itself was unstable, like a statue standing on a narrow base. It could withstand small disturbances, small in this case including such things as galactic core explosions, but a powerful enough nudge, properly applied, could cause the whole thing to tip over into, well, a new form. The take-home message seemed to be that such a calamity would be not just the end of the world, but the end of the universe, etc. The list of apocalypses continued, spectacular and otherwise, at great length, even to a number of appendices. The report authors had tried to put numbers to all these risks. The overall chance of species survival beyond the next few centuries it put as 61%. The precision amused Mara, a result they described as optimistic. That wasn't to say the world would be spared all the disasters, that wasn't to say the human race would not endure death and suffering on giant scales. It wasn't even a promise that human civilization in its present form would persist much longer. It was just that it was unlikely that the world would encounter a disaster severe enough to cause outright human extinction. Relatively unlikely, anyhow. Whether or not the world was ending, the prediction itself was having a real effect. The economy had been hit. Crime, suicides, a loss of business confidence. There had been a flight into gold, as if that would help. This was, the think tankers believed, ironically, a byproduct of a recent growth and responsibility. 
After generations of gloomy warnings about Earth's predicament, people had by and large begun to take responsibility for a future that extended beyond the next generation or two. Perhaps in the 1950s, the world two centuries hence would have seemed impossibly remote. Now it seemed around the corner, awfully close, within the bounds of current plans and thinking. It was ironic that people had begun to imagine the deeper future just as it was snatched from them. Above all, we must beware Schopenhauerian pessimism, she read. Schopenhauer, obsessed with the existence of evil, wrote that it would have been better if our planet had remained lifeless like the moon. From there it is only a short step to thinking that we ought to make it lifeless. It may be that this motivates some of the destructiveness seen recently in our urban communities. Although the disruption caused by the so-called blue children phenomenon at a fundamental level, that is, nuclear family level, is no doubt contributing. There was a complex of responses, an unstable species sent into a spin by the bad news from the future. Perhaps what would bring down humankind in the end was not nature or science, but a creeping philosophical disaster. In the midst of all this, Malenfant was summoned to appear before the House Committee on Space, Science, and Technology in Washington, D.C., an appearance that might be, as Mara realized immediately, his last chance to save his sorry ass. Emma Stoney On the morning Malenfant was due to give his testimony, Emma, nervous, unsleeping, was up early. She took a walk around Washington, D.C. It was a hot, flat morning. The traffic noise was a steady rumble carried through the sultry air. She followed the mall, the grassy strip of parkland that ran a mile from the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial. The grass was yellow, the ground baked hard and flat, though it was only April. The heat rose in waves as if she were walking across a hot plate. From here she could see several of the nation's great buildings, seats of government, museums, a lot of neoclassical marble, grandly spaced. This was an imperial capital, if ever there was one, a statement of power, if not of good taste. She considered going to see the Asteroid Exploration VR Gallery Malenfant had donated to the Air and Space Museum. Typical Malenfant, influencing public opinion with what was ostensibly a gesture of generosity. Maybe another day, she thought. She reached the Washington Monument. Simple and clean, seamlessly restored since its 08 near demolition by Christian libertarians. But the flags that ringed it were all at half-mast in recognition of the American lives lost in the latest anti-American terrorist outrage in... She'd forgotten already. France, was it? And then she turned, and there was the White House right in front of her, still, arguably, the most important decision-making center on the planet. There was what looked like a permanent shanty town on the other side of the road, opposite the White House, panhandlers and protesters and religious crazies doing this stuff in full view of the chief executive's bedroom window. Police drones buzzed languidly overhead. D.C. was dense, real, crusted with history and power. Compared to this, Malenfant's endeavors in the desert and off in space seemed foolish, baroque dreams. Nevertheless, here Malenfant was ready to fight his corner. Mara eyed Emma. So, about Malenfant, what is it with you two? Hmm? I can't understand how come you're still together. We're divorced. Exactly. Emma sighed. It's a long story. Mara grunted. Believe me, at my age, everybody has a long story. To loosen them both up, Mara Della had taken Emma as a special guest to the house gym in the basement of the Rayburn House Office Building. It was smaller than Emma had expected, with a pool, steam and massage rooms, a squash court, and exercise equipment. Mara and Emma had opted for a swim, steam, and massage, and now Emma felt herself relax as her mechanical masseur pounded her back with plastic fingers. They had married young, he in his thirties, she in her twenties. Emma had had her own career but she had been excited at the prospect of coming with him, of following his charming, childlike, outlandish dreams of a human expansion into space. She had known her public role would be as an Air Force wife, perhaps as a NASA wife, and those institutions were old and hidebound enough that she knew she would be forced to let her career shadow his. 
raising Air Force brats, in fact. But the truth was, they were partners and would be for life. But Malenfant had washed out of NASA at the first hurdle. She had been stunned. He had come back silent, sullen. He had never told her what went wrong. She had learned not to press him on it. And after that, nothing had been the same. He was floored by his setback for a whole year before he resigned from the Air Force and started finding other directions to channel his energy. That had been the start of Bootstrap Incorporated of Malenfant's journey to riches and power. Emma had worked with him even in those early days, but he had started to push her away. I still don't understand why, she told Mara. We'd planned children, family years, a home somewhere. Somehow all that had disappeared over the horizon, and then... You don't have to tell me. Emma smiled, feeling tired. It's in the gossip columns. He had an affair. I found them together. Well, the marriage was finished. I'll tell you the strangest thing. I've never seen him so unhappy as at that moment. In fact, it had seemed to her that Malenfant was working to finish it, digging at its foundations, that he had taken a lover only to drive away Emma. Her e-therapist said said he was reacting to the thwarting of his true ambition. Now that he knew he would never achieve his dreams, Malenfant was playing with the toys of youth one more time before the coffin lid started to creak down over him. Or maybe, some of the e-therapists argued, it was just some hideous andropause thing. The only advantage of e-therapists, Mara murmured, is that their horseshit is cheaper than humans. Well, whatever it hurt. And it still does, right? Emma shrugged. Someday I'll understand. And then you'll walk out the door? That's my plan. So, you think we're going to get through today? I think so, Mara said briskly, turning to business. The danger man is Harris Rutter from Illinois, one of the Gingrich generation. You know, once they arrive here, people never leave, in office or not. You have straight of power going back decades. Rutter has a lot of power. He's on a number of appropriations subcommittees, sluice ways for federal money. But Rutter's power is all negative. He likes to filibuster, raise delaying amendments, stall appointments. All means to frustrate the will of the majority until he gets his own way, whatever that is. But I think I managed to blindside him this time. How? Federal pork, or at least the promise of a slice if Malenfant gets his way. That's looking a long way ahead, isn't it? You have to stay ahead of the power curve in this town, Emma, Mara murmured, and she closed her eyes with a sigh as her massager went back to work. Did you know they didn't let women in this gym until 1985? The hearing here in the Rayburn building took place in a cramped, old-fashioned conference room cooled by a single inadequate air conditioner. There were two rows of conference tables down the middle of the room with nameplates for the representatives on one side and for the testifiers on the other. It was a place of judgment, of confrontation. Malenfant was here. He looked crisp, calm, confident, composed, his bald pate gleaming like a piece of a weapons system. Emma looked into his eyes. He looked as innocent and sincere as if he'd just been minted. Malenfant took the stand, and Emma and Mara took seats side by side at the back of the room. Two representatives took the lead, Harris Rutter, the former lawyer, and Mary Howell of Pennsylvania, once a chemical engineer. Both of them were Republicans. The purpose of the hearing was for Malenfant to justify once more why he shouldn't be shut down. Rudder questioned Malenfant hard about the dubious legality of his operations, particularly his first launch. Malenfant's answers were smooth. He allowed himself to sound irritated at the maze of conflicting legislation Bootstrap had had to tiptoe through, and he launched into a researched speech about his manned space program to come, how he had four astronaut candidates already in training, chosen to be representative of the U.S. demographic mix. It wasn't hard to find volunteers, sir, even though we emphasized the dangers to them, not of the space mission, but of being grounded without making the flight. A little sympathetic laughter. In this country, we have a huge reservoir of expertise in launching space missions, reserves of people laid off by the space and defense industries, people champing at the bit to be let to work again. In my view, it's a crime to waste such a skilled resource. 
Then he went on to how the mission was being assembled mainly from components supplied not by the usual aerospace cartels, but by smaller, sometimes struggling companies right across the United States. Malenfant was able to outline a glowing future in which the benefits of the new expansive space program would flow back from the Mojave in terms of profits and jobs to districts right across the country, not least to Illinois and Pennsylvania, home states of his inquisitors. Emma whispered to Mara, laying it on thick, isn't he? Mara leaned closer. You have to see the big picture, Emma. Most big pork barrel projects gain broad support in their early stages when there are a lot of representatives who can still hope for a slice of the ultimate pie. If Malenfant can promise to bring wealth to as many districts as possible, all for a modest or even zero government outlay, then he's convincing people at least to give him the benefit of the doubt. Malenfant seemed to have survived Rudder's grilling, but now, to Emma's surprise, into the attack came Howell, the engineer from Pennsylvania. She was a tough, stockily-built woman of about fifty, her defiantly gray hair tied back in a bun. She looked sharp, vigorous, and spoiling for a fight. Colonel Malenfant, bootstrap is about more than engineering, isn't it? I don't know what you mean. Howell held up a copy of the Washington Post with a splash headline about the Feynman radio at Fermi Lab, an animated picture beneath of Cornelius Tain repeating some Carter catastrophe sound bite. She quoted, Exclusive statements from an eschatology spokesperson, Fermi Lab managers furious at the misuse of their facilities. That news release was nothing to do with me. Come, Colonel Malenfant. I've absolutely no doubt that news management like this goes on only with your tacit approval. So the question is why you feel this kind of message from the future mumbo-jumbo helps your cause. Now, you have a background in engineering, don't you, Colonel? As I do, she eyed him. I dare say we're about the same age, so we've both witnessed the same changes in our society. Changes? The distrust of technology. The loss of faith in scientists, engineers... In fact, a kind of rejection of the scientific method itself and of the scientific explanation of the world. Do you agree that we've seen a flight to the irrational? Yes. Yes, I agree with that. But I don't necessarily agree with your implication that the irrational is all bad. Oh, you don't? There are many mysteries science has not dealt with, perhaps never will. What is consciousness? Why does anything exist rather than nothing? Why am I alive here and now and not a century ago or a thousand years from now? We all have to confront such questions in the quiet of our souls every minute of our lives. And if the irrational is the only place to look for answers, well, that's where we look. Representative Howell rubbed her temples. But, Colonel Malenfant, you must agree that it is our brains, our science, that have made the world around us. It is science that has given the planet the capacity to carry many billions of people. It is only the intelligent management of the future that can get us through the next decades, assure us of a long-term future. I know you agree with that because it's a direct quote from your own company report last year. Now, let's not hear any more bullshit philosophizing. Mara leaned over to Emma. Representatives get to edit the congressional record. Witnesses don't, unfortunately. Do you really believe it is responsible to try to gain public support for your highly dubious activities by whipping up hysteria over nonsense about the end of the world and messages from the future? But now Rudder from Illinois was leaning forward. Will the lady yield on that? If you'll yield for a moment, I have something to ask. Howell glared at him, realizing her attack was being dissipated. Rudder was a corpulent, sweating man with an anachronistic bow tie. To Emma, he looked as if he hadn't been out of Washington in twenty years. "'I was interested in what you had to say, Colonel Malenfant,' he said. "'Most of us don't see any ethical problems in your links with organizations like eschatology. Somebody has to think about the future constructively, after all. I think it's refreshing to have a proposal like yours in which there is a subtext, as you might call it, beyond the practical. If you can go to the stars, bring home a prophet, and something... Well, something spiritual, I think that's to be applauded. Thank you, Representative. Tell me this, Colonel. Do you think your mission to Kruthny, if successful, will help us find God? Alan Font took a deep breath. 
Mr. Rutter, if we find everything we hope to find on Cruthney, then yes, I believe we will come closer to God. Emma turned to Moradella and rolled her eyes. Good grief, Malenfant. There were follow-up questions from Howell, among others, but that, as far as Emma could tell, was that. Mara was grinning. He had them eating out of his hand, all but representative Howell. The question he planted with Rudder put a stop to her. Emma goggled. He planted it? Oh, of course he did. Come on, Emma. It was too obvious, if anything. Emma shook her head. You know, I shouldn't be shocked any more by anything Malenfant does. But I have to tell you, he is not a Christian, and he does not believe in God. Mara pursed her lips. Lies told to Congress. Shock. Look, Emma, this is America. Every so often you have to push the God button. So he won. I think so. For now, anyhow. Representative Howell, the engineer from Pennsylvania who had argued for rationalism, pushed between them with a muttered apology. Howell looked distressed, frustrated, confused. Malenfant, when he emerged, was disgustingly smug. To Krufni, he said. Moradella. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan began, welcome to JPL. Today, June 18th, 2011, a U.S. spacecraft piloted by a genetically enhanced cephalopod is due to rendezvous and dock with near-Earth object designated 3753 or 1986 T.O., called Krufni, a three-mile diameter C-type asteroid. We should be getting images from a remote Firefly camera shortly and a feed from the Nautilus herself. He stood in a forest of microphones, a glare of TV lights. Behind him, a huge soft screen was draped across the wall like a tapestry. It showed a mass of incomprehensible graphic and digital updates. As Dan lectured his slightly restive audience, Mara allowed her attention to drift. JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, had turned out to look like a small hospital, squashed into a cramped and smoggy Pasadena suburb site dominated by the green shoulders of the San Gabriel Mountains. A central mall adorned with a fountain stretched from the gate into the main working area of the laboratory. And on the south side she had found the Von Karman Auditorium, the scene of triumphant news conferences and other public events going back to NASA's glory days when JPL had sent probes to almost every planet in the solar system. Absently, she listened to the talk around her, a lot of chatter about long-gone times when spirits were high, everybody seemed to be young, and there was a well-defined enemy to beat. Heady days. All gone now. Well, today the big old auditorium was crowded again, almost like the old days. Mission managers and scientists and politicians and a few aging sci-fi writers all crammed in among the soft-screen terminals. Just as NASA had declared that Malenfant's BDB design was a criminal joke that could never fly until it had flown, so its experts had declared that Bootstrap's cephalopod-based asteroid expedition was irresponsible and absurd until it had survived out in deep space and, more important, had started to gather some approving public attention. And so, as Sheena Five neared Kruthni, here everybody was, basking in reflected cephalopod glory. As they waited for the rendezvous, Dan launched stiffly into a formal presentation on the technical aspects of the spacecraft. The membrane that is the core of the ship's design is based on technology Bootstrap developed for undersea methane extraction operations. As far as the biosphere itself is concerned, efficiency is the key. Phytoplankton, one of the most efficient life forms known, can convert 78% of available nitrogen into protein. The simplicity of the algae, no stems, leaves, roots, or flowers, makes them almost ideal crop plants, 100% foodstuff. Of course, the system is not perfect. It's not completely closed and imperfectly buffered. But it's still more robust in terms of operational reliability than any long-duration mechanical equivalent we can send up, and a hell of a lot cheaper. I have the figures that... What about the problems, Dan? He looked uncomfortable. Sheena has had to spend more time acting as the keystone predator than we expected. Say what? Culling pathological species that get out of hand. And you have to understand that the system is inherently unstable. We have to manage it consciously, 
or rather Sheena does. We have to replace leaked gases, regulate the temperature, control the hydrological cycle, and trace contaminants, and so on. What Estebo didn't say, what Mara knew from private briefings, was that this could be a very near thing. It's so fragile, Mara thought. She imagined the tiny droplet of water containing Sheena drifting in the immensity of interplanetary space, like a bit of sea foam tossed into the air by a wave, never to rejoin the ocean. What about Sheena herself? At that question, Dan seemed to falter. Mara knew that Sheena had been refusing to participate in her medical briefings, or to interface with the remote diagnostics that Dan used to monitor her health. Not that Dan or anybody else knew why she was refusing to cooperate. Mara tried to read the emotions in Dan's bearded, fat-creased face. You understand I can only speak to her once a day when the spacecraft is above the horizon at Goldstone. She is an LOS, loss of signal, for fifteen hours a day. How do you feel about the fact that she's not coming home? Again, Dan blustered. Actually, the simplification of the mission goals has worked benefits throughout the profile. The cost of the return, the mass penalty of return leg propellant and comestibles, and the arrow brake heat shield multiplied through the whole mission mass statement. Yeah, but it's become a one-way trip for your squid, the Calamari Express. Uncomfortable laughter. Dan was squirming. Bootstrap has plans to deal with the ethical contingencies. Technocrat bullshit, Mara thought. Whoever coached this poor sap did a bad job. But she pitied Dan nonetheless. He was probably the only person on the planet who truly cared about Sheena Five, as opposed to the sentimental onlookers on TV and on the net. And here he was having to defend her being sentenced to death alone in space. And now at last an image came through on the big wall-mounted soft screen pictures from space. A hush spread over the hall. It took Mara some seconds to figure out what she was seeing. It was an asteroid. It was misshapen and almost black, the craters and cracks of its dusty surface picked out by unvarying sunlight, a potato left too long on the barbecue. And a spacecraft of rippling gold was approaching, dwarfed by the giant rock. There was applause, whooping. Way to go, Dan! Write down US-1! Dan fumbled at a touchpad, and a new image came up on the soft screen. Sheena Five, a Caribbean reef squid, drifting in blue-gold shadows, live from Nautilus. Eerily, her head was hidden by a metal mask that trailed wires back to a mass of machinery. Then the cephalopod pulled back, leaving the metal mask dangling in the water, and she began an elaborate dance. It was enchanting. Her chromatophore organs pulsed with colors and shapes, black and orange and aquamarine and ochre, and her tentacles and arms flashed as she arced, twirled, and pirouetted through the tank. She was very obviously producing signals, one even to a second, signals that flowed into each other, varying remarkably in their intensity. Can you interpret what she's saying, Dan? Hesitantly, he began to translate. Stop and watch me. Stop and watch me. You have to understand her language elements are based on those she inherited from the cephalopod shoals. This is a signal she might use to distract prey or even a predator. Now this is what we call the pied pattern. Court me, court me. She's asking for admiration. She's proud. Asteroid, come near, come near. Another mating signal. It's as if she's luring the asteroid. Star shoal all around. No danger, no danger. Literally no predators. But she means that her navigation has been a success, that the systems are working nominally. Stop and watch me. Court me. His posture was stiff as he stared at the screen, the separation from his dancing friend a tangible, painful thing. The audience was silent, Mara noted absently, stunned by this shard of cheap emotion. The digital displays told her the moment of rendezvous was near. The remote firefly camera images returned to the soft screen, a stop-start sequence updated every few seconds. The gold spark tracked across the blackened surface. Sheena 5 The asteroid was big now, covering almost half of the sky. She could see the asteroid's surface as if she were drifting over Caribbean sand flats. It was dull and dark, but its polarization was rich. 
She was searching for the shading and twinkling that meant frozen water. Here was a patch where the twisting of the light was muddy and random, and Dan had taught her that meant bare metal. Here the light was strongly polarized, and the surface was probably coated with thick, sticky dust. It seemed wonderful to Sheena that she could clearly see, just by looking at the sparkling, twisting light, what this strange deep space fish was made of. There, it looked like a hole in the surface, and it had a shallow, sloping floor that sparkled and gleamed with the look of water. Sheena touched her wall dose, and the ship hovered above the depression. She knew it would take a long time for Dan to learn of her success. She trembled with anticipation. Gripping the circular support with her arms, Sheena inserted her two long tentacles into the smooth, flexible sheaths and touched the central pad with her beak. Two three-hundred-foot cables aping the motion of her tentacles began to unwind from the hull of Nautilus. Sheena extended her tentacles and small puffs of gas from the pads at the cable ends sent them stretching toward the asteroid. She allowed the cables to droop to their limits, then flashed down to the ship's software. She sensed the cables touch the bottom, touch the asteroid. Contact. She flexed her suction cups to grip the surface. Slowly she contracted her tentacles, drawing herself down until she could see the smallest details of the asteroid, even her ship's small shadow. She had practiced this maneuver in deep space over and over. It was probably the most important task she would ever have to complete, after all. If she failed at this one thing, the mission itself would fail. Finally she felt a gentle pressure wave pulse through the water and through her own body, letting her know that she had come to rest. The asteroid, this great black whale of space, was her prey, and she, the hunter, had captured it. Pride surged, chromatophores pulsing over her body. Maradella The gentle impact came unspectacularly, with a silent turning of digits from negative to positive. There was a small splash of gray dust, and then Mara could see the ship, a green-gold fragment of Earth embedded in the hide of the asteroid. On the interior camera image, Sheena, free of her waldos, was jetting from one side of her habitat to another, stopping to stare at the asteroid landscape with her dark, saucer-like eyes before racing for a different view, her carapace flashing colors, posturing elaborately with her head and mantle and arms and tentacles. Mara sneaked a peek at the faces in the audience. Everyone was grinning. Dan, tell us what she's saying. Hesitantly, Dan translated. I am strong and fit. I am large and fierce. See my weapons? See my strength? A mixture of mating signals and dimatic patterns designed to drive off predators. See those fake eye rings? Dan turned to his audience, grinning. She's bragging. That's what this means. It seems we have reached Krufni. The applause swelled. The chairwoman on the stage hugged Danny Stavo, and Mara found herself with tears in her eyes. Damn this space stuff, she thought. Why does it have to be so magnificent? Sheena Five And on Krufni Drifting in cool earth water, Sheena Five could feel the feather touch of new gravity. Above her, the sky wheeled, the sun's glare cycling to the dazzle of a billion stars. She could feel how she was spinning, wheeling in three-dimensional space as this small world turned. Beneath the translucent skin of the habitat, she could see a grainy, gray-black ground. Dan had told her it was a substance older than all the rocks of the earth, older than the oceans themselves, older perhaps than the solar system. And through the curving walls of the ship, she was able to see this world's jagged horizon barely tens of yards away. She flashed her triumph, her mantle skin tingling as the tiny muscles pulsed her chromatophores. Gabriel Marcus some minor planets, of course, already have roles in astrology. Since these worlds weren't known to the ancients, their roles are the subject of modern interpretation and some debate. So it is proving with Krufni. Perhaps we can take some guidance from the derivation of the name. The Krufni was the old Irish name for the Pictish people. In the 12th century Irish document, List of Pictish Kings, Krufni is given as the eponymous ancestor of the Pictish people. And it was his seven sons who gave their names to the divisions of the Pict Kingdom in Scotland. 
but the Cruthney was also used by the Irish to describe a group of aboriginal people living in Ireland before the coming of the Gaels. They seemed to have been at one time the predominant power in Ulster. A further blurring of the name's meaning comes from the fact that some early writers claim that Pictish lineage was traditionally taken from the mother's line, not the father's. So perhaps Cruthney, if such an individual existed at all, was not a man but a woman. As far as its astronomical properties go, Cruthney is again an unusual world. Perhaps uniquely among astrological subjects, it wanders far from the plane of the elliptic and far from the traditional houses. In fact, at times, it can be seen by telescope above or beneath Earth's poles. And yet it is intimately linked to Earth. We know that its peculiar horseshoe orbit is dominated by Earth's gravity. And, of course, the most direct link of all has now been established as the squid Sheena has become the first Earth creature since the Apollo astronauts to reach another world. Cruthney, mother, father, person, and people, linked to Earth by spidery webs of influence into life. Little wonder that this tiny, remote, ambiguous world is causing such a stir in astrological circles. It is, of course, true, but irrelevant, that the name Cruthney was a late choice among the Australian astronomers who named the minor planet. An earlier suggestion was an irreverent nickname for one of their number, the Chunder Wonder. We can be grateful, if not surprised, that destiny guided the correct choice. Sheena 5 She could not leave her water habitat, yet she was able to explore... Small firefly robots set off from the habitat, picking their way carefully over the surface of the asteroid. Each robot was laden with miniature instruments as exquisite as coral, all beyond her understanding. But the fireflies were under her control. She used the Waldo, the glove-like device into which she could slip her long prehensile arms and so control the delicate motions of each firefly. Cameras mounted in the carapace of the firefly brought her a view through her laser eye cup of what the firefly was seeing, as if she were swimming alongside it. The gravity was so low that a careless movement would have sent the little metal devices spinning away from the surface to be lost forever. So the limbs of the fireflies carried hooks and suction devices to ensure that at every moment they were anchored to the thin regolith. And, with delicacy and care, she was able to ensure the fireflies avoided ravines and deep craters and so were never in danger. Her fireflies scuttled hundreds of yards from the slumped membrane of Nautilus. Sheena thought all this was remarkable. She had come to awareness in a universe that was three-dimensional and infinite. Slowly she had come to understand that the ocean she inhabited was part of the skin of a giant sphere. She had seen that ocean world from outside, seen it diminish to a pale dot of light. And now she had come to a world that was so small she felt she could enclose its curve in her outstretched arms, and her eyes picked out the starry universe through which this little world swam. Entranced, munching absently on the krill the currents brought to her beak, she watched the new world, her world, unfold. Her world. She had not expected to feel like this, so triumphant. Her weariness, her edgy isolation, were forgotten now. She pulsed with pride her chromatophores prickling, and she knew at last she was ready. Emma Stoney Mission control for the Nautilus was not what Emma had come to expect from cliché images of Houston. The rows of gleaming terminals, the neat ranks of young, bespectacled engineers sweating through their neat shirts as the astronauts ran into yet another crisis in orbit. That was the manned space program. This was rather different. The JPL flight operations room was cluttered, cramped, the decor very dated. There were big mass storage units and immense filing cabinets, some of them open to reveal yellowing files, mounds of paper. Everything looked stale, aging. Dan had a cubicle to himself. He had a soft screen draped over his lap, and he wore a virtual reality helmet that fitted tightly over his head like a swimming cap, hiding his eyes behind rubber pads. There was kipple everywhere, pictures of the Nautilus leaving orbit, shots of the ship splashing against the rock, pinups of Sheena Five herself, and a lot of the usual techie junk. Toy spaceships and plastic aliens and soda cans and candy wrappers and movie posters. Dan turned to them and smiled. 
It was disconcerting, but his eyes concealed. Yo, Malenfant, Emma, welcome to the Geekosphere. Maybe for him, they were floating against coal-black Pruthney, but she noticed he seemed to be able to work his soft screen despite its awkward draping over his lap without glancing down. You want coffee or soda? There's a shit machine. Just give me some news, Dan, Malenfant said, as good as possible. His voice sounded tight with stress. Dan pushed his VR hood off his face. His eyes were reddened and sore, and the mask had left white marks across his forehead and cheeks. Pay dirt, he said. The carbonaceous ore contains hydrogen, nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide and dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ammonia... Water? Emma asked. He nodded. Oh, yes. As permafrost and hydrated minerals. Twenty percent by mass, by God. Every prediction fulfilled, exceeded, in fact. Malenfant smacked his hands together. It's a warehouse up there. Dan plastered a big soft screen over the posters and photos and memos and other crap on the wall and tapped its surface. Up came an image of the asteroid's surface, gritty and crumpled, Emma thought, like roadside slush. And there was one of the micro-robots they were calling fireflies. As she watched, a tiny puff of vapor vented from the base of the firefly. It jetted sharply up away from the asteroid ground, swiveled neatly, then shot out a little dart that trailed a fine cable like fishing line. The dart buried itself in the loose rock. The line went taut and began to haul itself in, neatly dragging the firefly back to the surface. The fireflies are working great, Dan said. We should be able to find a hundred applications for these babies. In LEO, other asteroids, even on the moon. The propulsion system is neat. It's a digital propulsion chip. A little bank of solid rocket motors, and you can address the motors individually. Pop, 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 to get a high degree of maneuverability and control. Emma asked, And Sheena is running these things? Oh, yes, Dan grinned proudly. She has a big Waldo glove in the habitat. She can fit her whole body right inside. Of course, that took some designing. Because she lacks bones, Sheena doesn't have a good sense of where her arms are in space. So the Waldos feed back information about pressure and texture. She does a fine job. She can run eight of these babies at once. In many ways, she's smarter than we are. And yet we set her out there to die, Emma said. There was an uncomfortable silence, as if she'd been impolite to mention such a thing. Dan pulled his VR mask over his face and started to scroll through more results from the asteroid, and Emma went in search of a coffee machine. Sheena 5 And on Cruthany, Sheena laid her eggs. They were cased in jelly sacks, hundreds of them in each tube. There was no spawning ground here, of course, so she draped the egg sacks over the knot of machinery at the heart of her miniature ocean, which had now anchored itself to the surface of Cruthany. The gardens of egg cases dangled there, soft and organic, against the hard machinery. Small schools of fish came to nose at the eggs. She watched until she was sure that the fish were repelled by the jelly that coated the eggs, which was its purpose. She had no instinct to return to the eggs to cradle them, but she knew this was an unusual circumstance. The small ball of water collapsed to a fat lens against the asteroid was no enriching ocean. So she developed a habit of visiting the eggs every few hours, of squirting gentle water jets over them to keep them aerated. All this was out of sight of Dan's cameras. She did not tell him what she had done. End of side four. 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 Five. Time. By Stephen Baxter. Continuing on page 137. Michael. More children arrived, but now they seemed bewildered and frightened. They always had blue circles crudely stitched onto their shirts or jackets. The children would complain and cry until they learned the first of the rules Michael had learned, which was never to complain or cry. Some children were taken away, too. Many were taken by concerned-looking people who would put their arms around a frightened child. Michael didn't know what this meant. Perhaps it was a trick. The children taken away all had white skin. The children who were brought in mostly had black or brown skin. 
Soon most of the children who were left behind, including Michael, had brown or black skin. He didn't know what this meant either. One day he saw a brother wearing a gold ring. Michael was fascinated by the gold, the deep luster of the time-stretched electrons in its structure. He came forward and stared at it. The brother smiled at him and held out his hand so he could see. Then, without warning, the brother swung back his arm and slammed his fist into the side of Michael's head. Michael could feel the ring dig into his flesh, warm blood spurting. The brother smiled and walked away. To his shame, Michael was crying. He ran back to his dormitory. He ran across the floor toward his pallet. But there was his sister here, and she grabbed his arm and shouted at him. He didn't understand, but then she pointed at the floor. He had left a trail of blood. He had to get a mop and bucket and scrape his drying blood off the floor. But still the blood flowed, and he had to work harder to keep it off the floor, and it seemed as if it would never stop. That snapshot, the incident with the ring, divided Michael's life in two, as light from dark. The visitors grew fewer until they stopped coming altogether, and the lessons were more infrequent. Sometimes they were replaced by work sessions, in which the children had to paint the huts or clean floors or mop out the toilet blocks. Sometimes they were just canceled altogether. The refrigerators and bowls of food were taken away. Now there was only food at meal times, twice a day. The children were no longer issued fresh clothes. They were given shirts and shorts and shoes that were marked with small blue circles, just one set per child. The clothes soon became dirty and threadbare. The last lessons were stopped, and the soft screens were taken away. Many of the children wept and fought at that, but not Michael. He had expected this to happen some day. The school had been like a strange dream anyway. He would be able to work in his head, as long as he was left alone, as he had been in the village. Emma Stoney each morning now, Emma had to run the gauntlet of the noisy mobs outside Bootstrap's Vegas office. This morning, as her car approached, a few of them burst through the police line. The car sensed warm human bodies ahead and slowed to a halt. Emma made sure her windows were sealed up, overrode the smart drive, and inched the car forward. Slowly, the people parted, but not before they got close enough to scream in through the windscreen at her. There were ecotypes in body paint, a lot of religious groups she couldn't identify, and also counter-protesters, people actually in favor of Bootstrap and its projects, mostly young white males with U.S. flags and other national emblems, chanting about pioneers and the new frontier. Some of them wore animated T-shirts with an image of Malenfant making a speech somewhere, a few words and a smile, cycled over and over on a crumpled cloth. She grimaced. She wondered how much money some remote corner of Bootstrap was making out of that. A line of cops, supplemented by company security people, racking up one hell of an expense, as Emma knew too well, kept the factions apart. Here was a beefy guy with shaved hair, dressed in a green T-shirt and pants as if he were some kind of veteran. He was limping, one of his legs betraying him. He was carrying a blown-up picture of a sickly-looking kid blowing candles on a birthday cake. He was shouting, Yellow babies! Look what you did, Malenfant! Look what you did! Emma recoiled from his anger. But once she was inside, and the gate had sealed itself shut behind her, she couldn't even hear the protesters' chants anymore, only a soft white noise, barely audible, like rushing water. Almost soothing. She arrived at the conference room late. She took a seat quietly at the back of the darkened, half-empty room and tried to follow what was going on. George Hench was chairing an engineering seminar on the design of a HAB module for the proposed human-manned follow-up missions to Kruthny. At the front of the room, a technical type was standing at a lectern. A soft screen the size of a curtain was hanging on the wall behind him. Other techs sat around the first few rows, their arms draped over the backs of their chairs, their feet up before them. These technicians were mostly men, mostly badly dressed, generally bearded. They were laden with doctorates and other qualifications. Many of them came from NASA itself, from corners of that sprawling bureaucratic empire called things like the Mission Definition Office or the Mars Exploration Studies Office. Behind each of these guys lay a whole fleet of beautiful spacecraft that had existed only in blueprints and mass estimates and a few items of demonstration technology and that had landed on the moon or Mars only in clean, software-generated NASA imagery and in the dreams of their creators. 
After Malenfant's electrifying first launch and his announcement that he was proposing manned missions to Kruthny and beyond, and despite the outstanding legal difficulties the company faced, Bootstrap had had no difficulty recruiting guys like these. The speaker was describing the high-level design of the Kruthny mission's HAB module. He spoke in a mumble directly to his soft screen, and the screen behind him showed a blizzard of bewildering images. The HAB was little more than a can, fifteen yards long. It had a small earth return capsule, a cone shape like an Apollo capsule, glued to its lower end. The capsule would also serve as a solar storm shelter. Big wing-like solar cell panels were fixed to struts extending from the can's sides. Various antennae, thruster assemblies, and ports were visible through layers of powder-white insulation blankets. It reminded Emma a little of prehistoric images of Skylab. But in the animated image, the hab was spinning end over end to provide the crew with artificial gravity, at least at the can's extremities. The speaker made great play of the mass limitations the craft was going to work under. It seemed that the whole design was right at the limit of what Malenfant's BDB could throw into space. Life support systems engineering was far from Emma's area of expertise. But attending meetings like this was all part of her general ongoing strategy to contain Reed Malenfant. She'd been around Malenfant long enough to know that it was worth her while to cast her net as wide as possible, to follow as much as possible, to anticipate as much as she could. Because even here at the heart of Reed Malenfant's secretive empire, she could never be sure under which rock the next rattlesnake lay coiled. It was characteristic of Malenfant to be pressing ahead with the design, assembly, and even fabrication of his asteroid pioneer spacecraft while the slow wheels of official approval still ground on. Not only that, he had become even more unobtainable than usual because he had lost himself into every aspect of the training of Bootstrap's cadre of prospective astronauts, even to the extent of racking up flying hours and time in the centrifuge. Meanwhile, Bootstrap's destiny remained unresolved. The fact that this next flight would, if it flew at all, be carrying human passengers just made the bureaucratic tangle that much worse. It had shocked Emma to learn that even comparatively unambitious human space flights incurred a lot of danger, much of it unacceptable to bodies like OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Beyond the shelter of Earth's magnetic field, for example, the astronauts would be bombarded by radiation, sporadically violent flares from the sun, and a steady drizzle of fast-moving cosmic rays, relics from remote parts of the universe, a single particle of which, George Hench had once told her, could pack as much punch as a baseball. Then there were the familiar hazards of zero gravity, bone decalcification, immune and cardiovascular system degradation, muscular atrophy, Emma formed a bleak image of the crew limping across space in a cramped, stinking, spinning module, earnestly pounding away at their treadmills just to keep alive, cowering every time the sun belched. There was something un-American about it, she thought, something dogged and Soviet. What might save Bootstrap was once again the weakness and ambiguity of the current regulatory regime. For example, OSHA actually had no radiation exposure standards for human exploration missions. NASA had adopted supplementary standards drawn up by bodies like the National Academy of Sciences and the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements as the agency standard for crew dose limits. But even then, NASA had left loopholes, saying the standards should be applied to all but exceptional exploration missions. Where NASA led, Reed Malenfant was happy to follow. The presenter was nearing the end of his talk, and he had started to wax philosophical. Before Copernicus, humans believed humanity was walled off from the heavens by a set of crystal spheres. Well, those spheres are still there, but they aren't made of glass, but of fear. Let's do this. Let's smash those spheres. Whoops, raised fists, a scattering of applause. These technicians had tunnel vision, she thought. To them, the mission was everything, the various obstacles of frustration that stopped them from doing things. And when they were forced to confront those obstacles, they resorted to hopeful button-pushing. Ptolemaic spheres, the frontier, the American dream, can-do attitude, the spirit of Wright and Lindbergh and Armstrong, the organizational will that enabled us to cover a continent, win the Second World War, blah, blah. But, she thought... 
Maybe they had to be that way to get anything done at all. Dreams had to be uncomplicated to be achievable. Now another technician got up to show a new type of chart. It represented a flow of raw materials to a schematic of the Habs manufacture. Electrical components from factories around the United States, structural parts from the big aerospace companies, raw materials from a variety of producers, a web of sources, flows, and sinks. There was one box at the lower left corner that Emma had trouble reading. She sat forward and squinted. The source box was marked Doomray, and the product flowing out of it was Enriched U-235. And Emma had spotted her rattlesnake. She got out of her seat and slipped out of the room. When she got back to her office, she booted up her soft screen and started to find out about Doomray. And immediately after that, she booked a flight to Scotland. She arrived at a place called a Sandside, a tiny village, just holiday homes and a pub. She got out of the car, a smart drive, and climbed a low hill at the edge of the village. She was on the north coast of Scotland, just a few miles from John O'Groats, the miniature tourist trap that was the northernmost point of mainland Britain. There was a sweeping beach before her, and then the sea itself, wild and gray under a flat lid of sky. On the horizon, she glimpsed more land masses, the old man of Hoy and the Orkneys. It was a rugged place suffused by wind noise, poised between sea and sky, and the wind seemed to suck the warmth from the core of her body. And there, sprawled across the eastern horizon, was Doonray, a mile-long sprawl of buildings, a giant golf ball shape, huge gray and brown sheds and chimneys. Somehow, oddly, even though she knew what this place represented, it did not offend the eye. Here came Malenfant, his gaunt frame swathed in a giant quilted coat. He climbed up the little hillock beside her. "'You look ill,' she said. He shrugged. "'I don't think the climate suits me, even though I've got some Scottish blood. Maybe all that Vegas sunshine has diluted it.' "'What have you been up to this time, Malenfant?' he sighed. "'Doing what needs to be done.' She faced him. "'Listen to me for once, you asshole.' If you're planning to launch nuclear materials into space, if you're even intending to move nuke stuff around the planet, you're committing a whole series of offenses. And if you're going to involve bootstrap in that, if you're going to involve me, then tell me about it. I will, I will, he soothed. But we don't have a choice. Oh, Malenfant, you never do. He took her arm and they walked along the hillock. He picked out some of the sights of Dune Ray for her. This was the second largest nuclear installation in Britain, after Sellafield. Once it had generated power, made medical isotopes, run three reprocessing lines and a nuclear waste packaging plant. The golf ball shape was a fast reactor, built in 1959. It had caught fire and overheated several times. Now it was shut down and preserved bizarrely by a heritage ministry. The big gray sheds were for reprocessing nuclear waste extracting usable fuel from spent material. Behind the golf ball, there was a waste shaft 200 feet deep that contained 15,000 tons of waste mixed with uranium and plutonium. It was very unstable. It had already suffered two hydrogen explosions, spraying radioactive waste everywhere. Jesus, she said. What a folly. Another generation's dreams of cheap power, and we have to live with the shit forevermore. Well, it didn't go entirely to plan, he conceded. Originally, this was going to be a nuclear park, six reactors, but the technology was ahead of its time. Ahead of its time? Everything was within the guidelines of the time. Even the secrecy, if you want to know. You have to remember it was the Cold War. They didn't have the same obsession with safety we have now. An obsession that has fronted us since, conservatively, 1970. And guess what? The local people now love the plant. If it never produces another watt, Dune Ray is going to be around for a hundred years. Four generations of high-quality, highly skilled local employment, because it will take that long to decommission it. So tell me something else. If the U.K. government shut this place down in the 1990s, how come you managed to acquire enriched uranium here? He said gently. There's nothing illegal. My God, Malenfant. Look. He dug a small, crumpled, soft screen out of his pocket, unfolded it with stiff fingers. 
It showed an image of something like a rocket engine, a sky-blue nozzle mounted by complex machinery, tall and skinny. The diagram was labeled with spidery text, much too small to read. Malenfant said, This is what we're building. It's a nuclear reactor designed for space missions. Here's the reactor at the top. He pointed with a thumbnail and worked his way down. Then you have pumps, shielding, and a radiator. The whole thing stands about twelve feet tall, weighs about a ton. The reactor has a thermal output of a hundred and thirty-five kilowatts, an electrical supply of forty kilowatts. Emma, you have to understand, if we have humans aboard a new Nautilus, we have a mission in order of magnitude more power-hungry than Sheena's. And then there are the power requirements for surface operations. To generate the juice we need from a solar array, you'd need an area half the size of a football field, and weighing maybe ten times as much. Even the BDB couldn't lift it. And this is what you're planning to build? Oh, you're already building these things, right? He looked pleased with himself. Look what I did. We hired Russian engineers, dug some of them out of retirement, in fact. The U.S. never developed nuclear power sources beyond the radioisotope heat generators we flew on unmanned missions. In fact, the Clinton administration shut down our space nuclear power research program. What can you do but condemn that? When we gave up nuclear power, we gave up the future. But the Russians flew nuclear power sources on reconnaissance missions back in the 1960s, and they even test flew a design called Topaz, which is what we based this baby on. Of course, we were able to tune the design a hell of a lot. Malenfant, he tapped the little screen. All we need is 50 pounds of enriched U-235 in the form of uranium dioxide pellets. The moderator is zirconium hydride, and you control the reaction by rotating these cylinders on the outside of the core, which... How are you smuggling this shit into the Mojave? Smuggling is a harsh word. Come on, Malenfant. Those desert skies are pretty clear... Surveillance satellites. You really want to know? All the satellite's orbital elements are on the net. You can work out where they will be at any minute. You just shut down until they've passed overhead. Even better, make sure you hit the night shift at the National Imagery and Mapping Agency down at Fairfax. There's always something more interesting to look at than pictures of an old buzzard like me jerking off in the desert. Act now, justify later, like the BDB launch, like most of the actions in your life. Emma, you have to trust me on this one. If I can run a topaz or two, prove it's safe, I can get the authorizations I need. But I have to get the nuke stuff to run the tests in the first place. And the citizens of Las Vegas have to trust you, too, until enriched uranium comes raining down out of the sky. You know you're a dreamer, Malenfant. You actually believe that one day we will all come to our senses and agree with you and hail you as a hero. I'm already a hero, he winked. There are T-shirts that say it. Look, Emma, I won't pretend I'm happy with everything I'm having to do, no more than you are. But we have to go on. It's not just bootstrap, the profits, not even about the big picture, our future in space. Cornelius, the Carter catastrophe. Messages from the future. The Eiter. I know how you're dealing with this. You've put it all in a box in your mind that you only open when you have to. But it's real, Emma. We both saw those neutron pulses. Neutrinos, Malenfant, she said gently. We're in this too deep, Emma. We have to go on. She closed her eyes. Malenfant, patience has always been your strength. You don't need lousy Russian reactors and dubious uranium shipments. Take your time and find another way to build your spaceship. His voice was strained. I can't. And of course, she knew that. He bent down and kissed the top of her head. She sighed. You know I won't betray you. I've been sucked in too deep with you for a long time, for half my life. But do you ever consider the ethics of implicating me and others in this kind of shit? You have to be open with me, Malenfant. I will, he said. I promise. She knew, of course, that he was lying. In fact, she was more useful to him if she didn't know. It made her denials that much more effective. It probably even protected her a little, too. But that wouldn't be uppermost in his mind. It was just an incidental. 
What drove Malentant was maximizing her utility in the drive toward his ultimate goals, just like any of the tools he deployed. She understood all that. What she really didn't know in her heart of hearts was why she continued to put up with it. She linked her arm through his, and they huddled together against the wind, licking over Dunray. Mist swept in off the sea, covering the plant in grayness. Read Malenfant. How can we turn asteroid rock into rocket fuel? Sounds like magic, doesn't it? First, we'll crack asteroid water into hydrogen and oxygen with electrolysis. Remember high school science classes, the Pyrex beakers and the wires and the batteries? All you have to do is pass an electric current through water to break it down. That's what we do. But the units we use are a little more advanced. Slide, please. This is a solid polymer electrolyte, or SPE electrolyzer. What you have is sandwiched layers of electrolyte impregnated plastic separated by metal meshes. The whole assembly is compressed by metal rods running the length of the stack. SPEs have been used extensively on nuclear submarines and on the space station. They run for thousands of hours without maintenance. As for the methane, we will extract some directly from the asteroid material and more by processing carbon dioxide. We use something called a Sabatier reactor. Slide. We liquefy the hydrogen from the electrolyzer banks and feed it into the reactor with carbon dioxide. Out the other side comes water and methane, which is just a compound of carbon and hydrogen. The reaction is very efficient, 99% in fact, and is exothermic, which means it requires no input of heat to make it work, just the presence of a ruthenium catalyst. Sabatier units have been used in space before for life support applications. They have been tested by NASA and the Air and Space Force and have also been used on the space station. There is further information in your packs on how we intend to optimize the ratios of the methane-oxygen bipropellant and various subsidiary processes we need. We can show you a demonstration breadboard prototype. Oxygen-hydrogen is, of course, the most powerful chemical rocket propellant of all. But hydrogen is difficult to liquefy and store. Low temperature, large bulk. Methane is like oxygen, a soft cryogenic, and that guided our choice. All this sounds exotic, but what we have here is very robust engineering, gaslight-era stuff, technologies centuries old, in fact. It's just a novel application. Ladies and gentlemen, mining an asteroid is easy. Slide, please. Sheena 5 The babies were already being hatched, popping out of their dissolving eggs one by one, wriggling away, alert, active, questioning. With gentle jets of water, she coaxed them toward the seagrass where they would browse until they were mature. She tried not to think about what would happen then. Meanwhile, she had work to do. When Sheena powered up the rock eater, she was more nervous than at any time since the landing itself. She lay as still as she could inside her Waldo glove and tried to sense the eater's systems, the gripping tracks that dug into the asteroid's loose surface, the big gaping scoop of a mouth at the front, the furnace in its belly like a warm heart, as if she herself had become the fat, clanking machine that would soon scuttle crab-like across the asteroid floor. She understood why she felt so tense. The rock eater was a complex machine. It would need monitoring as it chewed its way around the asteroid to make sure it didn't burrow too deeply into the surface or spin its tracks on some loose patch of rock and throw itself into the emptiness of space beyond retrieval. But it was no more difficult to control in principle than the little firefly robots, and she was used to them by now. In fact, she had come to enjoy deploying six, seven, eight of them at once, a shoal of robots relishing the chance to show off her skill to Dan. It wasn't even the importance of this operation for her mission that made her anxious. She knew the fireflies had done no more than measure, weigh, analyze, monitor. Now, for the first time, she was going to do something that would change the asteroid, to make something out of its loose, ancient substance. To fail would mean that she could not succeed with her great task of bringing this asteroid's incomprehensible riches back to Earth. But that wasn't why she was so anxious. To fail would mean that her young would die here as she would, cut off from the shoal for no reason. That was what mattered to her. 
To die was one thing. To die for no purpose was quite another. It was a fear that never left her, a knowledge that seemed to circle around her like a predator waiting for her to weaken. Therefore, exhausted, aging as she was, she would not weaken, would not fail. It was time. She pushed at the glove, and she felt the eater dig its scoop-like jaw into the loose soil at the surface of Kruthni. Her first motions were clumsy. From the micro-cameras embedded in the eater's upper surface, she saw chunks of regolith sail up before her, dust and larger fragments. The fragments disappeared from her view, following loose, looping paths. Some of them escaped the asteroid's tiny gravity field altogether and sailed off on new orbits of their own, new baby asteroids circling the sun. Patiently, she slowed, tried again, adjusted the angle of the scoop and the speed at which it plowed into the surface. Soon she had it right, and a steady stream of asteroid rock worked its way in through the scoop to the eater's hopper. Now little belts and shovels forced the captured regolith into the processing chambers. First the ore was ground up and sieved by rocking mechanical jaws and rollers and vibrating filter screens. Next, magnetic fields sucked out nickel-iron metal granules. Then the crushed ore was passed to a furnace that was powered by the sun's focused heat. Liquid, baked from the rock, began to gather in the condenser tanks, big low-gravity globules drifting around the thin walls. This one roving rock-eater, patiently working its way over the asteroid's surface, would deliver pounds of precious water every day from the unpromising rock of the asteroid. The water would be processed further and used in many of the other more complex machines. And so this asteroid would be transformed from a lump of ancient slag into something wonderful, something alive. When she was happy with the eater's operation, she pulled herself out of the glove. She swam down to where the pipe trailing back from the eater met the habitat membrane, and she found a trickle of fresh asteroid water. She swam through the asteroid stream, let it wash under her carapace and through her gills. It was warm, perhaps from the heater at the heart of the rock-eating robot, and there was only a trickle of it seeping into the great mass of the habitat. But Sheena swam back and forth through it, her hide pulsing excitedly. She was the first creature from Earth to swim in water not of her native planet, water that had formed before the sun itself, water that had lain dormant, bound into this dark lump of rock, until she had liberated it. She knew this was Dan's mission, not hers. She knew she was Dan's creature, not her own. But she was proud, because she was the first. No other creature who had ever lived or ever would live could claim this honor from her. She swooped and pulsed her joy. Sheena sent the fireflies to converge at one pole of Kruthni. There, patiently, piece by piece, she had them assemble a small chemical factory, pipes and tanks and pumps, and a single flaring nozzle that pointed to the sky. Borers began to dig into the surface of Kruthni, drawing up surface regolith and the rock and ice that lay deeper within. Precious solar panels spread over the dusty surface of the asteroid provided power via cables strung out over the regolith. The factory began its work, turning ancient asteroid rock into something new. The whole process, to take ancient rock and dice and to transform it into something new, seemed remarkable to Sheena. At last, under Sheena's control, simple valves clicked open. Through firefly cameras, the images were relayed to the laser projectors cupped over her eyes. Sheena could see a flame erupt from the nozzle, flaring up into the sky. And now combustion products emerged, ice crystals that caught the sunlight, receding in perfectly straight lines. It was a fire fountain, quite beautiful. Humans could control operations from Earth from now on. Asteroid water and raw and processed rock would be swallowed into giant bags and pushed by rockets like this test rig, steered through the empty ocean of space toward Earth as if by a squid's mantle jet. Dan would tell her there was much celebration within Bootstrap. He did not say so, but Sheena understood that this was mainly because she had finished her task before dying. She turned away from the Waldo glove and the imagers, the human machines, and sought out her young. 
They were growing explosively quickly, converting half of all the food they ate to body mass. At first, they had been asocial, foraging alone in the beds of seagrass. But already, though still tiny, they had developed shoals. She watched the males fighting, aggressive signaling, fin beating, chasing, and fleeing. Miniature battles that prefigured the greater conflicts to come at breeding time. Some of the young were already hunting the smaller fish, adopting behavior patterns her kind were hatched with, even talking to each other in the simple, rich sign language that Dan said was hardwired into their brains by millions of generations of ancestors. I am large and fierce. Look at my weapons. I am seagrass. I am no squid. I am strong. Look at me. She knew that Dan must be aware of the existence of the young by now. The growing imbalance in the small ecosphere could surely not be ignored, but he said nothing, and she volunteered nothing. Most of the young were dumb. Four were smart. She took the smart ones to one side. She swam at the heart of this small shoal. She was growing old now, and she tired easily. Nevertheless, she taught the smart ones how to hunt, sophisticated techniques beyond their dumber siblings. She taught them how to lure foolish fish. They would hold up their arms with blanched tips waving them, distracting the attention of the fish from the far more dangerous tentacles waiting to strike. She taught them how to stalk, gradually approaching a fish from behind where its vision was poorest. She taught them how to chase, pursuing fleeing prey with careful watchfulness until close enough to make the final decisive lunge. She taught them to hunt, disguised. They would mimic sargassum weed, hanging in the water with arms dangling, ready to dart out at incautious fish. Or they would swim backward with false eye spots and arms held together and waved like the tail of a fish. They practiced on the smaller fish, and some of them eyed the other squid, their siblings. She taught them about the reef, the many creatures that lived and died there, how they worked together, even as they competed and fought and hunted. She tried to teach them about predators. She role-played, swooping down on them like a moray eel, trying to catch them with her arms and beak. But they were young and agile and easily evaded her, and she sensed they did not believe her stories of monsters that could nip off a squid's arms or even swallow a squid whole, enhanced brain or not. And she taught them language, the abstract signs Dan had given her. As soon as they had the language, their mantles rippled with questions. Who, why, where, what, how? She did not always have answers. But she showed them the machinery that kept them alive and taught them about the stars and the sun and the nature of the world and universe and about humans. The young ones seemed to understand very quickly that Sheena and all her young would soon exhaust the resources of this one habitat. The habitat had been designed to support one squid herself for a fixed period of time, a time that was almost expired. Already there had been a number of problems with the tightly enclosed environment loops, unpredictable crashes and blooms in the phytoplankton population, depletions or excessive concentrations of trace elements, and corresponding impacts on the krill and the fish. The young were very smart. Soon they were able to think in ways that were beyond Sheena herself. For instance, they said, perhaps they should not simply repair this fabric shell, but extend it. Perhaps, said the young, they should even make new domes and fill them with water. Sheena, trained only to complete her primary mission, found this a very strange thought. There weren't enough fish, never enough krill. The waters were stale and crowded. This was clearly unacceptable. So the smart young hunted down their dumb siblings one by one and consumed their passive bodies until only these four and Sheena were left. Michael. His memories were jumbled. When tourists had come to the village, they would take snapshots with their cameras, and sometimes they would send them to the village. Michael would see himself in the pictures, a person who no longer existed, smiling up at somebody who was no longer there, like two ghosts. Sometimes the pictures would arrive out of order, so he would see himself in a T-shirt with a hole in it, and in the next picture, there he would be, a little shorter maybe, with the T-shirt magically fixed. When he had been taken out of the village, he had understood almost none of what happened to him, and his memories had become jumbled, like the snapshots. 
But there was still a sky above him, with stars and a moon, even though they were in different places from when he was in the village. And when he closed his eyes, on his pallet at night, in the stillness of his blanket, with no sound or sensation, he could feel deep inside himself that time wore on, passing inexorably, measured invisibly by the evolution of his own thoughts. It didn't matter that his memories didn't make sense, that what had happened to him had no logic or explanation. It was enough that he knew, deep inside, that the universe still worked. The rules here and the school became simple. Food was everything. You could not be sure when another meal might come, so you had to eat or hoard every scrap of food you could find. In fact, it was better to hoard as much as possible, to hide it in your clothes or in a cache, like Michael's store and the wall of the dormitory hut, to make it last longer. If you had food, you had power. If another had food, they had power over you. There were other rules. For example, at night, the children were not allowed to go outside their dormitory room to relieve themselves. There was always a sister or a brother in the dormitory to ensure this was so. There was a single slop bucket at night set in the middle of the floor. It was not big enough and soon filled up. If it spilled on the floor, you would be punished. If you made a mess, if you wet your bed or relieved yourself where you shouldn't, you would be punished. Many of the younger children were quite clumsy, and so would often knock over the bucket or otherwise mess the place up. They were punished often. At night, Michael would hear children crying in pain as they tried to resist the temptation to use the bucket. And he would hear Anna's quiet, grave voice helping them stay quiet, overcome the discomfort. New children, arriving here in their shirts marked with crude blue circles, would often cry and complain and suffer when they broke the rules. They soon learned, however. Michael had one possession he cared about. It was the flashlight Steph had given him. Michael used the flashlight sparingly, and the new batteries had hardly dimmed. At night, he would crawl under his bed in utter silence. He had some pieces of scrap metal into which he had knocked small holes with a headless nail. He shone the flashlight on one metal scrap and looked at the spot of yellow light he cast on the wall. He saw a bright central spot surrounded by a band of half-shadow and darkness beyond. Then he put another scrap in that spot, punctured by a second hole, so that the light he cast was stretched thinner. The spot of light cast by the second hole was different. He saw the central spot and the outer darkness, but between them there were intricate patterns of light and dark, concentric rings. There was color here, blue and orange and red rings overlapping. The rings in the silent dark were quite beautiful. He was seeing waves like ripples on a pond, places where the bits of light, photons, were washing against each other, falling together in the bright places or nudging each other out of the way in the dark. He found a scrap of cellophane, bright blue, and put that over one of the holes. Now he saw a simpler system of concentric rings, painted in blue only. He found the blue circles comforting. He imagined they were doors painted on the wall, and that he might pass through them to go home to the village or somewhere even better. He kept pulling his apparatus apart. Perhaps he could stretch it so much that only one light bit at a time, one photon, would pass through the holes. He never managed that, but it didn't matter. He could see in his mind what the result would be. He could see a stream of photons speckling against the wall, nudging and jostling, working together to make the glowing bands. But one photon alone, separate from the others, was like a thrown stone. What was affecting it? How could it know which parts of the wall to land on and which not? The answer was obvious. The photon was being nudged and jostled into the right place, just as it had been when part of a flood. So there must be things coming from the holes to jostle the photon, even when only one photon at a time passed through the holes. Those things behaved exactly like photons, except he could not see them. They were ghost photons, he thought, partners of the real one, the one he could see. The real photon reached forward in time, inquiring, and a flood of ghosts from the future came crowding back in time along every possible path it could take. And yet they were real, for they jostled the genuine photon just as if it were part of a dense bright beam. For every photon there was an uncounted flood of ghosts, of possible futures, 
just as real as the photon he saw. And so, surrounding every person, there must be a flood of future ghosts representing all the unrealized possibilities, all equally real. Michael, with his flashlight and metal scraps, surrounded by ghosts, smiled in the dark. Perhaps the future Michaels were happy. One day a brother found his food cache and the flashlight and the scraps of metal all buried in the wall. The children in the dormitory were made to stand in a line before their beds while the brother barked at them. Michael did not understand the words, but he knew what would happen. The brother wanted the owner of the cache to step forward. If nobody volunteered as responsible, all the children would be beaten, and then, when the brothers were gone, the other children would beat Michael. Still, he waited. Sometimes a child, one who was not responsible, would step forward and take the punishment for another. Anna often did this, but today she was not here. Michael had done it once to spare a sickly boy. Today, nobody came forward. Michael took a step. His punishment was severe. And later the brother stamped on the flashlight, smashing it. Michael was made to sweep up the pieces, the bits of broken glass with his bare hands. The fragments of glass that stuck in his fingers made them bleed for days. Shit Cola Marketing Adopt a Baby Space Squid Thanks to Shit's commercial tie-up with the Bootstrap Corporation, we can offer a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to purchasers of Shit Cola or other Shit products to become official adopters of one of the infant squid on the asteroid Kruthni. Every squid is different. We have recognition software designed in conjunction with leading scientists that can distinguish your baby squid by its shape, markings, and characteristic movements. You can name him, her, monitor his, her progress, even, pending legal approval, send him, her messages, and tell him, her something of yourself. Numbers are limited. To apply, laser swipe 100 pull tabs from cans of Chick Cola or related soft drink products and mail the codes together with your completion in no more than ten words of the phrase, Shit will be the downstream drink of choice because, to the following E address. Mara Della. When the storm broke about the baby squid, Mara flew straight out to Vegas to confront Malenfant and Emma. She found them in Emma's office. Emma was sitting at her desk, her head in her hands. Malenfant was hyped up, pacing, hands fluttering like independent living things. Mara said quietly, "'You fool, Malenfant. How long have you known?' he sighed. "'Not long. A couple of weeks. Dan had suspicions before we got confirmation. The actual pictures from Kruthni. And balances in the life support systems. Did you know she was pregnant before the launch?' "'No, I swear it. If I'd known, I'd have taken her off the mission.' She looked skeptical. "'Really?' "'Even given the launch window constraints and all that technical crap, it would have meant scrubbing the mission.' Yes, it would, but I'd have accepted that. Look, Congresswoman, I know you think I'm some kind of obsessive, but I do notice how the world works. A mission like Bootstrap needs public support. We've known the ethical parameters from the beginning. But we're not sticking to those parameters anymore, are we? We got to the point where the Bleeding Heart public would have accepted Sheena's death, the asteroid colony, a permanent tribute to a brave and wonderful creature. But this has changed everything. It was true. Since the latest leak, support for Bootstrap's Kruthni project and its grandiose goals had evaporated. All the tabloid-fed hysteria, the religious ravings, the pompous and hostile commentaries made no sense, of course. If to abandon ten or a thousand sentient squid was a crime, so was abandoning one. But when, she thought sourly, had sense and rationality been a predominant element in public debates on science and technology... Malenfant spread his hands. Look, Representative, we spent the money already. We have the installation on Kruthni. It's working. Baby squid or not, we have achieved the goal, the gun, the bootstrap. Malenfant, we are soon going to have an asteroid full of sentient squid corpses up there. People will think it is monstrous, she blinked. In fact, so will I. He thought that over. You're talking about shutting us down? Malenfant... The practical truth is you're already dead. The body hasn't gone cold yet, is all. 
It isn't your decision. The FAA, the White House people, the oversight committees. Without me and a few others like me, Bootstrap would have been dead long ago. She hesitated, then reached for his shoulder. I'm sorry, Malenfant. Really, I have the same dream. We can't sell this. We'll do it with decency, Emma said slowly. We won't kill Sheena. We'll let her die in comfort. And the babies? She shrugged. We'll turn away the communications dishes and let nature take its course. I just hope they forgive us. I doubt that, Malenfant said, and he began pacing again, back and forth compulsively. I can't believe we're going to be blocked by this, this one small thing, Mara said to Emma. Are you going to be okay? Yes, Emma looked up and contrived a smile. We've been lower than this. We'll manage. Meaning, Mara realized, she will manage Malenfant, bring him through this. You don't deserve your friends, Malenfant, she thought. They began to go through details. Sheena Five She could feel the soft tug of Kruthni's gravity field pulling her to the dark base of the habitat. She drifted, aching arms limp, dreaming of a male with bright, mindless eyes. There were no fish left, scarcely any krill or prawns. The water that trickled through her mantle was cloudy and stank of decay. She felt life pulse through her, ever faster, as if eager to be done, and she seemed so weak, as if her muscles themselves were being consumed. It was a long time since the great ring muscles of her mantle had been strong enough to send her jetting freely, as once she had done, through this ocean she had brought across space. But the young wouldn't let her alone. They came to her, shook her limbs, seeking guidance. She summoned the will to open her chromatophores. I am grass. I am no squid. No. Smart eyes swam under her vision. No. Danger near. You die, we die. They were flashing the fast, subtle signals employed by a shoal sentinel, warning of the approach of a predator. There was no predator here, of course, save the ultimate death itself, which was already consuming her. And it would soon consume these hapless young, too, she knew. Fan and Bootstrap had promised to keep her alive, but they would shut down the systems when she was gone. She wondered how the young knew this. They were smarter than she was. When they swam out of her field of view, oddly, she forgot they were there, as if they ceased to exist when she could not see them. Her mind itself was weakening. She knew she would never hunt again, even if she had the strength. But then the children would return, clamoring, demanding. Why? they said. Why hear now this? Why die? And she tried to explain to them. Yes, they would all die, but in a great cause, so that earth, the ocean, humans, could live. Humans and cephalopods, a great world-spanning shoal. It was a magnificent vision, worthy of the sacrifice of their lives. Wasn't it? But they knew nothing of Dan, of Earth. They wanted to hunt in shoals and swim through the ocean, unhindered by barriers of soft plastic. They were like her. But in some ways they were more like their father, bright, primal. She could see them chattering rapidly one to the other, too fast for her to follow. She probably hadn't explained it as well as Dan could. She tried again. No. You die. We die. Danny Stabo. At JPL, at the appointed time, Dan logged on for his daily uplink to the Nautilus. There had been nothing but inanimate telemetry for days. He wasn't even sure, couldn't tell from the muddled telemetry if Sheena was in fact still alive. Maybe this would be his last contact. He'd be glad if he could spare himself any more of this shit. He was clearing his desk. He looked around the cubicle he was dismantling, the good old geekosphere, a comfortable mush of old coffee cups and fast food wrappers and technical manuals and rolled up soft screens, and the multi-poster on the partition that cycled through classic 20,000 leagues under the sea scenes. Dan was going back to Key Largo. He planned to resign from Bootstrap, get back to the bio-recovery and Gen Eng work he'd started from. 
To tell the truth, he was looking forward to moving back to Florida. The work he would do there would be all for the good, as far as he was concerned. None of the Nazi doctor ethical ambiguities of bootstrap. But he was hoping to hang around J.P.L. long enough to be with Sheena when she died. The bio signs in the telemetry indicated that wouldn't be so long now. Then the deep space network radio telescopes would be turned away from the asteroid for the last time, and whatever followed would unfold in the dark and cold, unheard. Here was a new image in a soft screen. A squid flashing signals at him, a mixture of the passing cloud and a sign he'd taught Sheena himself, the very first sign. Look at me, Dan. Look at me. Dan. 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 He couldn't believe it. Sheena? He had to wait the long seconds while his signal word, translated to flashing signs, was transmitted across space. Sheena Six. Oh, one of the young. The squid turned, strong and confident, and through a forest of arms, predator eyes seemed to study him. Dying. Sheena Five. I know. Water. Water dying. Fish. Squid. Danger near. Why? She's talking about the habitat biosphere, he realized. She wants me to tell her how to repair the biosphere. That's not possible. Not. Those immense black eyes. Not. 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 The squid flashed through a blizzard of body patterns, bars and stripes pulsing over her hide, her head dipping, her arms raised. I am large and fierce. I am parrotfish, seagrass, rock, coral, sand. I am no squid, no squid, no squid. He had given Sheena no sign for liar, but this squid, across millions of miles bombarding him with lies, was doing its best. But he was telling the truth. Wasn't he? How the hell could you extend the fixed-duration closed-loop life support system in that ball of water to support more squid to last much longer, even indefinitely? But it needn't stay closed-loop, he realized. The Nautilus Hab was sitting on an asteroid full of raw materials. That had been the point of the mission in the first place. In fact, Sheena Five had already opened up the loops a little, replacing Hab membrane leakage with asteroid water. You'd need machinery to get all that stuff. But there was machinery. The rocket propellant factory. The pilot plant for the production of other materials. The firefly robots to do the work. If he could figure a way to do this... If he could figure out how to re-engineer all that equipment to process carbonaceous ore into some kind of nutrient soup, maybe, for the Hab biosphere. And if he could find a way to train these new squid. He'd had years to work with Sheena. He'd have weeks, at best, with these new guys. Still, his brain started to tick at the challenge. But there were other problems. When the comms uplink shut down in a few weeks, he wouldn't be able to run the operation. In that case, he realized, he'd just have to train the squid in the principles of what they were building, how to run it, repair it for themselves, even extend it. It might work. Sheena had been smart. It would be a hell of an effort, though. And for what? What's this, Estabo? Are you growing a conscience at last? because if you are, that damn piece of calamari up there knows how to play on it. And besides, he thought, maybe I can convince Reed Malenfant that this is the best thing to do, a way to keep the greater goals of the project in progress with official sanction or not. If the squid by their own efforts refuse to die, maybe we can turn around public opinion one more time. Do it now, justify later. Isn't that what Malenfant says? I'll help you, he said. I'll try. What can they do, fire me? Dan placed a call to Malenfant, and then a second to Florida to tell the people there he wouldn't be joining them just yet. The squid turned away from the camera. Emma Stoney Cornelius Tane came to Emma's office. We think it worked, he said breathless. We found him. Emma was not glad to see Tane once more. Found who? What are you talking about? Cornelius handed over a document. It was a report prepared by a professor of physics from Caltech. Emma leafed through it. It was heavy on text and laden with equations, difficult to skim. 
Cornelia said, It's an analysis of material found on a soft screen. The math was difficult to decipher, unconventional formalism, but it's all there. What is? Cornelia sat down and visibly tried to be patient. It's a sketch of the foundations of a theory of quantum gravity, which is a unification awaited for a century of general relativity and quantum theory, the two great pillars of physics. I thought we had that. String theory. String theory is part of it. But string theory is mathematically dense. After thirty years, the theorists have only extracted a handful of predictions from it. And it's limited besides. It doesn't incorporate curved space in a natural way. And... Emma pushed the report away. What does this have to do with us? He smiled. Everything. The material turned up in a foundation school in Australia, their northern territory, produced by one of the inmates there. Inmates? You mean one of the blue children? Yes, a ten-year-old from Zambia. He handed over a photograph. A frightened-looking boy, strong white teeth, round eyes. My God, she said. I know this boy. I know. Ting looked at the image hungrily. He's the one we've been looking for, don't you see? No, I don't. She thought over what he had said. You're saying that finding this one boy was the objective of the whole program? She pushed away the report. Cornelius, I'm amazed you've come to me with this. In case you're not aware of it, we're being shut down up on Kruthny. In three months of surface operations, we've discovered nothing to justify the diversion of the mission away from Rhinemuth with all the complication that brought us. We've gone over this many times, he said tightly. You're well aware that the Firefly robots have been restricted to a small area around the Nautilus. We've been marking time. There's a lot of surface area to explore. And besides, we know there's something to be found. We have the Feynman radio message. Sure, she said harshly. Or maybe all we were picking up was the Thermi Lad air conditioning turning itself on and off. What do you think? He eyed her, eyes bright, mouth small and tense. He seemed to be rocking back and forth in his chair almost imperceptibly. Emma, there is much, much you've yet to understand about what's going on here. Remember, we believe we are fighting for the destiny of the species. She sighed. So now what? Now we have to go get him. We? Perhaps he will remember you. She knows six. Sheena Six was the smartest of the young. It was no privilege. She had to work hard to absorb the new signs and concepts Dan sent to her. And there was much work to do. She learned to use the glove-like systems that made the Firefly robots clamber over the asteroid ground, that strange place beyond the ship wall where there was no water. The mining equipment, designed to extract methane and water for the rocket fuel, was adapted to seek out essentials for the phytoplankton, nitrates and phosphates. No more sacks of water and dirt were fired to Earth. Under her command, fireflies took apart the methane rocket plants at the poles and began to haul the parts over the surface for new uses. Even in the hab itself, there was much to do. Dan showed her how to keep the water pure. Oxygen could be produced by the great metal cells to keep the water fresh and vitalizing. There were beds of charcoal filters through which the water was pumped. But the charcoal had to be replaced by carbon extracted from asteroid material burned in sun fire. Dan also tried to show her how to interpret the elaborate automatic monitoring systems that checked that the closed loops remained healthy. But this was no use to her. Squid senses were delicate. If the water was unbalanced, she could see, taste, smell it as it passed through her mantle over her gills. She could see the twisting polarization of the light caused by murky pollutants. She could even hear the tiny cries of the plankton. She knew when the water was unhealthy. It was enough that she had the means to fix it. The processes were complex, but at heart, she learned, there was a simple principle. Her world, this droplet of water clinging to a rock, was so small it could not sustain itself. She took food out of it by feeding on krill. So she must find ways, direct or indirect, of returning raw materials for that food to the world. Very well. In the midst of this activity, Sheena Five grew weaker. Sheena Six tried to pummel her awake a few hours longer. At last, though, Sheena's black eyes clouded. Her young gathered around her. 
Look at me. Court me. Love me. Last confused words picked out in blurred signs on a mottled carapace, stiff attempts at posture by muscles leached of strength. Sheena Six hovered close to her mother. What had those darkening eyes seen? Was it really true that Sheena Five had been hatched in an ocean without limits, an ocean where hundreds, thousands, millions of squid hunted and fought, bred and died? Sheena Five's arms drifted purposelessly, and the soft gravity of Kruthni started to drag her down for the last time. Sheena's young fell on her, their beaks tearing into her cooling, sour flesh. With time, the Nautilus Hab was stabilized. As long as the machines survived, so were the Hab's cargo of life. But it was too small. It had been built to sustain one squid. There were four of them now. Four of Sheena's young. The shortage of food wasn't the only problem. At times, Sheena Six ached, with the need to rip open the mantle of her most foolish brother. So Sheena, under instruction from Dan, went to work. Under her guidance, the Firefly robots began to assemble new engines, new flows of material. Dan tried to teach her sign labels for the chemical processes involved. Here was a small plant, for instance, that burned hydrogen and carbon dioxide to produce water and carbon monoxide. Then the carbon monoxide burned with further hydrogen to produce water and ethylene, and then the ethylene was used to produce polyethylene and polypropylene. The truth was she understood little. But she understood the end product. Plastics. With plastics, she could make anything. She had the firefly robots toil over the plastic sheets and artifacts, cutting and joining. The shining sheets spread around the rocket at the pole and the glimmering habitat of Nautilus. These toy factories had been intended as trials of technologies and manufacturing processes that would have supported a human colony on Kruthni. But no humans had come to Kruthni. Soon there were four Habs, linked by tunnels, one for each of Sheena's young, the smart survivors. The Habs filled up with water from melted asteroid substance. The krill and diatoms bred happily to fill the volume available. The Habs were splashes of water and life on the asteroid's crumbling, cold, dark surface. They looked like living things themselves, spawning and breeding. But already another cephalopod generation was coming. Sacks of eggs clung to asteroid rock and all the Habs. So they extended the Habs further. And the greater volume required more power. Sheena extended the solar cell arrays that coated the surface of the asteroid around the pole. But this wasn't enough. So Sheena Six found a way to make glass from Kruthni silicon compounds and ceramics to make frames that held great wings of solar receptors in space away from the surface. Unremarked by humans, the young of Sheena swarmed over their asteroid. The third generation emerged from their shells and started to look at their expanding world with new, curious, resentful eyes. Perhaps a fifth of them were smart. A fifth seemed a small number. As the young hunted their mindless brothers, Sheena wondered if there were ways to increase that proportion and to make the squid smarter and live longer. Sheena Six thought about the future. It wouldn't stop, Sheena Six saw. More generations of young and more Habs until the asteroid was full, used up. What then? Would they turn on each other at last? But there was nobody to discuss her ideas with. The truth was, Sheena was isolated. Her siblings, even her own young, were remote from her. This new shoal had been hatched in the strangeness of space, and they swam in asteroid water, not the oceans of Earth. That was true of Sheena Six also, of course, but she had worked with humans, with Dan, as had her mother before her. Perhaps she was closer to Earth than they were. Sheena Five had talked about the great shoals of Earth, their dreaming songs of the million-year deep past. These new squid cared nothing for Earth, nothing for the past, and their dreams, their dances and songs, were of the future. The siblings found new ways to control the Firefly robots. They had begun to send Firefly robots to explore the asteroid, places neither Sheena Five nor even Sheena Six had seen. They signed pictures to each other Sheena Six couldn't recognize. Great starburst explosions, squid writhing and dying. 
It seemed they had found something on the far side of the asteroid, something strange. They would not discuss it with her. When she sent a firefly robot crawling over there to investigate, they turned it around and sent it back. The siblings took to wearing sigils on their chromatophore-rich hides, bright circles. Dan told her they were blue. Sheena Six swam restlessly through the Nautilus Hab, alone. She longed for the shoal, but she had never known the companionship of the true shoal. She had been born too late to have shoaled with the great clouds of squid on Earth, too early to join with these new, bright-eyed creatures of space. She was neither one nor the other. She had no purpose. She may as well die. Still, the restlessness burned in her, and curiosity itched. What was it that the others had found on the far side of the asteroid? She sent another firefly, but it too was turned back. Once, Sheena Five, her mother, had crossed space, traveled between worlds. Perhaps it would be appropriate if Sheena Six, the closest of Sheena Five's young, the last to have communicated with a human, were to do something similar. She gathered her remaining machines and began to plan something new. Michael. There were legs before Michael when he opened his eyes, pillars of cloth, a man's legs. He tried not to move. He closed his eyes again. Perhaps if the man thought Michael was asleep, he would go away, choose someone else. There was a strange, unearthly silence in the room. He imagined the others lying rigid, feigning sleep as he did. The brothers hardly ever came here. The sister in her glass-fronted office at the end of the dormitory would only come out if someone had done something wrong, like spilled a slop bucket. It was never good when something unusual happened, because it meant that somebody was going to get hurt. All you could do was find ways to stop it being you. But tonight, it seemed, it was Michael's turn. The man's voice barked. It was the language they spoke here, not Michael's language, and so he didn't understand. Best not to say anything. But the man was still speaking to him, angrier now, too loud for him to ignore, to feign sleep. And now a fist the size of a child's head came down and grabbed Michael's grubby T-shirt. He felt the cloth dig under his arms, and he heard a seam rip. Michael was lifted up bodily, his legs dangling. He hung there limp. A face like a cloud, puzzled and angry, loomed before him. He was set down on his bare feet, hard. He stood there and looked up at the man. It wasn't one of the brothers. The man turned away and spoke some more, this time to the sister, who was standing at the end of Michael's bed. The sister took hold of Michael's hand. He made a fist so she couldn't take his fingers, but she shook his hand hard until his fingers uncurled, and then she grabbed them and squeezed them tightly. The sister dragged him out of the dormitory. It was early morning. The gray of dawn had washed out, leaving the sky an empty blue as always, and the bleached buildings of the school stretched away around him. The sister took him to a smaller building, a place he'd never been into before, she opened the door and pushed him inside. He thought it was the cleanest place he had ever seen. The walls were white and so smooth they looked like skin. There were gleaming metal fixtures set on the roof and bright strip lights that turned the air gray. The sister started pulling at his clothes, lifting or ripping them off him. He endured this passively. He would get them back later. He reached out and touched the smooth wall. The grime on his palm left a mark. He snatched back his hand and looked at the sister, wondering if she would punish him for that, but she didn't seem to have noticed. When she had removed all his clothes, she pushed him into the middle of the room, away from the walls. Then she walked out of the door and pulled it closed behind her. He just stood there in the middle of the room because nobody had told him to do anything else. And then water began to gush from the ceiling, hard needle jets of it. It hissed against the walls and battered at his flesh. At first, he thought it might be rain. There used to be rain at home in the summer, but there was never rain here. The roof rain grew harder, so hard it stung. There was an odd smell in it, like the smell of the liquid the sisters sometimes used to hose out the dormitory. And it was getting hotter. He stumbled back, fetching up against the hard, slippery wall, but the rain seemed to follow him, and there was nowhere to run, not even other children to hide behind. Perhaps this was his punishment then. Perhaps it was because of the flashlight. He huddled down in the corner, wedged into the angle of the walls. 
He could see water trickling off his body into a hole in the middle of the floor. The water was stained brown and black, but after a time it began to run clear. Emma Stoney Emma had become increasingly dismayed by the bad news that surrounded the Blue Children's schools. Nothing, however, could have prepared her for the reality of Red Creek. Red Creek turned out to be an aboriginal reserve in Australia's Northern Territory, reinstated by the Terra Nullius National Government. A section of it had been hastily cordoned off to site this foundation school. They were shown around by a brother, a young Portuguese, darkly handsome and composed, dressed in a flapping black gown and dog collar. It was a bleak place. There were huts like barracks that had once been painted white, but the paint had faded to an indiscriminate pink. Otherwise, there seemed to be no color at all save the grayish red of the dust here at the baked, eroded heart of Australia. The dust lay everywhere. As she walked, she was trailed by a great cloud of it. Away from the reception area, there seemed to be absolutely no vegetation, not a blade of grass. There was a hot, dry smell of dust, dirty clothing, feces, and urine. They weren't allowed into the huts. She saw no children. Here in Red Creek, three hundred children lived in administered squalor. Cornelius and the brother remarked on none of this. The brother talked instead of the economies of scale, joint administration of the school, and the rest of the gen reservation. Gen. This word referred to aborigines. It seemed to be a word of casual abuse. Likewise, the brother referred to the children here, of course, as blues. Even though, he said, in what was apparently meant to be a joke, most of the children here were black. Heronelius, the name of Australia's governing party, meant empty land. It referred to the old fiction that Australia was unoccupied when Captain Cook planted the flag here, that the aborigines had no rights to the lands they had inhabited for millennia. It was a good name for the policies the government followed ruthlessly. The native Australians had suffered a couple of centuries of persistent discrimination with the dispossession of land, the separation of children from parents or indenture as servants and laborers, and so on. There had been a brief summer of hope in the 1970s and after, when liberal, if flawed, protective legislation had been passed. It had all evaporated when the economy downturned at the start of the new century and the soil erosion began to hit. Today, black children made up 3% of the youth in Australia, but 60% of those in prison. International human rights groups and aboriginal organizations talked of torture and beatings, and so on. Modern Australia was a good place for a school like this, and the people who staffed it. The Portuguese brother belonged to a Christian group called the Order of Christ. This was part of the shadowy coalition that supported the Milton Foundation. The order turned out to have roots going back to the 14th century. It was a religious military society originally set up to attack Islam in its own territories. The order had included Vasco da Gama, for example, one of whose specialties was hanging Muslims from his masts and using them for crossbow practice. In the year 2011, here was the order in the black heart of Australia running a school. And it was partly funded by bootstrap, with money that had passed through Emma's control. Appalled, ashamed, she drew Cornelius aside. Dear God, Cornelius. He frowned. You're distressed. Hell, yes. I never imagined. There is no crime here, Cornelius said smoothly. The brothers are actually here to protect the children, the blues. Does Malinfot know about this? Cornelius smiled. What do you think? Emma took deep breaths. Compartmentalize, Emma. One issue at a time. Cornelius, how can a child, alone and uneducated, in this godforsaken school in the Australian outback, come up with a theory of everything? I could point to Einstein. He was a patent clerk, remember? His education was flawed. He didn't even have access to experimental evidence. He just dreamed up relativity from first principles by thinking hard, and... What? Well, it's possible Michael has had a little help. What kind of help? He looked into the air, his pale blue eyes milky with light. 
You have to think like a downstreamer, anticipate them. You really are insane, Cornelius. He smiled. He turned and walked away after the Portuguese brother. She had no choice but to follow him. They returned to the reception area and waited for the child, Michael, to be brought to them. Michael. In the rain house, the water stopped. He sat, shivering. Then warm air gushed from the ceiling over him. The light grew strange, and he felt his skin tingle. The door banged open, and the sister returned. He cowered, burying his hands between his thighs, but she hauled his hands out and dragged him to his feet. She pulled him from the room into the open air. The sun felt harsh on his skin, which no longer had its warm screen of dirt. There were clothes here, but they weren't his. She prodded him. Her meaning was clear. Reluctantly, he bent down and picked up the clothes and pulled them on. They were crisp and white, a T-shirt and long trousers, and even socks and a pair of shoes. But they scratched his denuded skin. Besides, they had no blue circle, and he was confused. When he was dressed, the sister grabbed his hand again and dragged him once more. Now they walked the length of the school compound. The sister took great long strides with a harsh, regular gait, and he had to half run to keep up. Once he almost fell. She screamed at him, evidently concerned he might have dirtied his new clothes. They soon left behind the dormitory blocks, their paint peeling in the endless sunlight. He started to feel frightened again. Although it was just a short walk from his own block, he didn't recognize the buildings here. He must have been brought past them when he arrived here, but he didn't remember, and he had never been so far since. Would he know his way back to his dormitory again? He tried to memorize the buildings he passed, but there was too much newness here. He tried dragging his toe in the dirt so as to leave a trail he might follow to get back. But when the sister saw him, she shouted at him because he had soiled his new white shoes, and she cuffed his head. They were coming toward one of the buildings now. It had an open door, darkness inside. There was a fence beyond this building, and beyond that, the desert stretched away flat and empty. The brothers had told them all about the desert. It stretched away a long way from the school. So far, you would soon collapse of thirst, and even if you did manage to cross it, you would find people who would punish you and send you back. So even if you somehow got out of the school, there was nowhere to go, nobody to help you. The sister dragged him toward the dark doorway. He couldn't help but pull back. This was the end of the journey, and whatever awaited him, whatever he had been prepared for in the building with the rain and the light, was here, inside this building. Sometimes children were taken away from the dormitory and never came back. Would he find their bleached bones piled up here? The sister dragged him inside, and he tried not to scream. Cornelius Tane I can tell you now why I believe Michael is so important. I have had long arguments with Malenfant over this. Malenfant, who feels it is callous to manipulate the lives of children so. But Michael is not merely a child. The Milton Project was, of course, a cover. We have our own theory on the origin of the blues, the bright children. We believe the downstreamers must be trying to signal us, because we would if we knew what they know. But we're not convinced that some technological gadget is the correct solution, even though we've got to try. Perhaps instead the downstreamers are also targeting something else. Perhaps they are targeting the most widespread programmable information storage system on the planet. I mean, of course, the human brain, especially the brains of the young, empty, impressionable, easily shaped. We don't know how. We don't know what it would feel like. We don't seem to hear downstreamer voices in our heads. Or perhaps we do. Perhaps we always have, but we just don't recognize them. Quite a thought, isn't it? Is it possible that Michael, born into ancient dust and squalor, unable to read or write, and yet dreaming of a four-dimensional universe, is more than some precocious genius, that he is actually being influenced somehow by time-traveler beams from the future? It may sound fantastic, a dip into insanity. But what if it's true? And uh, what if Michael and his generation aren't the first? There have always been isolated geniuses with insights and wisdom that seem to transcend the time and place they were born into. Perhaps this has been going on a long time. 
Michael is a treasure beyond price. Malenfant seems to understand this now. None of us yet knows where this extraordinary multifaceted journey is taking us, but it is clear to me that the boy Michael and this man Malenfant together are the key element. I feel I have been groping in the dark, and yet I feel proud to have reached so far to have been the catalyst to this essential relationship. The first time Malenfant met Michael, he seemed electrified, as if by recognition. The fate of the other blue children, incidentally, is irrelevant. Michael Inside the building it was cold. Air blew on his skin, chill and dry. There was a table and chairs and doors, but no people here, no children. The sister pushed him to a chair opposite the table. He sat down. The sister went to one of the doors. She opened it, and he glimpsed people beyond, adults talking and holding glasses, drinks. The door closed behind the sister, and he was left alone. He glanced around. There was nobody here. He could see no cameras or soft screens. He slid off the chair and crossed to the table, feet padding on the hard floor. There was a paper plate on the table with something on it, curling and dry and brown. Perhaps it was the rind of some fruit. He crammed a piece of it into his mouth and pushed the rest inside his shirt. The rind was sharp on his tongue, tough and hard to chew. The door opened abruptly. He turned. People came in, the sister and another woman. When the sister saw him with a plate, her face twisted. He saw her fist bunch, but something made her keep from hitting him. Instead, she bent down and grabbed his face, pinching his cheeks until he had to spit out the rind onto the floor. The other woman came forward. She looked familiar. Memory floated into his head, unwelcome. She had come to the village in the days before. Stony. Steph had called her Stony. Suddenly he knew what they were going to do to him. After Stony had come to the village, he had been taken to this school. Now here she was again, and he would be taken away again, somewhere worse than this, where he would have to learn the rules over again. Stony took a step toward him. He fell to the ground, covering his belly and head, waiting for the blows. But Stony was reaching for him with open hands. She stroked his back. He looked up in surprise. She was doing something he had never seen an adult do before, something he'd thought only children did. She was crying. End of side five. 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 Side six. Time. By Stephen Baxter. Continuing on page 172. Emma Stoney. A week after Emma got back from Australia, Cornelius called a meeting at the Mount Palomar Observatory from where he had been trying to observe Kruthny. Emma, working furiously, unable to sleep, unable to put out of her mind what she'd seen in Australia, tried to veto this. But, of course, she was overruled. And so, at the behest of Cornelius Tain and his bright insanities, she was dragged across the country once more. To reach Mount Palomar, Emma had to fly into San Diego, and then she faced an hour's drive east up into the San Jacinto Mountains. The highway was modern. Her driver, a chatty, overweight woman, told her the highway had been laid by prisoners from a local jail. They reached the group of telescopes that made up the observatory. The site was dominated by the dome of a giant 200-inch reflector, a national monument, its heart a mirror made of 20 tons of honeycombed glass. But tonight, even though the skies were clear, if stained a little by sodium-lit smog, the big dome was closed up. Cornelius Tain met Emma from her car. She turned away from him, refusing to speak. Apparently undisturbed, he led her to a small support building. Brightly lit, the hut was crammed with humming information technology, much of it looking a little antiquated. There were a few junior researchers working here, quietly bullshitting as they gave up another night of their lives to this slow, obsessive work, waiting for Earth to pass through the starlight shadow of some rock in space. 
The dedication, the ingenuity with which Data was squeezed out of such invisibly small opportunities was awesome. They aren't here, she thought, unlike Cornelius, because of the Carter catastrophe, whatever Kruthny means for him. They aren't even paid well. They just do it because... Actually, she didn't really understand why they did it. In this nervous, overcompensating crew, Cornelius in his black suit looked ice cool and in control. They reached a small cluttered office. Emma had arrived late. The others, it seemed, had already started. Malenfant was pacing the room, his movements large and aggressive and exaggerated. She hadn't seen him since she got back from Australia. Danny Stabo was sitting there, cradling a doughnut, looking obscurely pleased with himself. And Emma was deeply disturbed to see that Michael was here. The boy from Africa whom she had retrieved from the nightmare camp in the Australian desert. He was wearing loose, clean clothes. He was sitting in a corner of the office with his back to a wall. He was playing with a prism, letting its scattered light wash over his eyes. She hissed to Malenfant. What is he doing here? I don't know yet, Emma, Malenfant said. I know it seems wrong, but I don't think we have any choice. She frowned. He sounded frightened. Cornelia stood by them. Michael is safe and well, his situation legally controlled. His eyes were very pale, like pieces of glass. You know, Emma, if you were so concerned about this boy, you could have taken the initiative. You could have tried to find him a guardian of your choice, for instance, but you didn't. You're like all the bleeding hearts who have been shouting loud and long recently about the schools and the treatment of the blue children. As long as the kids were out of sight, you didn't care what happened to them. She found she couldn't meet his eyes. She noticed that even as Michael watched his prism, his eyes flickered, his gaze traveling over the adults. He doesn't trust us, she thought. He's expecting us to turn on him again, as we, the adult world, have done before. She sat down, troubled. Let's get this over with. Tense, excited, Malenfant said, You got something, haven't you? Something on Kruthny. Cornelius nodded curtly. To business. One thing at a time, yes? Thanks to our friend Dan here, the squid have survived on Kruthny. He tapped at touchpads embedded in the table surface. Unfortunately, they aren't talking to us. They are even turning away fireflies controlled by the squid faction who have remained in the primary Nautilus Hab bubble, a faction who seem to be reasonably loyal. We're trying to establish direct control of the fireflies ourselves, bypassing the cephalopods. In the meantime, ironically, we have had to rely on remote sensors from Earth and Earth orbital satellites to figure out what is happening up there. Malenfant said to Emma, Ironic, because we sent the squid up there in the first place to give us a better look at Kruthny. Cornelia started to bring up data, graphs, bar charts, on the soft screens embedded in the tabletop. You'd be surprised how much we can figure out about an asteroid just by looking at it. We can see how bright our asteroid is by comparing it with nearby stars, see how fast it's moving by watching it against the background sky, see how its brightness changes so we can guess its shape, see what color the rocks are, and so guess what they are made of. Also, we use radio telescopes to bounce radar beams off Kruthni's surface. By comparing the echo with the outgoing beam, we can tell even more about the asteroid. Its shape, rotation, surface properties, position, and velocity, composition. We found that the surface morphology of some parts of the asteroid is unusual, and not just because of the presence of the squid habs. We did manage to pick up a signal from one of the Firefly drones that got close enough to return an image, a partial image, before it was turned away. Malenfant snapped. Close enough to what? For answer, Cornelius flashed up an image in the tabletop soft screens. Emma shared a Firefly's view of Kruthny. A star field, a lumpy horizon, a broken, pitted, dark gray surface highlighted by a light source somewhere behind her presumably fixed to the robot whose electronic eyes she was looking through. She saw bits of the firefly in the foreground. A metal manipulator arm, a couple of tethers pinning the drone to the surface. Her view was restricted. The drone was low, hugging the surface, bringing the asteroid's horizon in close. And on that horizon she saw... What? It was an arc, bright blue. It seemed utterly smooth, geometrically pure. It stretched from one side of the frame to the other, obviously artificial. She felt cold. 
This was strange, utterly unexpected. Holy shit, Malenfant said. It's an artifact, isn't it? That, Cornelia said, is what our AWOL squid have dug out on Kruthny. What you see is only part of the structure. After sending this, the firefly was turned back. I can show you an image of the whole thing. He tapped at his soft screen. Taken from the ground, however, distressingly remote, blurred. Emma leaned forward. She saw a potato-shaped object, gray, lumpy, and discarded, against a dark background. Kruthny, she said. The image was animated. Kruthny rotated gracefully about its long axis, bringing something into view. Standing in a pit, deep and neatly round, there was a structure. It was a blue circle. Over-enlarged, it was just a ring of blocky pixels. It was obviously the extension of the arc the firefly had approached. She had no way of gauging its size. There were squid heads clustered around the circle, golden splashes, not touching it directly. Within the circle itself, there was only darkness. It's about thirty feet tall. We tried bouncing radar and laser signals off the artifact. It doesn't have the same reflective properties as the rest of the asteroid. In fact, we don't seem to be getting any radar echo at all. It's hard to be definitive. The clutter from the surrounding surface, Malenfant said. So what does that mean? Maybe it's perfectly absorbent, or maybe it's a hole. Malenfant frowned. A hole? What kind of hole? An infinitely deep one, Cornelia smiled. We're looking for a better explanation. We've also detected other anomalies. Radiation, high-energy stuff, some oddities, pions and positrons. We think there must be high-energy processes going on there. He shrugged. It doesn't seem to reflect light. That blue glow comes from the substance itself. It has no spectral lines, just a broad-spectrum glow. Emma shook her head. I don't understand. If it were made of atoms, he said patiently, any kind of atoms, it would emit precise frequencies, because the electrons and atoms jump between quantized energy levels. So this isn't made of atoms, Dan said, wondering. We should soon get back direct control of a couple of robots, Cornelia said. Then, if this is a hole in space, let's find out where it leads. We'll send in a firefly. Malenfant paced, obsessive, exultant. So, it's true. It's an artifact out there on Kruthny. You were right, Cornelius. This will stick it to those assholes at the FAA and NASA and Congress. Emma looked inside herself, searching for awe, even terror, perhaps. She found only numbness. Alan Font's mind was immediately on the implications for his projects. Emma realized his business, not on the thing itself, its blunt reality. And yet, if this was real, everything was different. Wasn't it? Cornelius was smiling. Dan was sitting with his mouth open. Michael's prism-lit eyes were on her, empty and open. It took Cornelius another week to set it up. Sitting in her office in Vegas autumn sunlight, trying to deal with her work, the complex drawn-out destruction of Bootstrap, the various related scandals concerning the end of the world and the blue children and the squid, what she had seen on Mount Palomar seemed unreal, a light show. Artifacts on an asteroid? A hole in space? It couldn't possibly be real. And yet she found it unaccountably hard to concentrate. Malenfant, during this period, was a pain in the ass. He threw himself into bootstrap affairs, but it was obvious he was trying to distract himself. Angry, vigorous, frustrated, burning up nervous energy. Emma did her best to keep him away from the press. At last, Cornelius called Emma and Malenfant to a meeting at Eschatology's offices in New York. Emma considered ignoring the request, excluding Cornelius and the strain of madness and inhumanity he had introduced into her life. But, she found, she couldn't. She had to know. With a sense of dread, she put her affairs on hold and flew out with Malenfant. Cornelius met them at reception and led them to a conference room. At the closed door, a mundane oak panel in this plain-carpeted corridor, he paused. Be warned, he said. 
Emma's hand crept into Malenfant's. Cornelius opened the door, and Emma found herself on Krufny. Black sky, dull black surface curving under her feet, the light from a powerful sun hanging above her, drowning the stars. And in a neatly excavated pit in front of her, there was a blue artifact, thirty feet tall, shining, perfectly circular, like some piece of blunt municipal sculpture. Waiting. She walked forward, hesitantly, her eyes slowly adjusting. When she looked down, she saw that her feet were a little below the cold black asteroid surface, as if she were paddling in a shallow pool. Of course, she felt nothing. Cornelia said, We papered the walls with soft screens. Not quite immersive VR. Much of the imagery comes directly from the various camera feeds we're managing to operate up there. The rest is software extrapolation. I've been preparing our Firefly robot probe. But... But what? Melanfont said. Cornelia sighed. An hour ago, this happened. He tapped at a desk surface. A Firefly robot materialized from a pixel hail in front of them. Using its cables and pitons to drag at the coarse surface, it made its painstaking way toward the artifact. Lines trailed back from it, out of their view. Malenfant said, That's our robot? No, not ours. Just watch. And now an object, like a huge beach ball attached to the long lines, came washing into the virtual reconstruction, towed by the firefly. It was water, Emma saw. A droplet wrapped up in a shimmering golden blanket, complex waves molding its surface as it bounced gently on the regolith. Within the blanket, something was moving. It's a squid, Emma said. Yes, Cornelius rubbed his nose. We think it's a Sheena, that is, from the faction that still inhabits the Nautilus. They, it, seem to retain some of the mission's original imperative. Watch what happens now. The firefly, with a neat pulse of micro-rockets, leapt through the portal. It was briefly dwarfed by the great blue circle, then it disappeared. Emma glimpsed a red flash. The cables that trailed back to the beach ball oscillated, but they did not grow slack. The golden beach ball sat on the surface, quivering. Malenfant stepped forward, hands on hips, studying the image. Where did the firefly go? Did it come out the other side of the hoop? We think so. Cornelia said, but the other side doesn't seem to be on Kruthny. There was a long silence. The squid and the golden beach ball jetted back and forth, patient. Then the cables grew taut again and began dragging the beach ball forward. Watching the cables disappear into the artifact, apparently not connected to anything, was eerie. It took just seconds for the beach ball to complete its series of awkward, slow bounces to the blue circle. Then, after a single liquid impact with the blue circle itself, the beach ball shimmered through the hoop. As the curved golden wall hit the dark disk, it seemed to flatten out, Emma thought, quickly reddening to darkness. At last, the beach ball was squashed to an ellipse, dimmed to a sunset glimmer. Then it was gone, not a trace remaining. Holy shit, Malenfant said. Cornelius held his hand up. Wait. There was a screech, loud enough to sting Emma's eardrums. What was that? A radio signal, Cornelia said. Very high intensity. Coming from the artifact. I cleaned it up and got this. It was a TV image of a squid, coarse, the colors distorted, in golden gloom. She was repeating a simple sign over and over. She's saying, Reef, Cornelia said. Cornelius had chairs and coffee brought in. They sat under Krufny's wheeling black sky, legs crossed, sipping latte. Emma watched Earth and Moon climb through Krufny's fifteen-minute night, blue spark with pale gray-brown companion. I have only partial answers. Cornelius' face was heavily shadowed, its expression impossible to read. Vashina obviously survived. She used a camera in her hab bubble to send back that message. But she's somewhere else. I suspect we're dealing with an Einstein-Rosen bridge here. A what? A multiply connected space. He waved his hands. A bridge between two points in space and time, otherwise separated. Or maybe even between two different space times altogether, different levels of the manifold. The manifold? Emma asked. The ensemble of possible universes, Cornelius said. 
He took his soft screen and folded it over, pinching two places together with thumb and forefinger. You must be familiar with the principle. If I take this flat space, two-dimensional, and fold it over in the third dimension, I can connect two points otherwise far separated. And the point where they meet, the place between my thumb and finger, is a circle, a flat place. So if you fold over our 3D space in four dimensions, the interface you get is three-dimensional, a box of some kind, where the two spaces touch. You're talking about a wormhole, Malenfant said. Cornelius said seriously, a wormhole is only one possibility. An Einstein-Rosen bridge is a generic term for any such interface, which is Lorentzian. That is, it transforms like special relativity, Malenfant snapped. I thought you needed a lot of energy to make a wormhole. Funny physics. Cornelia sighed. You do indeed. To keep their throats open, wormholes have to be threaded with exotic matter. He looked at them. That means negative energy density, anti-gravity. I didn't see any anti-gravity machines out there on the asteroid, Emma said. Cornelia shook his head. You don't understand. General relativity is barely a century old. We haven't even observed a black hole directly yet. And we believe that relativity is only a partial description of reality anyhow. We have no idea how a sufficiently advanced society might set up an Einstein-Rosen bridge, what it might look like, how it might behave. For example, it's possible the ring itself contains something like cosmic string, channels of unified force energy, very massive, very powerful gravity fields. How could you manipulate such stuff? Emma asked. I don't know, he smiled. How that thing works is less important right now than what it does, Melanchthon said. If the ring is some kind of wormhole, a gateway to somewhere else, or some when, then the Sheena isn't dead, and if she steps through that gateway, she can step back again, right? Cornelia shook his head. We think this particular bridge is one way. That's theoretically possible. The Carr Newman singularity, for instance. Emma faced him. Why do you think our portal is one way? Because we can't see through it. Because light falling on it, even sunlight, is absorbed completely. He gazed at her. Emma, if it was two way, we'd be able to see Sheena, wherever she is. Malenfant growled. So what do we do? Cornelia smiled. Why, we sent through our firefly as we planned. They invested another hour while Cornelius finalized the setup of his Firefly robot. It had been loaded up with every sensor Cornelius could think of, mostly stuff Emma had never heard of. Emma stretched, paced around the strange VR representation of Cruthny. None of this is real, she thought. It is a light show from the sky. None of it matters compared to the mountain of males that must be mounting up in her entry even now compared to the complexities of the human world in which she had to survive. And when it all proves to be some dumb illusion, then we'll get back to work. Or not. Without warning, Cornelius collapsed the VR walls. Emma found herself in a bare, black-walled room illuminated by a single wall-mounted soft screen. The screen showed a slab of dark sky, a stretch of regolith. It was the single point of view returned by their Firefly's camera. Cornelius, working at a desktop soft screen, sent a command. Long time delayed minutes later, the Firefly started trundling toward the portal. The screen image shuddered, ground and sky lurching as the Firefly snaked its way across Cruthney's battered surface. Data returned in a chattering stream to Cornelius' software. Then the Firefly stopped, maybe six feet short of the portal itself. The portal loomed against a star-scattered sky, bright blue, a hole of emptiness. This is it, Cornelius whispered. Well, I wonder what we're going to see, he grinned coldly. The robot, autonomous, moved forward once more. The portal surface loomed larger, the blue ring at its boundary passing out of the image, only a thin dusting of Kruthni regolith at the base of the image giving any sense of motion. There was a blue flash, then darkness. Leon Coglin. Did you see it? It was on all the channels. Jesus Christ, if this is real, Spike, think about the implications. 
If Reed Malenfant's light show from Bootstrap has any validity at all, and our experts here at the think tank, E and otherwise, have a consensus that it does, then the old arguments about mutually assured destruction, the nuclear winter, and so forth, no longer apply. We know that no matter what we do today, the species will emerge strong and destined for a long and glorious future. The only question is, who will control that future? We know, Spike, that our enemies are wargaming this, just as we are. We're already in a game of chicken. We're in those two on-Russian cars, locked eyeball to eyeball with the other guy, and it's a game we have to win. Many of us think our best strategy right now is to throw out the steering wheel, and that's why we must consider a first strike. I know this is a controversial view, Spike, but you have a seat on Marine One, if anybody has a chance to enact this, to press it on the president, it's you. Emma Stoney The image broke up into static, restabilized. Emma felt bewildered. Has the firefly gone through? They lost a couple of systems, Cornelia said. Overloads, I think. Emma leaned forward. The screen was empty, dark. No, not quite. Something at the base, broken ground, regolith. Asteroid soil. The firefly seemed to be rolling forward. A spot of ground directly in front of it was lit up by the small floodlights it carried. Farther out, the ground was illuminated by a softer glow, not sunlight or even starlight, she realized. The light seemed diffuse, as if from some extended source, a glowing ceiling somewhere out of her view. There were no stars in the sky. Suddenly, a bright yellow light washed over the regolith, drowning the firefly's feeble glow. Emma was dazzled. What's that? Is something wrong? No, I just turned on the floods. We can't see into the portal, but we can fire light beams through from the other side. Malenfant said, I think the firefly is panning the camera. The image crept sideways, empty sky, broken regolith, and a wash of light. Shit, Malenfant said. It looks like Kruthny. I think we are still on Kruthny, on a version of Kruthny. The Firefly has a gravimeter and instruments to study the surface material. The data's patchy, but the composition looks the same as Kruthny's at first glance. The gravity strength is actually a little down, however. What does that mean? Kruthny has lost a little mass. How? Cornelius just glared. A blue ring scanned slowly under the picture. Its interior was shining bright and yellow. The portal, Cornelia said. That light is our flood shining through. In fact, when the sun comes up on our side, the sunlight should reach the far side. If this is Kruthny, Malenfant said, where the hell are we? The far side, the pole? You don't understand, Cornelius whispered. The firefly was moving its own small spotlights, the glowing ellipses swept across the regolith and fell on the portal. Malenfant grabbed a soft screen and began flicking through camera angles. If it is possible to get back through that portal, we should be able to see the firefly's glow coming back through this side, Cornelia said. Good thinking. They found a stable external image of the portal from this side. The asteroid ground here was littered with instruments and fireflies. The portal stayed dark. Emma stared hard, hoping to see a twinkling glow, like a flashlight shone out of a dark pit. There was nothing. Cornelius nodded, looking pleased. Damn it, Cornelius! Emma snapped. This means the Sheena won't be able to get back, doesn't it? He seemed surprised by her anger. But we knew that already. This just reinforces the hypothesis. And that pleases you. Of course it does. He was puzzled. Emma took a breath to calm herself. If the Firefly's light isn't making it back, Malenfant said, how come its radio signal is? I don't think it is. I think the portal, the far end, is picking up the Firefly's transmissions and rebroadcasting them, maybe through some kind of Feynman radio. And I think the portal at our end is picking up the Feynman stuff and transmitting it again as radio signals, which we can pick up. Like Sheena's initial screech. Yes. What kind of Feynman radio? Neutrinos? There is a higher neutrino flux coming from the portal since we started this, Cornelia said. But I'm guessing. We're dealing with capabilities far beyond our own. 
The Firefly's camera angle continued to scan across the asteroid's horizon. The eerily glowing portal standing alone started to move out of the picture. A crater came into the field of view, so vast and deep only its near rim, high and sharp, was visible. Look at that, Malenfant said. It must be a mile across. That isn't on our cruthony. Not yet, Cornelius murmured. Not yet? You think the Sheena has gone into the future? Is that what you're saying? Think about it. If there had been a crater like that on Kruthni in the past, what could have erased it? How far in the future? I've no way of telling, Cornelia said. There's no sign of residual radioactivity from that crater. If it was caused by a nuclear weapon, the detonation must have been ten, a hundred thousand years ago. A hundred thousand years? That's a minimum. The maximum... He checked another datum. The Firefly is carrying thermocouples. I programmed it to check the background radiation temperature of the universe. The cooling glow of the Big Bang... I can't see a change within the tolerance of the equipment from the present value, three degrees above absolute. What does that mean? Hard to say. We've gone forward less than a billion years, perhaps. Emma said, My God, Cornelius, you've expected this. You were prepared to track giant jumps in time by measuring changes in the temperature of the universe? I didn't know what we would find. I didn't want to rule out anything. How can you think that way? He smiled slyly. I'm an obsessive. You know me, Emma. He tapped his forehead. There, Malenfant said, pointing at the big soft screen. The Sheena. The golden beach ball was sitting on the asteroid ground under the black sky and something was reflected in the golden meniscus, something above the frame of the image, up in the sky, swirling light, washing across the gold. A shadow swam within the beach ball. Can we speak to her? Emma said. We can pass radio signals into the portal, like our floodlights. The Sheena should be able to pick them up. And presumably she can speak to us through the Feynman mechanism. If she wants to, Cornelius tapped his soft screen. Just speak. The software will translate. Sheena, Malenfant said. Sheena, can you hear me? They waited patiently through the time delay. On the screen, the squid turned to look at the firefly. Cornelius' software picked up a sign, simple, iconic. Dan. Not Dan. Friends. Are you healthy? They waited out another long pause. Reef. Malenfant said tightly, What in hell is she looking at? How can I ask her? We can do better than that, Cornelia said. He tapped his soft screen. At Cornelia's command, the firefly's camera swiveled away from the beach ball and tipped up toward the sky the way Sheena was looking. A ceiling of curdled light filled the camera's frame. Shit, Malenfant said. No wonder there were no stars. Emma found herself staring at a galaxy. It was more complex than Emma had imagined. The familiar disk, shining core, spiral arms, was actually embedded in a broader, spherical mass of dim stars. The core, bulging out of the plane of the disk, was bigger than she had expected, a compact mass of yellowish light. Delicately blue spiral arms, she counted them one, two, three, four, wrapped tightly around the core, were much farther than the core itself. She could see individual stars blazing there, a granularity and dark lanes traced between each arm. There was a surprising amount of structure, she thought, a lot of complexity. This galaxy was quite evidently an organized system, not just some random mass of stars. So, a galaxy... Malenfant said. Our galaxy? I think so, Cornelia said. Four spiral arms. It matches radio maps I've seen. I'd say our viewpoint is a quarter of a galactic diameter away from the plane of the disk, which is to say maybe 25,000 light years away. Our sun is one of the spiral arms about a quarter of the way from the center. How did we get here? I guess that Kruthni evaporated out of the solar system. Evaporated? It suffered a slingshot encounter, probably with Jupiter, that hurled it out of the system. Happens all the time. 
If it left at solar escape velocity, which is around a three thousandth of light speed, Emma worked it out first. Seventy-five million years, she said, wondering. We're looking at images from seventy-five million years into the future. That's how long it took this damn asteroid to wander out there. Cornelia said, "Of course, if that isn't our galaxy, then all bets are off." Seventy-five million years was a long time. Seventy-five million years ago on Earth, the dinosaurs were dominant. Emma's ancestors were timid mammals the size of rats and shrews, cowed by the great reptiles. Look at us now, she thought. And in another seventy-five million years, what will we have achieved? Cornelia's voice was tense, his manner electric. He's waited all his life for this. Emma realized this glimpse of the far future through an alien window. This opportunity is unprecedented, Cornelius said. I'm no expert on cosmology, the future of the galaxy. Later, we have to consult people who can interpret this for us. There is probably an entire conference to be had on that galaxy image alone. For now, I have some expert systems. I can isolate them, keep them secure. Emma said. What did she mean, reef? I think she meant the galaxy. The galaxy has um, an ecology, like a coral reef or a forest. He looked up. You can make out the halo, the spherical cloud around the main disk. Very ancient, stable stars. The population two stars in the core are old too. They formed early in the galaxy's history. The survivors are very ancient, late in their evolution. Most of the star formation going on now is happening in the spiral arms. The stars condense out of the interstellar medium, which is a rich, complex mix of gas and dust clouds. Checking with a soft screen, he pointed to the spiral arms. See those blisters? The E systems are telling me they are bubbles of hot plasma, hundreds of light years across, scraped out by supernova explosions. The supernova shock waves enrich the medium with heavy molecules. Carbon, oxygen, iron, manufactured inside the stars, and each one kicks off another wave of star formation, which in turn creates a few new giant stars, a few more supernovae, which stirs up the medium and creates more stars at a controlled rate. So it goes, a feedback loop with supernova explosions as the catalyst. The galaxy is a self-regulating system of a hundred billion stars, the largest organized system we know of. Generations of stars ending in cooling dwarfs or black holes. The spirals are actually waves of stellar formation lit up by their shortest-lived, brightest stars. Waves propagating around the galaxy in a way we don't understand. Like a reef, then, Emma said. The Sheena was right. Cornelius was frowning at his soft screen. But what's wrong? There's something not right. I, the E systems. Don't think there are enough supernovae. In our time, the hot plasma bubbles should make up around seventy percent of the interstellar medium. That looks a lot less than seventy percent to me. I can run an algorithm to check what Malinfon said evenly could be reducing the number of supernovae. Cornelius was grinning at him. Emma looked from one to the other. What is it? I don't understand. Life, Malinfon said. Life, Emma. He punched the air. I knew it. We made it, Emma. That's what the supernova numbers are telling us. We made it through the Carter catastrophe, got off the Earth, covered the galaxy, and Cornelius said, "We've started farming the stars. Remarkable. Mind has spread across the stars, and just as we are already managing the evolution of life on Earth, so in this future time we will manage the greater evolution of the galaxy." Like a giant life support system, closed loops on a galactic scale. Malinfant growled. I got to have this visual next time I give a speech in Delaware. If this is intelligence, Emma said, how do you know it's human? What else could it be? He is right, Cornelia said. We seem to be surrounded by a great emptiness. The nearest handful of sun-like stars shows no signs of civilization-produced radio emissions. The solar system appears to be primordial in the sense that it shows no signs of the great engineering projects we can already envisage. For example, Venus and Mars have not been terraformed. 
The face of the moon appears to have been essentially untouched since the end of the great bombardment four billion years ago. Even if they are long gone, surely we should see their mighty ruins all around us. But we don't. Like an ant crawling around a Los Angeles swimming pool, we might have no idea what their great structures are for, but we would surely recognize them as artificial. Malenfant said, Today there's just us. In the future, somebody spreads across the galaxy. Who else but us? Anyhow, 75 mega years is more than you need to cover the galaxy. You know, we should look farther out, another few mega years for the biosphere to reach Andromeda, three million light years away. Cornelia said, The nearest large galaxy cluster is the Virgo cluster, 60 million light years out. It's plausible the biosphere might have reached that far by now. We have to look, Malenfant said. Send through more fireflies. Maybe we could establish a science station there on the future Kruthni. Christ, Malenfant, Emma said. It's a one-way trip. Yeah, but there are resources on Kruthni, just as there are now. Enough to sustain a colony for centuries. We'd have no shortage of volunteers. For half a buck, I'd go myself. Maybe we could contact the downstreamers directly. Malenfant and Cornelius talked on, excited, speculating. But they are missing the point, Emma thought. Why are we being shown this? What do the downstreamers want? There was a blur of movement in the corner of the soft screen image. It was out of focus, a flash of golden fabric. There's the Sheena, Emma snapped. Cornelius, the camera, fast! Cornelius, startled, complied. Again, the agonizing wait as Cornelius' command crept across space, through the portal, to this startling future. The picture tipped up drunkenly, and galaxy light smeared across the image. But they could see that the beach ball was rolling across the surface toward the portal. Emma said, She's going to come back through. You don't understand, Cornelius said tightly. She won't come back anywhere. The portal isn't two-way. So if she steps through it, she will go... Somewhere else. On the screen, the golden beach ball sailed into the interface, reddening, slowing, disappearing. The firefly rolled forward through soft galaxy light toward the downstreamer gateway. Maradella Open Journal, October 22nd, 2011 Can it be true? Can it possibly? Do we want it to be true? People seem to think I have a more privileged access to Malenfant and his projects than is the reality. I can't tell whether those now famous downstream images are a hoax or a misinterpretation, or if they are real. I can't tell if they represent the only future available to us, or one of a range of possibilities. I don't even know whether it has been to Malenfant's help or hindrance to release the images. When you're trying to build credibility in Congress, it generally does not help to have most of the media and every respectable scientist on the planet calling you a wacko. But I do know that the effect of the images on the world, real or false, has been astounding. It has all been cumulative, of course. The hysteria over the Carter predictions, the strange, eerie, shameful fear we share over the blue children, and now this downstream light show. And all of it wrapped up with Reed Malenfant's outrageous personality and gigantic projects. We shouldn't dismiss the more extreme reactions we're seeing. Violence, suicide, and the rest are regrettable, of course, and there are a number of leaders, even some here on the hill, who need, I would say, to keep a clearer head. But how are we supposed to react? As a species, we've never before had a proper debate about the structure of the future. And now we're all online, all our voices joined, and everybody is having a say. None of us knows what the hell we're talking about, of course, but I think it's healthy. The debate has to start somewhere. Maybe it's all part of our growing up as a race. Maybe every technical civilization has crises to survive, the invention of weaponry that can destroy its planet, the acquisition of the capability to trash its environment. And now here is a philosophical crisis. We must come to terms with the prospect of our own long-term destiny or demise, just as each of us as individuals must at last confront death. Emma Stoney. Another flash of blue light, and... and nothingness. The darkness before Emma was even more profound than the intergalactic night, 
and there was no sign of Lashina. Shit, Malenfant said. Everything's working, Cornelia said evenly. We're actually retrieving an image, and I'm picking up other telemetry. That is what the Firefly is seeing. Emma said tightly. Then where's the Sheena? Have it pan, Malenfant said. I'll try, but I don't think we can communicate with the Firefly any more. It's passed through the portal again, remember, so it must have crossed a second Einstein Rosen bridge. There's no longer a line of sight connecting us. The communication is one way now, through the Feynman radio. Then what do we do? Cornelia shrugged. We wait. The Firefly has onboard autonomy. It's programmed to investigate its own situation to return what data it can. A blur, a wash of light passed over the corner of the screen before the image stabilized. Now Emma saw a battered plane, slightly tipped up, receding to a tight, sharp horizon. The craters and ridges were low and eroded, with shadows streaming away from the viewpoint. The light's too poor to return any color, Cornelia said. What's the light source? Floods on the firefly. Look at the way the shadows are pointing away from us. But the use of those floods is going to exhaust the batteries fast. I don't know why it's so dark. Kruthny looks older, Emma said. The firefly was panning its camera across an empty landscape. The shadows streamed away. Those craters are eroded flat, like saucers. Malenfant said, Micrometeorite impacts? It's possible, Cornelia said. But the micrometeorite sandblasting must be slow. I assume we're still out in intergalactic space. Matter's pretty thin out there. How slow? Cornelia sighed. I'd say we're farther into the future by several orders of magnitude compared to the last stop. Emma asked Malenfant, What's an order of magnitude to a physicist? Malenfant grimaced. A power of ten. Emma tried to take that in. Ten times seventy-five million, or a hundred, a thousand times. The viewpoint was shifting. The landscape started to rock, drop away, return. Slowly more features, ancient, eroded craters, loomed up over the horizon. Cornelia said, The firefly is moving. Good. Tashina, Emma said. The beach ball was sitting on Kruthni's surface once more, complex highlights picked out by the firefly's light. Within, a shadow was visible, swimming back and forth. How extraordinary, Cornelia said, to see a living thing across such immense spans of time. She looks healthy, Emma said. She's moving freely. She looks alert. Maybe not much longer, Malenfant growled. That damn water ball will freeze. Do you think she understands any of what she is seeing? I doubt it, Cornelius murmured. Now that she looked carefully, Emma saw that the shadows of the floods cast on the golden ball weren't completely dark. The shaded areas were lit by some deep red glow. There's something in the sky, she said, a light source. The image started to pan away from the cephalopod jerkily. More Kruthni craterscapes slid across their field of view. Then the landscape dropped out of sight, leaving a frame filled with darkness once more. The fireflies penning upward, Malenfant said. Come on! And a new image resolved. Oh, my, he said. At first, Emma could make out only a diffuse red wash. Perhaps there was a slightly brighter central patch. It was surrounded by a blood-colored river of light, studded here and there by dim yellow sparkles. But the image kept breaking up into blocky pixels and she wondered if the shapes she was perceiving were real or artifacts of her imagination. We're right at the limit of the optical system's resolution here, Cornelia said. If the firefly is smart, there. We switched to the infrared detectors. The picture abruptly became much brighter, a wash of white and pale pink, but much more blurred and in some ways more difficult to see. Cornelius labored at his soft screens trying to clean up the image. Emma made out that great central glow now brightened to a pink-white ball. It was embedded in a diffuse cloud. She thought she could see ribbon streamers in the cloud, as if material were being dragged into that pink maw at the center. The core and its orbiting cloud seemed to be embedded in a ragged disk, a thing of tatters and streamers of gas. Emma could make out no structure in the disk, no trace of spiral arms, no lanes of light and darkness, but they were blisters, 
knots of greater or lesser density like supernova blisters, and there was that chain of brighter light points, yellow before, now picked out as bright blue by the enhancement routines, studded at regular intervals around the disk. Filaments seemed to reach in from the brighter points toward the bloated central mass. It looks like a galaxy, Malenfant said. Emma saw he was right. It was like a caricature of the galaxy she had watched just minutes before, but that central mound was much more pronounced than the galaxy's core had been, as if it were a tumor that had grown eating out this cosmic wreck from the inside. Cornelius was consulting his soft screen, asking questions of the hierarchy of smart software that was pouring over the images. It probably is a galaxy, but extremely old, much older than our galaxy is at present, even then when we saw it at the Sheena's last stop. Malenfant said, Is it the galaxy, our galaxy? I don't know, Cornelius said. Probably. Perhaps Cruthney entered some wide orbit around the center, or Cruthney might have had time to reach another galaxy. There's no way of knowing. If that's our galaxy, Emma said, what happened to all the stars? They're dying, Cornelius said bluntly. Look, all stars die. Our sun is maybe halfway through its life. In five billion years or so, it will become a red giant, five hundred times its present size. The inner planets will be destroyed. The sun will span the sky, and earth will be baked, the land hot enough to melt lead. But there will be other stars, Emma said. The galaxy reef. Yes, and the smallest, longest-lived dwarfs can last for maybe a hundred billion years, a lot longer than the sun. But the interstellar medium is a finite resource. Sooner or later, there will be no more new stars, and eventually, one by one, all the stars will die. All that will remain will be stellar remnants, neutron stars and black holes and white dwarfs slowly cooling. He smiled, analytic. Think of it. All that rich, complex dust and gas we saw before, locked up in the cooling corpses of dead stars. Malenfant said grimly, And then what? And then... This, Cornelius pointed, the wreck of the galaxy. Some of the dying stars have evaporated out of the galaxy. The rest are collapsing into the great black holes, those blisters you see in the disk. That central mass is the giant black hole at the core. Even in our time, it is around a million times the mass of the sun, and it's still growing as star remnants fall into it. You see the way the matter streams are straight, not twisted? That means the central hole isn't rotating. Wait. What now? The firefly is returning the relic temperature. The Big Bang glow. Well, well, it's down to one percent of one degree above absolute zero. A little chilly. What does that mean? It means I know where we are. Or rather, when. The universal temperature is declining as the two-thirds power of time. He hesitated, and when he spoke again, even he sounded awed. The data is chancy, but the consensus of my software colleagues here is that we're around a ten to power fourteen years into the future. That's some a hundred thousand billion years compared to the universe's present age, which is around twenty billion years. Five thousand times as far downstream as at present. He nodded as if pleased. The numbers seemed monstrous to Emma. I can't take that in, she said. Cornelius glared at her. Then try this. These powers of ten are zoom factors. With every extra power of ten, you zoom out another notch, shrinking everything. You see, this downstream universe is so old that the whole history of our world, from its formation to the present, compares to this desert of future time as, let me see, as your own very first day of existence compares to your whole life. Malenfant, looking stunned, his mouth tight, just shook his head. So this is the end, Emma said. The end of life. Oh, no, Cornelius sounded surprised. Not at all. He pointed to the clusters of brighter light around the rim of the galactic corpse. These seem to be normal stars, small, uniform, but still glowing in the visible spectrum. How is that possible, Malenfant said. I thought you said all the star stuff was used up. So it is, by natural processes, said Cornelius. Oh, so these stars can't be natural. 
That's right. Cornelius turned to Emma, his pale eyes shining. You see, somebody must be gathering the remnant medium, forming artificial birthing clouds. Somebody is still gardening the galaxy, even so far downstream. Isn't it wonderful? Wonderful? The wreck of the galaxy? Not that. The existence of downstreamers. And they still need stars and planets and warmth and light. They are still like us, these descendants of ours. Maybe they even remember us. He rubbed his face. But those stars are small and cold, designed for longevity. Their worlds must be huddled close, probably gravitationally locked, keeping one face in the light, one in the dark. Good God, Cornelius, Melanchthon said. That's a lot to deduce from one smudgy image. I've been thinking about this all my life, Cornelius said, plotting the survival of humankind, of intelligent life into the far future. Mind games played against an unyielding opponent, time, with the laws of physics as the rules. And the farther downstream we look, the more we are constrained by the laws of physics. The future has to be like this. Now the image lurched. The wrecked galaxy slid out of the frame to be replaced by a glaring wash of light. The firefly adjusted its receptor to visible light, and the floodlit plain of Cruthany was revealed once more. There was no sign of the golden bubble or the firefly patiently towing it. The Sheena has gone, Malenfant said immediately. She must have gone back to the portal again. Christ, Emma said. She's trying to get home. But she's only succeeded in traveling farther downstream, said Cornelius. The image lurched again as the firefly began to toil toward the portal once more. And so it seems must we. The firefly doesn't know what else to do. Emma found she was making a fist, so hard her nails were digging into her palm. I don't want to see any more. I don't think there's a choice, Malenfant said grimly. The image of the portal expanded out of the camera's field of view, and once more that deep black, blacker than galactic night confronted Emma. There was a flash of electric blue. Another black sky, another cruthny. The patient firefly crept forward, shining its own fading light over the crumpled surface of the asteroid, seeking the Sheena. Emma would not have believed that the ground of Cruthney could look more aged than it had before, and yet it did, its craters and ridges and scarps all but invisible under a thick blanket of dust. As the firefly labored, Emma could see how its pitons and cables kicked up great sprays of regolith. The three of them watched in somber silence, oppressed by time's weight. "'How long, Cornelius?' Malenfant asked, his voice hoarse. Cornelius was studying his data. I don't know. The relic temperature is too low to read, and... And there was a dawn on far downstream Cruthney. Emma gasped. The sight was as unexpected as it was beautiful. A point of yellow-white light, sun-like. The light rose in clumsy stages as the firefly labored toward it. Shadows of smooth, eroded crater rims and ridges fled across the smooth landscape toward her, like bony fingers reaching. It was so bright it seemed to Emma she could feel its warmth, and she wondered if somehow this long journey through time had looped back on itself, returning her to the dawn of time, the birth of the solar system itself. But she quickly realized this was no sunrise. A glaring point was surrounded by a tilted disk, glowing red, within which she could trace a tight spiral pattern, and there seemed to be lines of light tracing out from the poles of that central gleam, needle-thin. Farther out she saw disks and knots of dull red matter, much smaller than the big bright core object. The central light actually cast shadows through the crowded space around it, she saw, shadows that, if this was a galactic-scale object, must have been thousands of light years long. It was oddly beautiful, a sculpture of light and blood red smoke. But it was chilling, inhuman, even compared to the last grisly galactic vision. There was nothing she could recognize here, and nothing that looked like a star. Our galaxy? Malenfant asked. Cornelius studied his data. Perhaps. If it is, it's extremely shrunken. And I'm seeing objects away from the disk itself now, a scattering of low-energy infrared sources all around the sky. Stellar remnants, I think. 
Malenfant said grimly. What you said. Evaporated stars, right? Yes. Cornelia studied the screen. At a guess, I'd say ninety percent of the objects in the galaxy have evaporated away, and maybe ten percent are gathering in the core object. The black hole, that's what we're seeing. Yes. We've come a long way, Malenfant, and our strides are increasing. These processes are slow. Emma barely listened. The camera swung from the bright black hole structure to the folded asteroid dirt to sweeping empty sky. No sign of Sheena, she murmured. Maybe the portals don't always work consistently. Maybe she's been sent on somewhere else, out of our reach. Malenfant briefly hugged her. Emma, she's been out of our reach since the first time she bounced through that portal. Whether we see her or not hardly matters. But it feels like it does, because we're responsible for her being there. Yes, he said at length. They fell silent, but they stayed close to each other. Emma welcomed Malenfant's simple human warmth, the presence of his flesh, the soft wash of his breath on her face. It seemed to exclude the endless dark of the future. Meanwhile, Cornelius was staring up at the image, interrogating the smart system, speculating, theorizing, obsessing. The light we see is coming from that central accretion disk, where matter is falling into the black hole and being absorbed. Intensely bright, of course, probably more energetic than the combined fusion energy of all the galaxy's stars in their heyday. The hole itself is probably a few light months across. Those beams coming from the poles... Perhaps they are plasma directed by the magnetic field of the disk, or maybe the hole itself, like a miniature quasar, he found. But that's wasteful. It's hard to believe they don't have a way to harness that radiant energy. Perhaps this signaling... Wasteful? Malenfant snapped. What are you talking about, Cornelius? Wasteful to who? The downstreamers, of course, Cornelius said. The downstreamers of this era. Can't you see them? Cornelius froze the camera's shuddering image. Can't you see? Look at these smaller satellite holes. Look how uniform their size is, how regular the spacing. You're saying this arrangement of black holes is artificial, Emma said. Why, of course it is. I suspect the downstreamers are using the smaller holes to control the flow of matter into the central hole. They must be regulating every aspect of this assemblage. The size of the satellite holes... The rate at which they approach the central core. I think the downstreamers are mining the galaxy core black hole of its energy. Mining? How? He shrugged. There are a whole slew of ways even we can dream up. If you coalesce two black holes, you get a single larger hole, with an event horizon ringing like a bell. But you also get a monumental release of gravitational energy. Much of a spinning hole's energy is stored in a great tornado-like swirl of space and time, dragged around by the hole's immense inertia. You could tap this energy by enclosing the hole in a great mesh of superconducting cables. Then you could thread the tornado swirl with a magnetic field to form a giant electrical power generator. Or you can just throw matter into the central hole, feeding off the radiation as it is crushed. No doubt there are better ways... They've had a long time to work it out. How long? Cornelius tapped his soft screen. A guess, based on the nature of that black hole, ten to power twenty-four years. A trillion, trillion years. Ten billion times as old as the last images we saw, the age of the star farmers. Jesus, Malenfant said. A long time. Cornelius said testily, Remember the zoom factors... We just zoomed out again. The universe must have expanded to, um, some ten thousand trillion times its size in our day. Compared to the age of the galaxy remnant we see here, the evolution of our universe was as brief, as insignificant, as the first three hours after the Big Bang is to us. And yet there is still life. The Sheena, Malenfant said. There was the golden beach ball lurching over the surface, cables glimmering in the fireflies' floods. A cephalopod was clearly visible within, swimming back and forth, curious. The camera swept the Kruthni landscape as the firefly turned to follow the Sheena. 
She's going back to the portal, Malenfant said. She's going on. Something shrank deep inside Emma. Not again, she thought. Perhaps it's a kind of morbid curiosity, Cornelia said dryly, to keep on going forward, on and on, to the end of things. No, Emma said. You saw her. She's not morbid. Then what? It's as if she's looking for something. But what? The more I see of this future universe, the more it seems... Pointless? asked Malenfant. She was surprised at that from him. Yes, exactly. His face bore a complex expression. He's taking it hard, she thought, this cold, logical working out of his dreams. Malenfant campaigns for an expansive future for humankind, survival, essentially, into the far downstream. Well, here it is, Malenfant. Everything you dreamed of. And... It is appalling, terrifying, proof that if we are to survive, we must sacrifice our humanity. Cornelia shrugged. Pointless? What a trivial response. We are the first, the only intelligence in the universe. We have no objective save endurance, nothing to do but survive as long as we can. And, in fact, this era may be the peak, when we learn to tap these giant energy sources, the greatest in the universe. Sources so great they outshine our fusion-driven stars as if they were candles. The manhood of the race, Emma said dryly. Perhaps, and... And are they like us? Emma asked. What does it matter? Your thinking is so small. Modern humans could never handle such projects as this. We can't imagine how it is to be such a creature, to think in such a way. Perhaps there is no real comparison between them and us, no contact possible... But it does not matter. They are magnificent. She was repelled. She thought, You're wrong. There had to be something more to strive for than that, more than simple survival in a running-down universe. But then she had no children. So these black hole miners, however remote, however powerful, were not her descendants. She was cut off, a bubble of life lost in the far upstream. The firefly worked its painful way across the time-smoothed landscape toward the portal. Damien Krimsky Anyhow, that's why I went AWOL for so long, Mr. Hench. I hope you can understand that. I support Bootstrap. I'm a big fan of Reed Malenfant and everything he's trying to do. The time I spent working with you on those BDBs in the Mojave Desert was probably the most meaningful of my life. It's just that when all that Carter stuff came out of the media, well, maybe I went a little crazy. If the world's going to end anyhow, what's the point of paying taxes? That was why I, um, disappeared. Anyhow, I saw what Malenfant broadcast, the galaxies and the black holes and all, and now I feel different. Who wouldn't? Now I know my children have a chance to grow old and happy, and their children too, on and on until we've conquered the stars. Life is worth living again. I know there are those who say it doesn't matter, that if the future is going to be so wonderful anyhow, we don't need to do anything now. But I feel a sense of duty. It's the same way I felt when I saw my own kid in my wife's arms for the first time. At that moment I knew how I would spend the rest of my life. So I'm coming back to the Mojave. I have clearances from the rehab and detox clinics as well as from the parole board. I hope you'll welcome me back. Your friend, Damien Kremsky. Moon Dancer People have been arguing for months about whether this Carter stuff can be correct, and now they're arguing about whether the far future visions are hoaxes. Of course, they can't both be true. And it's amazing that you have stock market crashes and suicide cults and wackos who think they need to rip up the cities because the end of the world is coming and another bunch of nuts doing exactly the same thing because the end of the world isn't coming. Of course the far future visions are all genuine. This is our fate. And it's fantastic. Wonderful, don't you think so? Have you even thought where you'd like to travel if you had a time machine and could go anywhere, past or future? Maybe you would go hunt T-Rex, or listen to Jesus preach, or sail with Columbus. What do you think? I know what I'd do. I'd ride off to join the black hole miners in the incredible year A.D. 400 billion. Man, will those guys party. What? 
How come I know the future stuff is real? Because I've seen it myself. Also, as you probably know, there were secret codes in the L.A. Times write-up, comprehensible only by other travelers, confirming the veracity of the pictures. I have a cap, careful with it, and when I wear it, it projects my sense of self astrally. Emma Stoney This time the golden beach ball was visible as soon as the firefly emerged from the blue flash of transition. The beach ball was standing on a smooth, featureless plain square in the middle of the soft screen. An arc of the portal was visible beside the beach ball, a bright blue stripe. The sky was dark. The black hole rose had disappeared. The only light falling on the beach ball seemed to be the glow of the fireflies' dimming floods. The belt of horizon Emma could see looked like a perfect circular span, unmarked by ridges or craters. The squid swam through her bubble of water, lethargic. Emma watched the Kruthni landscape slide past the firefly's panning camera lens. Its smoothness was unnerving, unnatural. She felt no awe, no wonder, only a vague irritation. "'That damn asteroid has taken a beating,' Malentant said. "'Look at that, mother. Smooth as a baby's butt.' "'You don't understand,' Cornelia said testily. "'I, or rather my electronic friends, think there's more than simple erosion here.' The gravimeters on the Firefly are telling me the morphology of Pruthny has changed. I mean, the asteroid shape has changed. Out here in the dark, it has flowed into a sphere. Valentin said, A sphere? How the hell? I think this is liquefaction. If that's so, it means that proton decay lifetimes must exceed ten to power sixty-four years. And that means... Whoa, whoa! Valentin held up his hands. Liquefaction? You're saying the asteroid flowed like a liquid? How? Did it heat up? Melt? No. What is there to heat it up? What, then? Malin thought, over enough time, the most solid matter will behave like a very viscous liquid. All solid objects flow. It is a manifestation of quantum mechanical tunneling that... Malin thought said, I don't believe it. You're seeing it. Cornelius said tightly. Malenfant, the far future is not the world you grew up in. Marginal processes can come to dominate, if they're persistent, over long enough time scales. How long? Malenfant snapped. Cornelius checked his soft screen. A minimum of ten to power sixty-five years. Um, uh, that's a hundred thousand trillion 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 trillion. Look, start with a second... Zoom out, factor it up to get the life of the Earth. Zoom out again to get a new period. So long Earth's lifetime is like one second. Then nest it, do it again, and again. The camera image swept away from the beach ball, away from the blank liquefied ground, and swept the sky. Malenfant pointed. What the hell is that? It was a blur of gray-red light in an otherwise empty sky. The firefly switched to infrared, and Cornelius cleaned up the image. Emma saw a rough sphere, a halo of motes of dim light that hovered motionless around... Around what? It was a ball of darkness, somehow darker even than the background of the sky. It looked about the size of the sun seen from Earth. The most were like dimly glowing satellites closely orbiting a black planet. Cornelius sounded excited. My God, look at this! He magnified the image, picking out a point on the rim of the central ball and hatching as he went. Emma saw rings of red light running around the rim, parallel to the surface. What is it? Gravitational lensing, bent light. That means it must be. He scrolled through expert system interpretations, speed reading. We're looking at a black hole, a giant. This is probably the remnant of a supercluster just as what's left of a galaxy after star evaporation collapses into the central hole, so galactic clusters will collapse in turn, and then the superclusters. That hole might have a mass of anything from a hundred trillion to a hundred thousand trillion solar masses, an event horizon radius measured in hundreds of light years. I don't understand, said Emma. Where did the galaxy go? Our galaxy hole was surely carried to the heart of the local galactic cluster black hole and then the supercluster. 
and we were dragged along with it. If it's a hole, it has no accretion disk, Malenfant said. Malenfant, this thing is ancient. It ate up everything a hell of a long time ago. So how come those moats haven't been dragged down, Malenfant said. Life, Emma said. Even now, feeding off the great black holes, right? Maybe, Cornelia said grimly. Maybe. But if so, they aren't doing enough. Even gravity mines can be exhausted. Hawking radiation, Malenfant said. Yes, black holes evaporate. The smaller the hole, the faster they decay. Solar mass holes must have vanished already. In their last seconds, they become energetic, you know. Go off with a bang like a nuke. He smiled, looking tired. The universe can still produce occasional fireworks, even this far downstream. But ultimately, even this, the largest natural black hole, is going to evaporate away. What are the downstreamers going to do then? They should be planning now, working. There will be a race between the gathering and management of energy sources and the dissipative effects of the universe's general decay. Malenfant said, You'd make one hell of an after-dinner speaker, Cornelius. The camera had panned again, and it found the Sheena in her beach bowl. I think her movements are getting labored, Emma said. Cornelius murmured, There's nothing we can do. It's cold out there, remember, in the far downstream. Her heater will surely expire before long. Maybe she won't even suffocate. They watched in silence. Sheena's firefly, tethered to the beach ball, jerked into motion. It floated toward Emma's viewpoint across the eerily smooth surface of the liquefied asteroid. It drifted to a halt and reached out with a grabber arm to touch its human-controlled cousin. In the soft-screen image, the arm was foreshortened, grotesquely huge. Then the firefly turned and drifted out of shot toward the portal, towing the beach ball. Onward, Emma whispered. Another transition. Another blue flash. The camera performed a panorama panning through a full 360 degrees. The portal, a glaring blue ring still embedded in the asteroid ground, slid silently across the soft screen. There was the Sheena's bubble resting on the surface, lit only by the robot's light and by the soft blue glow of the portal itself. The Sheena tried to swim, a dim, dark ghost behind the gold, but she fell languidly, limbs drifting. And then, beneath a black sky, there was only the asteroid surface, smooth, utterly featureless, rubbed flat by time. It's just like the last stop, Emma said, as if nothing will ever change again. Not true, Cornelia said, but this far downstream, the river of time is flowing broad and smooth. Down to a sunless sea, Emma said. Yes, but there is still change, if only we could perceive it. The camera tipped up away from the asteroid, and the soft screen filled up with black sky. At first, Emma saw only darkness, unrelieved, but then she made out the faintest of patterns, charcoal gray on black, almost beyond her ability to resolve, a pattern of neat, regular triangles covering the screen. When she blinked, she lost it, but then she made out the pattern again. Abruptly it blurred, tilted, and panned across the screen. Now the triangles showed up pinkish-white, very blurred but regular, a net of washed-out color that filled the space. The firefly is using false color, Cornelia said. The pattern slid across the screen jerkily as the remote firefly panned its camera. And beyond the net, Emma saw a greenish surface, smoothly curved, as if the netting contained something. It must cut the universe in half, Emma said. More of the framework slid through the screen, blurring as the camera's speed outstripped the software's ability to process the image. It looks like a giant geodesic dome, Malenfant said. Cornelia said, I think it is a dome, or rather a sphere, hundreds of thousands of light years wide, a net, and there's only one thing worth collecting this far downstream. He pointed to the complex, textured curtain of greenish light visible through the interstices of the dome. Look at that. I think we're seeing black hole event horizons in there. Giant holes, galactic supercluster mass, and above. They are orbiting each other, their event horizons distorting. I think the holes have been gathered in there deliberately. 
They are being merged in a hierarchy of more and more massive holes. I imagine by now the downstreamers can manage whole coalescence without significant energy loss. How the hell do you move a black hole? Attach a tow rope? Cornelia shrugged. I don't know. Maybe you use Hawking radiation as a rocket. The details hardly matter. The dome seems to be an energy collector, like a Dyson sphere. Anything still alive must be living on those struts, feeding off the last free energy. The slow Hawking radiation of the black holes, but it's a damned thin trickle. He glanced at his soft screen. We can postulate strategies for survival. Maybe they eke out their dilute resources by submitting to long downtimes, hibernation, slow computation rates, stretching an hour of awareness across a million years. Perhaps, Emma thought, or perhaps they are conscious continually, even now, in this ruin of a universe, frozen into their black hole cage, unable to move, trapped like Judas in the lowest circle of hell. Cornelia said, It may seem strange to you how much we can anticipate of this remote time, but the downstreamers are walled in by physical law, and we know they will have to manage their black hole resources. The supercluster holes are the largest to have formed in nature, with masses of maybe a hundred trillion suns, but even they are evaporating away. So they have to harvest the holes. If you combine two holes, you get a more massive hole. Which will be cooler, Malenfant nodded. It will evaporate more slowly, so you can stretch out its lifetime. They're probably coalescing holes in hierarchies all over the reachable universe. This side, immense as it is, might be just a rung on the ladder. The engineering details are tricky. You have to bring the holes together fast enough that they don't evaporate away before you've harvested them. On the other hand, it mustn't be so rapid that you form a hole so huge... It evaporates too slowly, and you are starved of usable energy. Remarkable. Cornelius breathed, staring at the dim, ghostly images. To think that mind has now encompassed the universe, that the future evolution of the universe actually depends on conscious choices made by our descendants. Cooperation, Emma thought, spanning a universe, projects lasting millions, even billions of years. Whatever these people have become, she thought, they are not human. Oh, Jesus, look at that! Emma turned back to the screen where Malenfant was staring. Across a broad, circular region, the geodesic network was disrupted. It looked as if some immense fist had punched through it from the inside, ripping and twisting the struts. The tips of the damaged struts were glowing a little brighter than the rest of the network. Perhaps there was some form of repair effort underway. And beyond the damaged network, she could see the event horizons of giant coalescing black holes, each perhaps the mass of a supercluster of galaxies or more. The horizons distorted, great frozen waves, light years long, visible in their cold surfaces. What do you think? Emma said. Some kind of breakdown? Or war, Malenfant said. War? Here, so far downstream? That's insane. Maybe not, said Cornelius. These people have responsibility for the whole of the future. They are managing the last of the universe's energy resources. With responsibility comes tension, disagreement, conflict. Malenfant said, To have come so far to see this... How depressing. No, Cornelius said irritably. We have no idea what kind of minds inhabit these giant structures. They may inhabit hierarchies of consciousness far above us... Their motivations are probably so far removed from ours that we can't even guess at them. Maybe, Malenfant growled. But I'm just a poor H-sap, and if I lived in that dome, I'd want to survive no matter how huge my brain was. And it seems to me they are doing a damn poor job. Reluctantly, Emma asked, How far have we come? Cornelius studied his soft screens again. Even the E-systems are giving up on me now. Suppose we've taken another scale factor jump downstream of the same kind of size as last time. That puts us at around 10 to power 100 years remote. What does that mean? He rubbed his forehead. To these downstreamers, the early days of their empire. Zoom factors of 10 or 100 or 10,000 back, maybe, when even medium-sized black holes could still exist. Those days were the springtime of the universe. 
As for us, we're a detail, back in the detail of the Big Bang somewhere, lost in the afterglow. Malenfant, I once asked you if you understood, really understood, what it would mean to carry your off-Earth colonization project through to its final conclusion, to challenge eternity. This is what it means, Malenfant. This. And the immensity of the responsibility. We have to spread across the universe, make it possible for human descendants of the far downstream to have the power to do this, to survive the winter as long as possible, because this is the last refuge. But this is a process without limit, Malenfant found. This is a strategy that offers the prospect of eternal life, doesn't it? No, Cornelia said sadly. At least we don't think so. There's a paradox. You have to have some kind of framework, a structure to gather your energy, house your souls. The Disneyland sphere. Yes. The structure grows with time. And even if matter is stable, which it may not be, the structure has to be upgraded, repaired. The maintenance requirements go up with time because the structure is getting bigger, but the energy available is going down with time. It's a squeeze, Malenfant, and it isn't possible to win. This black hole management policy is a good idea, the last best idea, but in the end, it's doomed to fail. End of side six. 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 End of side six.